versus Catherine Magvanua, 2016 CF 3036, 2018 CF 497. Ms. Magvanua is present along with her counsel and uh, the attorneys on behalf of the state. All right, so I've received the witness list, and uh, so it looks like we have five uh, witnesses on board for today. And uh, so, Ms. Kappelman, um, uh, how many w do you think we'll get done with by uh, our lunch hour this morning? Uh, I'm hoping to get through Mr. Lacoste by the lunch hour, Judge. Okay, and then just Mr. Rivera would be this afternoon? Yes, sir. Okay. Your Honor? Um, yes. Because the state didn't let us, they only let us know that they would be calling Ms. Davison and Mr. Rivera today. Uh, because I the state did let you know? Did not let us know until this morning that Mr. Lacoste would be testifying today. Okay. I am handling Mr. Lacoste and I did not bring my documents. So I would need to return to the hotel to pick up my documents in order to properly cross-examine him. Um, this is one of the issues we had, Judge, with them not telling us fully who is going to be called. All right. Um, you're either going to need to send somebody or you're going to have to do it during the break or whatever you need to do. On the break, if I could just, if I could probably send someone, I just have to be able to have her locate all, um, all the documents. All right. Well, it's the fourth witness. Do, just do what you have to do. I mean, Perfect. Thank you. Know, you the, the state's not required to provide you with every bit of information. We knew that there were two other witnesses testifying today. So you just make sure that you get your documents and however you need to do it, then uh, I'll depend on you, okay? All right, thank you, Judge. All right, thank you. All right, the first thing that I want to address uh, is in regards to Wendy Adelson and uh, a, a non-party uh, motion that I received. And so is Mr. Laura present? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Laura, good morning. Let's see, we don't have the podium in a good place at this point, but you could just step right up to the podium. Good yes, morning. Yes, Your Honor. Um, John Loro, and with me is Ms. Adelson. Your Honor, as you know, Ms. Adelson has been subpoenaed by the state as well as the defense. Uh, she, without a state subpoena, would unequivocally um, invoke her Fifth Amendment rights. We want to make that clear for the record. In light of Your Honor's prior rulings and direction, we wanted to put that on the record. However, with respect to the state subpoena, it automatically confers use and derivative use immunity on her um, pursuant to Florida Statute 914.04. That use and immunity, use and derivative use immunity would only apply to a state subpoena and not to a uh, defense subpoena. Um, so in light of that, we would ask respectfully that the court quash the defendant's subpoena since there's no um, purpose and, and no appropriate purpose in calling a witness simply to invoke in front of the jury. Let me ask you this, Mr. Laura. Any questions that are uh, uh, given to um, Ms. Adelson during, if she was called for, with a defense case, is she going to uh, assert her Fifth Amendment rights to any question that's asked at that time? Yes, Your Honor. I'm assuming any question would have to be relevant and germane to the matters in this case. And as a result, she would invoke as to those questions. All right. And so uh, I'm just going to assert my previous ruling that I've made, and I did restate it on the record yesterday, is that um, she'll be required to testify under the state subpoena. The cross-examination uh, will be limited to whatever uh, the state uh, brings forth on direct. So that's what the cross-examination scope will be limited to. Uh, there's no piggybacking or bringing in any other information just because she's under the state subpoena. That's not going to be permissible. And then she's not going to be permitted to be called as a witness. Uh, now that we know that she's just going to assert her uh, Fifth Amendment right, she won't be called as, as a witness uh, in the defense case at this time. Yes, Your Honor. That's okay. exactly our understanding of the law. All right. Okay. Anything else for the court? No, sir. Okay. I'm going to ask that Ms. Adelson then uh, please remain outside the courtroom because uh, She's subject to the rule. Yes. All right. Thank you. Our cross-examination ability, which was precisely in the case of Catherine McBanwa versus State of Florida that was issued by the first DCA on this direct issue warned about this exact thing happening, which is 
that and the court even stated that it would be reversible error for our cross-examination to be limited because the state can tailor their direct examination to prohibit us from going into areas that could potentially be relevant. All right. Thank you, Ms. Watts. We've gone through these arguments before. I think you've made a record prior, and so I appreciate that. You further made your record, and so my ruling stands. I appreciate it. Thank you, Judge. All right. Thank you. All right. And the first witness will be Marcia Rodriguez. Okay. All right. So anything else from the state before we bring the jury in? Ms. Kappelman? Ms. Dugan, is this your witness? No, sir. This is Ms. Kappelman, but I did want to follow up with the court with an issue that came up yesterday regarding whether portions of the defendant's testimony. Okay. I did some research myself on that. And I brought some case law for the court. I provided it to the defense. And I can give the court a two-minute summary of this in an argument, or we can do that at a later time. We don't expect to try to elicit anything or play anything into that right now. Okay. If it becomes an issue again that's objected to, then I'll hear the argument at that time. I did do some research on my own in regards to the admissibility of her trial testimony from the earlier trial. And so based on how it's presented or if there are any other issues connected with that, then when it's presented as a particular issue, I'll make my ruling at that time. Yes, sir. Okay. Would you like this? I have enough at this point. All right. Thank you. All right. Anything else from the state? No, sir. Anything from the defense? Just a, I guess I call this a housekeeping matter, given the fact that Mr. Rivera is going to be testifying. And I just want to give the court as much notice. If we can get some sort of secondary table, perhaps something like this, or if we can use this one for Mr. Rivera, there's just a lot of paperwork, all of those transcripts, and I'll be able to move a lot smoother if I have it laid out. Okay. You're asking, do you want that up here by the podium when you have the podium up here? Is that what you're asking? I put it next to me. I need something a little bit bigger than that. Your courtroom officer is pointing out. If I could potentially use that from the state, it would work out great and it would move real smooth. I just have it next to me laid out with the computers and we can move smoothly. Okay. So I want to make sure what you're asking for. I don't know what you're pointing to over here. Oh, this right here. The state would let me use this table for the cross. Okay. Okay. So it can remain right there and then you just want to set your items on that? I wheel it right up here, put it next to me. Okay. All right. Well, there's some things. I don't know what that is on it. And so I want to make sure that, let's see if we can get something else that would be sufficient that gives us at least the square footage of what that table is that we could wheel in here. Okay. We'll get something available to you. We'll make sure that it's in here by lunchtime for your use after that. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Anything else before we bring the jury in? Nothing from the state, your honor. Nothing from the defense. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let's bring the jury in, please.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. All right, please be seated. And again, good morning to everyone, and thank you for your timeliness. And we are doing our best to uh, remain timely for you here in the courtroom. Uh, we're ready to continue with the testimony at this time, and so the state may call its next witness. The state calls Marsha Rodriguez. Marsha Rodriguez, please. Good morning. Can you come up to the witness stand, please? Yes, sir. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Respond to the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir, I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. Yes, sir. Please state your name and spell your name. Good morning, my name is Marcia Rodriguez and it's spelled M-A-R-C-I-A-R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z. Where were you employed back in 2014? I worked for the Tallahassee Police Department. How long did you work for TPD? I worked with them for about 27, a little over 27 years. And what's your current status? I am retired, but now I'm, I'm back as a reserve officer working for the Tallahassee Police Department. All right, and back in 2014, what type of duties did you have at TPD? I was assigned to our Special Investigations Division as a Digital Forensic Investigator. What does a Digital Forensic Investigator do? Um, so when investigators or officers need assistance with trying to obtain evidence off digital devices, cell phones, um, computers, tablets, those types of things, they would bring those items to us that work in that um, position to assist them in trying to um, collect the evidence off of it. And as part of your duties back in 2014, did you download a device that was purported to be owned by Wendy Adelson? Yes, ma'am. All right, what type of device was that? It was an Apple iPhone 4. What type of downloading do you do? So we would use um, the, the tool that we use to extract the evidence off of the phones um, is Celebrate. Um, it's a tool that allows us to plug up the phone and pull out the electronic data and print it out or you know, pull it out into whatever type of format we needed it. All right, and so the downloading process creates an extraction report? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, but does not change the content of the phone itself? Oh no, not at all. All right, I'm gonna approach and show you what I've marked as 55 through 58. <coughs> Do you recognize dates 55 through 58? Those are, um, so when we do an extraction on the phone, it will, we can create a report from it, and these are pieces um, from that report. They're samplings, it's not the entire report, it's just pages from that printed report. And are they fair and accurate portions of the Celebrate report from Wendy Adelson's cell phone? Yes, ma'am. That you downloaded? Yes, ma'am. Judge, at this time, I'd like to move into evidence dates 55 through 58. Any objection? <laughs> We may take a look at it again. Sure. You repeat this one. Where 
Were those admitted, Your Honor? Excuse me? Were Not those yet. Items I'm admitted? still waiting if there's any objection. Okay. All right, be admitted as states 55 to 58. No further questions. Cross examination. Your Honor, if we could go sidebar on something. Sure. All right, Ms. Rodriguez, we're going to ask you to review some documents uh, before your cross-examination. Yes, sir. And uh, once you review those documents, I think you'll see why. So we're going to uh, continue your cross-examination after the break so that you have an opportunity 
to speak with counsel and take a look at some documents so that when we bring you back up, things will go a little bit smoother. Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, and also so you won't have to be recalled at a later time. Perfect. Okay. Yes, sir. So I'm going to excuse you at this point. You're still uh, subject to the subpoena and we will see you back for your cross-examination after the break and the attorneys will be talking to you outside. So if you could just go remain out there and they'll see you soon. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, state may call its next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Wendy Adelson. All right, Wendy Adelson, please. Adelson, if you come to the witness stand, please. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in. Please raise your right hand and respond to the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Please have a seat. Ms. Kaplan. Thank you, Your Honor. Please introduce yourself and spell your name. Uh, my name is Wendy Adelson, W-E-N-D-I-A-D-E-L-S-O-N. Ms. Adelson, where do you currently live? I currently live in Miami Beach. And are you here today pursuant to a state subpoena? Yes, I am. And do all state subpoenas confer immunity? I don't know if all state subpoenas confer immunity, but this one does. Well, okay, and do you believe that your subpoena is special or different from other state subpoenas? I. I don't believe it's special or different, so I suppose they all carry immunity. All right, and does the immunity conferred upon you by the subpoena mean that you can never <coughs> be prosecuted associated with this case? That's right. That's what you think it means? That's what I think it means. Okay. And do you think, isn't it true that it's use and derivative use immunity? Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay, but not complete immunity from prosecution. Do you agree with that? That's different than what you just asked before. So I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? All right, so what I'm trying to allow the jury to understand is what sort of immunity you have. What is your understanding of what it means for you to have immunity pursuant to the state subpoena? So I have derivative and use immunity. And so in the future, a prosecutor couldn't use what I say here today against me. Correct but you could be prosecuted, you, just nothing you said here today could be used against you in that prosecution. Do you agree with that? I suppose so. Okay. Have you made any sort of special deal with the state attorney's office or with any law enforcement or government agent? No. All right, was there a time that you lived in Tallahassee? Yes, I used to live in Tallahassee. What was the time frame that you lived here? I was here for about eight years. I lived here my last year of law school, so the academic year 05-06. We were in Miami for 06-07, and then I would have been back 2007 to 2014. All right, and what brought you back to Tallahassee after you returned to Miami after law school? Um, well, I returned to, I went to Tallahassee to finish law school. Mm -hmm. And then we went to Miami because Danny had a job opportunity at University of Miami. Okay. It didn't come to fruition. He was not hired. And so we came back to Florida State. And so your husband had a job opportunity here at Florida State? Yes. Okay. And that's what brought you to Tallahassee? That's what brought us here. And you also had a job opportunity at Florida State. Is that right? That's right. What was that job? I worked at the FSU Center for Human Rights. And at first, I was a staff attorney. I used to represent victims of violent crime, uh, asylum seekers, and victims of human trafficking. And then I taught various classes at FSU Law School. Um, and then I ran something called a medical legal partnership. And how long did you do that? Uh, I was working at FSU for seven years. 
All right, so the, basically the whole time you were here in Tallahassee. When I wasn't a student, I was working for FSU. All right. When did you meet Dan Markell? Danny and I met, we met first online, and we met when I was starting my 2L year of law school. So that would have been 04, fall of 2004. And when were the two of you married? We were married in February 2006. Do you have any children in common? We have two children. All right, both boys? Both boys. All right, during the time that you moved to Tallahassee the, the second time to work here at Florida State, were you living with Dr. Markell the entire time as a married couple? I'm sorry, Dr. Markell? I'm sorry, Mr. Markell, Dan Markell, your husband. Um, were we living as a married couple when we returned to Tallahassee? Yes. Yes. So All by right. that point, we returned in August maybe of 06, so we got married in February of 06, so we've been married six months by then. And the entire time that you were living as a married couple, was that at the Trescott address that we've seen photos of earlier? No, we lived first in a rented house. I actually don't remember what neighborhood it was now. It's been a while. Um, but we lived there until we bought our house, so maybe six months in the other location. I don't remember exactly how long. All right. Do you remember what year you moved into the Trescott address? Um, we moved into the Trescott address maybe, I don't remember exactly what year, probably it w would have been 2008 or 2009. It was before my older son was born. All right, and you were living there in 20, well, he was living there in 2014 when this murder occurred, correct? He was living there in 2014. And you were no longer living there? I stopped living there in 2012. In 2012, was there a separation first before a divorce or? Yes, there was a separation. When was the separation effective? September 2012. And whose decision was it to separate? It was my decision. And was part of the reason for the separation differing views on how your children should be raised within the Jewish faith? I mean, that's certainly part of it, but not really a central decision. It was more just our relationship overall. I mean, Danny certainly wasn't, we were on different pages when it came to religion, but I wouldn't say okay. that was. And that's what I'm specifically inquiring about, was that part of it? So I think your answer is yes, that was part of it. Sure. Okay, well, you were, you are both Jewish, correct? Yes. All right, and both of you did agree to raise the children within the Jewish faith? Is we that did. Correct? And we okay, have. so what were the differences between the two of you on that front? Um, probably in the observance of keeping kosher. So I, I don't keep kosher and Danny did, and that became difficult to do in Tallahassee and difficult to do with differing beliefs around that. Can you explain for the jurors what keeping kosher means? Sure. Um, it's a separation of milk from meat. Uh, so you couldn't have a cheeseburger, for example, right? You couldn't have milk with a meat product. Um, and the meat has to be killed in a ritual specific way that's been blessed by, um, by a rabbi. Um, and you're not supposed to eat shellfish of any kind, so no seafood. Um, and I, there's a lot more rules, but those are, those are just some high level ones. All right, and was it very important to your husband that the children be raised on a kosher diet? Um, it, it was, yes. All right, and that was something that was not important to you? It's not a question of it not being important to me. It just started to supersede other things that are important, like love and trust. Okay, did that diet seem impractical to you? At times it was complicated. I mean, there was one particular time I had taken the boys to a picnic for one of my clients for one of her children, um, and, uh, and my older son had pizza, and Danny was very, very upset about this. He was maybe one at the time, but it was, um, it was pizza that wasn't kosher, and so that became, that became challenging. All right, so this was something that sort of came up as an issue during the course of the marriage. It did. All right, and other things as well. I don't mean to suggest that it was based solely on the children's diets, but that was something that is going to come up later, and I wanted to make sure the jurors understood what was meant by kosher diet.
All right. Did you uh, move out of the marital home when you separated? I did. And where did you go to live when you left the marital home? I rented, uh, I rented a house, and I went to that house. All right. Was that at the Aqua Ridge residence? Yes, it was. Does 3303 Aqua Ridge sound right? That sounds right. Okay. And that location is here in Leon County, right? It is. Okay. As well as the Trescott residence. They're both in Leon County. About how far apart are those two residences? Um, I think it used to take about 15, 20 minutes to drive, depending on traffic. How long after you moved out of the home did you file for divorce? I actually don't remember the answer to that. I'm assuming I would have filed for divorce right away. Within a month, sound about right? That sounds about right. Okay. I'm going to show you Exhibit 59 and ask you to take a look at the exhibit. previously a little bit right I don't have any memory of that okay so this is the first time you've ever seen this exhibit it's the first time I remember it's All right. very I'll big take a look and kind of just thumb through it I, as a feeling don't expect you to familiarize yourself with every page it's and my question is Adelson you can look through it as much as, as needed to answer well, this question. She had a question. What was your it's question? Just, it looks like it's about 800 pages long, so mm -hmm. you want me to look through it? I want you it? to look through it as much as is needed to answer the following question. Does it appear to be a fair and accurate copy of your divorce file? I mean, from the front page, sure. Okay. Do you have, I mean, thumb through it a little bit and just see if there's any reason to dispute that that's your complete divorce file from the clerk's office. It's certified if you want to take a look at the certification. to take a look, if you would, at the petition that is on States Exhibit 59, pages 1 through 5. The one right on top? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The, all the pages should be numbered through, so I'm referring to 1 through 5 on the bottom right corner there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was your petition for divorce, correct? Yes. And so this was, would you agree that this was a contentious divorce? I, I think it was, I think it was made much more difficult by Danny, who didn't want to get divorced. But sure, we can right. call it contentious. Not what we would classify as an amicable divorce. You hear about those? No, it would, it would be not an amicable divorce. All right. And part of what you were seeking in your divorce in these documents in front of you was permission from the court to move with your children to South Florida. Is that correct? That was part of the overall divorce proceedings. All right, and specifically on pages 43 through 50, there's a petition to include a request to be allowed to relocate with minor children. Is that correct? Yes. All right, and why were you seeking to move to South Florida? I was seeking a place that would be stable and permanent for the kids and me. Danny never planned on staying in Tallahassee. It was just a question of time before he moved to New York to be with his girlfriend or had dreams of being at Harvard. So Tallahassee was just a temporary stopping point. I wanted a place that was permanent for us where we had family support. And why did South Florida seem like a place of permanence to you? Right, I mean, because we had family support, uh, because I work in immigration. There were a lot of uh, career opportunities for me there. Are you from South Florida? I am. Okay, and when you say family support, what family resided there? Uh, my mother, father, and brother. Mm -hmm. Was the relocation to South Florida the most important part of your divorce? No. Was it your most non-negotiable term? No. Okay, but it was very important to you? Uh, I wouldn't say it was very important to me. It was, was it very important to your mother? She was much more looking forward to having her daughter and her grandchildren home, yes. All right. If 
you would take a look for me at page 46, paragraph E. Just read that to yourself and let me know when you've had an opportunity to read that. I read the first paragraph by E. Do you want me to read the second one? Uh, yes, please. Okay. And in those paragraphs, Ms. Adelson, is, are you alleging that Mr. Markell has created a hostile work environment for you at the Florida State University College of Law? He did during a period of time. All right, and was disparaging you to your colleagues. And if you'll take a look at pages beginning on 79, the document beginning on 79. And the question is, is this Mr. Markell's 23-page response to your motion to relocate? You're asking me, is this his? His response to your motion to relocate. Yes, it looks like it. All right, that's quite verbose. Would you agree with that? I imagine it is. At some point, Danny fired or alienated all of his attorneys and started doing his own legal work. So Fair to say he was adamantly opposed to you taking his kids to South Florida. Yes, he shared all of that here, which is different than the conversations we had, but this... That's what he filed. This, what he filed, is what the judge uh, sanctioned him for. All yes. Right. And in that filing, I'm specifically referencing to page 82, where Markel states that the sole stated reason the wife seeks to relocate with the party's minor children is so she can be closer to her parents. My understanding is you, you don't agree that's why you wanted to move. It wasn't the sole reason why I wanted to move. Okay. But you do agree it was a reason. It was absolutely a reason. I wanted to create some stability for my kids. And family, having family around, helps have a more stable environment. Is it fair to say that your mother, Donna Adelson, was following this divorce, these divorce proceedings pretty closely? She was definitely being a little bit over-involved, yeah. She was pretty invested in your personal life. Is that fair to say? She is one of those moms, yes. All right, and we talked about your mom, Donna Adelson. Who's your father? What is my father's name? Mm -hmm. Harvey Adelson. And where do Donna and Harvey live currently? They live in Miami. All right, and are you still very close with your parents? I am. All right, and do you still live in close proximity to your parents? I live about a 15 minute drive away. Right. And where did they live at the time that Dan Markell was killed? They lived in Coral Springs, Florida. And were you close with your mom back around the time that you were living in Tallahassee? I was. And did she have a close relationship with your children as well? She did. Are your parents employed? Uh, right now they are both retired. What about back in 2014? In 2014 they were both employed. How were they employed then? Then my father had a dental practice and my mom was managing his practice. What's the name of the dental practice? Dr. Harvey Adelson, DDS. All right, does Adelson Institute ring a bell as well? Yes. Okay. And do you know whether the practice there was successful, meaning lucrative? At one point it was, and um, what about not between, anymore. <laughs> what about between 2013 and 2016? Was it lucrative at that time? Between 2013 and 2016, it was definitely, the business was doing better than it did after that point when the social media barrage happened. Um, Referring to this case? Absolutely. Okay. But previous to the murder, the Adelson Institute was earning approximately $2 million in profit each year. I have no idea what it was earning. I haven't the slightest idea, but. Do you know whether your parents amount. had other investments other than their work at the Adelson Institute? I don't know. You don't know if they own any properties? I know now that they own properties, but I didn't then. Okay, and do you know now that they owned properties then? 
I actually don't know when they acquired the property, okay. so I don't know. All right, was your divorce impacting your family financially? So this is prior to the murder and the It was certainly meeting. impacting me financially, but I, I don't think it was impacting the rest of my family. All right, how many lawyers did you have in your divorce? I had one. And then Danny accused her of ethical violations and stealing money. And so I had to hire a new attorney. Um, I think he had three or four. No, I was talking about you. So you had two. I had one and then I had to get another. Yes. All right. And who paid for those two attorneys? I did. Okay. Did your mom retire from the dental practice? during the time of your divorce to facilitate her spending more time with the children? No, she didn't retire from the dental practice. She did help me during the divorce and help me with the kids. They were very small, but she didn't retire. She just worked for my dad, so it was okay if she took a leave of absence here and there. All right. Did you discuss your marital problems and the resulting legal issues with your mother? I'm sure I did. Is it fair to say your mother is a controlling person? I think my mom is and was very invested in my life. I don't think of her as a controlling person. Is it fair to say around the time of your divorce that your mom did not like Dan Markell? I think that's fair to say. I think she was very disappointed by the way he treated me. In fact, she despised him, didn't she? I can't speak to how my mom felt or whether she despised him. I think she was very disappointed. She sent you some emails to indicate her feelings about Dan Markell around that time, didn't she? She did. I'm going to show you what I've marked as States Exhibit Ms. Kappelman, do you want me to read it? No, ma'am. Just take a look at those and tell me if you can authenticate them as emails um, that were sent to you from your mother. I can authenticate them. All right. So the Donna Harvey at gmail.com is your parents' shared email address. Is That's, that correct? Yes. Okay. And But these emails were coming from your mother based on the context. Is that right? Not your dad. I imagine they probably represented both of their feelings. They've been married 51 years, so sometimes my mom speaks for my dad. Okay. All right, so there's one, I believe it's on top there, dated May 3rd, 2013. Was that about three months before your divorce was finalized? My memory is that our divorce was finalized in June 2013. So okay. wouldn't that just be one month before? I had July 31st, so. Okay. Whatever is your memory. So, okay, it was, this was May and our divorce was finalized in July then. Okay. I just want to talk a little bit about the emails that are in front of you there. So on that first email dated May 3rd, 2013, page one of five, in the second real paragraph, does your mother indicate that the most important Objection. part of your divorce is Objection. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a second, Ms. Kappelman. I don't believe this item is in evidence, Your Honor. The items have not been admitted into evidence at this point, Ms. Kappelman. Correct. All right, so I don't want you reading from them if they haven't been admitted into evidence. All right, Ms. Adelson, did your mother indicate to you that to her the most important part of your divorce Objection. is relocation? Objection, Objection. That's sustained. Okay, Judge, at this time I would ask to approach. Sidebar the witness. Sidebar. Oh. Oh,
All right, Ms. Adelson, what was the most important part of your divorce to your mother? You're asking in reference to the email or not in reference to the email? Not in reference to the email. So just in general, what for yes. her, it was probably for me to be safe and be in a stable situation with the boys. Okay, would it refresh your recollection to take a look at the emails in front of you, States Exhibit, which are marked as States Exhibit 63? If I look at it, she's saying Hold here. Hold on a second. Just review just, it, okay? Um, if you'd read to yourself the about the first half of that second real paragraph. Just review it to yourself, and then Ms. Kaplan will ask you another question. All right, does that refresh your recollection about what your mother felt was the most important non-negotiable term of your divorce? It does. Okay, and what was that? That was relocation. And did your mother, I think you said she was very unhappy with him. Did you agree that she despised him? I really, I can't speak to whether my mom despised him or didn't. She was very, very disappointed with the way he treated me. Okay, and did she ever call him names? I don't remember her calling him names. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at the emails for that? I'm happy to. Okay, if you'll take a look at uh, page one, about halfway down. Just read those few sentences there, and then I will draw your attention to page two when you're ready. Actually, you know what, for refreshing purposes, I'm going to approach with my copy. And I'm just going to kind of draw your attention to the same items highlighted in green. If you'll just look at those to yourself and then flip through and look for those items highlighted in green. Okay. Do you want me to flip through the whole thing? No, it, uh, go through and just to yourself look at the items. It's a lot to expect of me, I'll say, being yeah. a proper refreshment. I know. I don't want to like it too much. <coughs> I know I try to get the record part of it. And I did that. Did your mom ever refer to your husband as an asshole? Yes. A bully? Yes. A zealot? A religious zealot, yes. A jackass? Yes. A religious extremist? Yes. Uh, what about Jibbers? What it, she calls him Jibbers? Yeah, Jibbers is not a bad name. It was a silly name that I came up with during a period of time when I felt incredibly terrorized by Danny. And so it was a word that I would use to kind of make him seem less scary. Is it fair to say that it was a derogatory term? No. Okay, but you came up with it directly in relation to him terrorizing you. I did. It was a way to take the steam out of a situation I found scary. I wouldn't say it was derogatory. I just think it was... And when you say scary, are you alleging physical abuse? I'm not alleging physical abuse. All right. What types of things did your mother suggest that you could do to try to um, coerce or acquire the ability to relocate your kids to Miami? She suggested that I could change the religion. Of who? Of my children. And why would that affect the relocation effort? Because religion was so important to Danny that that would be that would be a real hot button thing. Okay. And did she ever suggest that you could bribe your husband to allow the relocation? She did. And how much money did she suggest that she and the family would be willing to put up for such a bribe? So I just saw the bribe reference, but I didn't see the amount. If you want to I show me, I will refresh you on that. Should you see it? Did you see it? Just a moment to find it myself. Your Honor, 
overruled. They said that they would go as high as a million dollars, which would be 333000 each. And who are the each? My mom, my dad, and Charlie. Did Charlie, you mentioned he also lived in South Florida. Was he employed at the family dental practice? He worked there sometimes. And what type of work did he do? He is a periodontist, so he would sometimes do um, implants or surgery for people. Did your motion for relocation get granted or denied by the court? It was denied by the court. So you were not legally permitted to move? To Miami? No. Did you have an alternative? You mentioned previously that there was a hostile work environment at Florida State University as a result of your husband did, or your ex-husband at this point, were you caught, was the failure to be able to relocate, did that cause you to remain in that environment? It did. For how long? Um, I don't remember the date that the petition to relocate was denied. If you could show me the binder, I can I could find the date. And I'll draw you to pages 262 and 263. In the binder? Oh. Okay, so the order was on June. No. It was June 20th, 2013. So I was still working at the law school through July 2014. So I stayed for one more year. Okay. And it was subsequent to his death that you were able to find new employment that was in a less hostile work environment. Is that accurate? I mean, eventually after his death, I found new employment. It took me a little while. Okay. How long did you stay in Tallahassee after your husband was killed? Ex-husband, sorry. stayed a couple of days, um, and then after I had asked the police for protection at the funeral or in my home, and they refused, I decided to just go for a couple of days and spend a few days away from Tallahassee. <laughs> and then this case hit CNN and hit the media. And so I didn't I don't mean safe. to interrupt you, but the question was, how long did you stay in Tallahassee after your husband was killed? I'm sorry, Ms. Kappelman. I stayed for a few days. Thank you. All right. So how did your mom take the news that you were not going to be able to relocate? She was very upset. One moment, please. All right. 
I want to talk a little bit about the litigation that continued after your divorce was final. Was there a motion to enforce the marital settlement agreement and hold Markel, Dan Markel, in contempt of court filed by you? Yes. All right. And a few months later, did he respond with a counter motion to enforce the marital settlement agreement's final provisions, alleging some violations that he said you made on the marital settlement agreement? Yes. Okay. And these filings are pretty venomous. Is that a fair characterization? Not on, not on my part. Well, on both your parts, right? No, ma'am. Okay. And he accuses you of various things, lying about your financial affidavit and things like that. Would you agree? He does make those accusations. They were completely baseless, but yes. All right. And... Oh, did you, did, in the pleadings, is the tennis racket mentioned as something to fight over? <laughs> and I, um, I can draw your attention to that page in line if you need it. I imagine it could have been. You can draw my attention if you like, and I can confirm. Okay, but no reason to argue about the fact that a tennis racket is mentioned specifically in your divorce documents. No. I mean, that sounds like some of the nonsense that we argued over, sure. Okay. And... Was there a motion, I want to draw your attention specifically to this motion, it's on page 441 of that document in front of you, Exhibit 59. This motion was filed by Dan Markell on March 26th of 2014, so shortly before his death. I see it. Okay, what was that motion? Former husband's counter motion for enforcement of MSA on parenting issues and motion for contempt and sanctions. And in that motion, did he allege that you were violating the marital settlement agreement in a variety of ways? Yes, it looks like he did. Including failing to facilitate communication between he and the boys, failing to keep him informed of where his kids are, Failure to communicate about parenting decisions like the kids' schooling, diet, and extracurricular activities, things like that. Yes, that looks right. All right. And was he, as part of this motion, seeking to enjoin you from allowing your mother to have time with the children that was unsupervised by another adult? I am not seeing that right now, but I can continue reading through okay, it. Okay, take your time. Actually, oh wait, still going. Is this a question that you need refreshing on? Did, did your husband make these allegations? You don't have an independent recollection of that? I don't have an independent recollection. Okay. He made a lot of allegations that weren't true, so I need right. to look through to figure out which ones we're talking about. Okay. Okay, I see it. I see what you're referencing. All right, so in that filing, Dan Markell alleges that your mother is disparaging him to the children, correct? That is correct. And he was seeking a court order saying she couldn't have contact with the kids unless there was another adult present, correct? I see that here. I don't think I took it seriously at the time, so it didn't really lodge in my memory. Did but your mom I... take it seriously? No. Was it ever ruled on? I don't know. If it were, it should be here, right? Yes, ma'am. Is it here? No, it's not. It was scheduled to be ruled on in August of 2014, right? I don't know right. I don't know when it was scheduled for. I knew no, I do know that nobody took it very seriously. Okay. So your mom wasn't worried about that that motion being granted. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your brother. You can just sort of close that binder and leave it in front of you if that's okay. How old is your brother, Charlie Adelson? Uh, he is 45. Is he your older or younger brother? I have two older brothers, so he is one of the two older brothers. Are you closer to one more than the other? Yes. Which one are you closer to? Charlie. 
And has that always been the case or just since this case? No, it's not since this case. Um, I think when we were kids, uh, I was probably closest to my oldest brother. And then after getting to be an adult myself around my 20s, I was probably closer to my middle brother. Around the time of 2013 and 2014, were you closer to Charlie at that time? I would say so. All right. And are you aware of any connection at any time between your brother Charlie and any gang members? No. Did your brother use drugs? <laughs> he did, yeah. What type of drugs did he use? Marijuana. Okay, what else? I don't know of anything else. Okay. And do you know where he got the drugs from that he used? I don't. Okay. Was he a recreational marijuana user or was he a drug dealer? I would say he was a recreational marijuana user. Okay. Was this something he did every day or just occasionally? I don't know how often. I don't know if it was every day, but I do know that the pain of the last few years has led him to do some self-medicating. Okay, but I'm really speaking of the time frame I should have clarified, 2013 to 2014. I don't know if he was using any drugs during that time. Okay. But you became aware of it subsequent to the incidents that we're here about today? That's right. Okay. Were you aware that your brother, I think you testified he sometimes worked at the Adelson Institute. What did you mean by that? Where else does he work? So he is a periodontist and he has kind of a traveling practice of sorts. So he would work in various doctor's offices throughout Broward, Dade, and Palm Beach counties. And so sometimes he would work from my dad's practice, but sometimes he would work from different offices. I, I don't know how often he worked at which one, I just know he worked at various offices. All right, so I asked you, I'm sorry to change topics on you so much, but previously we were talking about your two brothers. Is your other brother, not Charlie, but your other brother, is, is he located here in Florida? He is not. All right, and back in 2014, was he living in another state? He lived in Gainesville for a while. I'm trying to remember in 2014 if he was in Gainesville. I, I don't think so. I think he was in another state. All right. So been in another state throughout this the, the incidents we're here about today. I believe so, yes. Okay. All right. Now back to what we were talking about with your brother Charlie's practice. So he travels around to different dentist offices and performs a specific service like on a contract basis. All right. And... Are you aware that he does that type of work or offers a discount for that type of work if his customers pay in cash? I'm not aware of that. Are you aware of your brother carrying large amounts of cash? He did sometimes carry more cash than I would, but not like big sums of cash, no. And did you observe the cash that he carried to be stapled together in packs? No, I never saw staples. Has your brother ever been married? No. How would you describe the kind of lifestyle your brother was enjoying back around the time of these incidents, 2013, 2014? I think he lived a bachelor lifestyle, very different than mine. Um, would enjoy nice restaurants, had lots of girlfriends. Not a lot of lot. responsibilities. Not a lot of responsibilities. A lot of girlfriends. You say not a lot of? A lot of different girlfriends. Always a different girl, yeah. yeah. Um, who is Jerome Obed? He is uh, a person who used to live with my brother. Do you know the time frame that he lived with your brother? I remember I introduced him to his current wife, and that was maybe 2011. So maybe during the period, I don't know how much I can tell you he was living with them that year. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know for how long before or how long after they lived together. They were friends, though. Oh, so you, okay, so you can't tell us whether he was living with your brother in the 2013-2014 time frame that I, we're here about. I don't remember. Okay. And is uh, Mr. Obed also a doctor, a dentist? He is um, a dermatologist. Dermatology, thank you. All right, and your brother, we were talking about his lifestyle and the girlfriends. Does he also drive fancy cars? <coughs> he does. Including a Ferrari? <coughs> Yes. All right. And 
Were you aware of his one of his girlfriends by the name of Catherine Magdanawa? Yes. Did you ever have the opportunity to meet that particular girlfriend? Yes, we met maybe two or three times. Two or three times? Do you recall what the occasions were? There was one time we had dinner when I was in town, which is what I did every time I'd come to town and have dinner with my brother and a different girl. Um, and then one time I went to the beach for an hour or so and she and a friend of hers joined us. Okay, and was there a third time? I don't actually remember a third time. All right, so was there anything special about this girlfriend in terms of her relationship with your brother? Did they seem closer or more serious? It didn't seem serious. Did, were you off put by Ms. Magbana Wah for any reason? Did she seem like different from the ordinary trail of women that came no. through his life? She seemed perfectly nice. Did you bond with her in a special way? Did you have a different type of relationship with her than you had with any of his other girlfriends? No, I mean, if anything, I'd say I'd been closer to other girlfriends. I only met her twice. All right, what about her ex? Sigfredo Garcia, were you aware of him at all before this case? No. So you didn't even know she had an ex? I knew she had an ex because my brother once mentioned that he was dating a girl and she had an ex that seemed a little scary. All and right. I said, maybe you should stay away from that. Yeah, and so the ex, did you have specific knowledge about why he was a little scary? No. And did Catherine Magbanawa ever tell you anything that was specifically scary about him? No. Did, were you aware of your brother having any communications with the scary ex-husband? No, only that my brother seemed a little scared of him, but I don't know that they talked or didn't talk. So it would be surprising to you to learn that they had a relationship. Very. What about your ex-husband, Dan Markell? Did you ever know him to be involved with any type of drug activity or gangsters, anything like that? No. Danny consulted on criminal law cases, so mm -hmm. I do remember there being a case involving Orthodox rabbis that were engaging in some very um, violent activity, and mm -hmm. that had me concerned, but other than that, no. Okay. Not in his personal life? No. no. Okay. Was your brother Charlie, or is your brother Charlie, protective of you? He is, yeah. Did you discuss your marital problems with him back during the time of 2013-2014? I did. Is it fair to say that in the time frame leading up to the murder of your ex-husband that your brother did not like your ex? I think it's fair to say. I mean, I also think it's fair to say he wasn't particularly concerned with it. He was leading his own life and not really focused on mine. But your mom was really focused on yours. My mom was was focused on mine. And your mom was in the ear of your brother quite a bit, same as she was with you, right? I don't know about how much she was in his ear or not. Did your brother ever mention hiring a hitman to kill your ex-husband? He never mentioned hiring a hitman. He told one bad off-color joke where he said he had bought me a TV when I got divorced and said it was a present and made a, a very bad joke and bad taste that it was cheaper than hiring a hitman. And was but, that... You know, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, that's okay. What else were you going to say? I, I think that was it. All right. Was that a joke that your brother made one time or more than one time? He has a tendency to repeat himself. So everything he says, he says multiple times. Do you know how many times he said it? I have no idea, but definitely twice at least. And it was your understanding that he had not made any actual efforts to hire the hitman? Yes. But you did get a TV as a divorce present. I did get a TV. Was there a dinner, a time when you went out to dinner with your brother after the murder where you vomited at the table? That, that happened. <laughs> Just yes or no. Well, would you like to know the context? It did happen. Okay, and who, who was present at that dinner? Just my brother and me. Okay, and that was kind of your first time out after this murder had occurred, right? After it happened, I couldn't eat for several weeks, and then I was completely terrified to leave my house. So this was the first time I tried to 
leave the house and eat food. And that is how it ended up. I threw up. At the dinner table mm -hmm. in a restaurant. Yes, it was very embarrassing. How long after the murder was, was that incident? Probably about a month or so. Was the dinner intended to be a celebration of the fact that your husband was murdered? Absolutely not. Did your brother refer to it as a celebration? I highly doubt that. Could that have been one of his jokes that was in bad taste? He may have been celebrating the fact that I was willing to leave the house. All right. Were you involved in the plot to kill your husband? Absolutely not. Did you have knowledge of the plot to kill your husband? No. But you suspected that your family was involved? No, I did not suspect that my family was involved. Did you mention in your interview with law enforcement that you suspected that your family could be behind this? I think I speculated about lots of things during the six hours I spent with law enforcement without an attorney present trying to help them solve this murder. Yes, I said all kinds of things. All right, and one of the things you said was that your family very much disliked him and that you thought it was possible that someone had done this on your behalf unbeknownst to you. I did say I thought someone might have done this on my behalf, yes. And who did your brother know that had connections that could get something like that done? I have no idea. Do you know Catherine Magvanawa? I have met Catherine Magvan Magvanawa twice, as and I mentioned. She was your brother Charlie's girlfriend at the time of this murder, wasn't she? I believe Objection. so. Has to answer. There may have been other girlfriends Overruled. at the time. Right. Wait a second. Okay, now answer the question. Specifically at the time of the murder, Catherine McBanawa was your, your brother's girlfriend at that time, correct? I think so. Okay. And can you identify her? You mentioned you've been to the beach with her on one occasion and dinner on another occasion. Do you Eight see her in the ago, courtroom? Yeah. I, I do. Could you please point her out and describe what she's wearing? She is, um, she is sitting over here. She has on a striped blouse and a blazer. Let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. You mentioned that your brother Charlie had a lot of girlfriends. Did you meet all of his girlfriends? I highly doubt I met all of them, but I, I met a lot of them. All right. And specifically in reference to this defendant, did you talk to her on the phone ever separate from your brother? I have no memory of ever doing that. I don't think so. Okay, so it wasn't like you had become girlfriends or had an independent relationship with no. her. You only saw her secondary to visiting your brother? Twice on two occasions. Let me show you State's Exhibit 35. Yes, I do. That was the second time we got together. It looks like the three of us at the <coughs> beach. So it's me, Katie, and one of her friends. Do you remember the friend's name? I do not. If I said it, would you be able to say yes or no? I wouldn't. OK. And do you know when the photo was taken? I don't. My best guess is 2013 or 2014. Okay. One moment, please, Your Honor. Okay. Do you recall going to Miami for Father's Day in June, before, right before Dan Markell was murdered? I don't have a strong memory of it, but it sounds like something... I might have done to visit my dad. Okay. Did you previously testify in reference to this same photograph or a similar photograph? Yes, I have. 
Okay, and did you testify at that time? Objection, Your Honor, and proper impeachment. Okay. We'll return to it, Judge. All right, that's sustained. All right, and did you have any contact with this defendant since the murder in any kind of way, any communication? No. Did you have any contact with her in any way on the day of the murder? No. Do you remember what girlfriends came after Catherine Magdanawa as far as your brother's girlfriends? In order? Just do your best. I do. I mean, I feel nervous about saying their names out loud just to— Why don't we just use first names then? I remember Whitney. Okay. After Whitney. Whitney, uh-huh. And was Whitney a serious girlfriend? I think Whitney was a fairly serious girlfriend. All right. And what about after her? I'm blanking after Whitney. Do you remember June? Yes. Yes, June was after Whitney. Okay. And can you give me the basic time frame for Whitney? I just really remember how old my boys were, but I don't know how long she was in his life for, so maybe like 2014 to 2015 or 16, and then June after that, and I think on and off for a couple of years. And then he was together with the mother of his son, and that was probably 2017, 2018. Okay. I'm going to approach, would it refresh your recollection to look at some text messages so you could give me exact dates of when these women were in your brother's life? Sure. specifically referencing these messages that are in the red letter. So help me understand, though. This is a message between... Just take a minute and sort of take your time and look at it. I'm using this to figure out who he was dating when? Yes. Okay. And you're just going to take a look at it and tell me if it refreshes your recollection. If you can't figure out what it is or it doesn't refresh, then you let me know. Okay. Right, so it looks like he was with her, he was with Whitney in 2014, 2015. Okay, and the specific date? I mean, it just means that they're in touch with each other. It doesn't mean that they're dating. Okay, and when were they in touch with each other? It looks like she's telling me Whitney is trying to get back together with him in May. Objection, Your Honor. At this point, the witness is just testifying off the documents, which we've only seen for a few seconds. I'm going to sustain that. I don't want you reading from the documents. What you need to do is take a look at them. If it refreshes your recollection as to what the information that is being asked, then testify to that. If you're just having to read from that document and you don't recall independently, then your answer is that you don't recall. Okay, thank you. Yes, my answer is the same as it was. I said 2014, 2015, and it looks like there's conversation around that time. So, okay, it doesn't independently refresh. Okay, let's take a look at a couple more and see if they're more helpful. I think that's it. Yep, it's the same. The same, 2014. Okay. 
All right. So 2014, 2015 for both of those women. Wait, both of those, it's the same woman, it's Whitney. Oh, I was also asking about June. Did Oh, I didn't see did, June in those text messages. Okay, well, when was he dating June? It's a, it's a guess, but I think <coughs> it was around the same time, maybe 2015, 2016. Okay, so is it your recollection that it went Magdanawa, then Whitney, then June? As far as people that I met. Okay. to show you what I've marked as states 36. Do you recognize states 36? I think I've seen this picture before. Okay. <coughs> and do you recognize the people in the picture? I do. Is it a fair and accurate photo of the folks in the picture? It looks like them back in the day, yeah. Okay, and do you know when the photo was taken? I don't. All right. Who is in the photo? It's my brother and Katie. Your brother Charlie? My brother Charlie. Okay. And Katie, the defendant in this case? Yes, ma'am. All right. And is it fair to say this photo was taken during the time that they were dating? It definitely looks like it. And what was that time frame? I don't know the time frame of when they were dating. Okay. Were they dating at the time of this murder? If we've already I believe established so. that. Okay. And is this how they appeared around that time? Is it accurate in your appearance? It seems so. Nobody has any, like, you know, weird facial hair or doctor. I don't know. It looks like I imagine they looked at that time. Okay. And you saw them at that time, around that time, because you went to the beach and you had I dinner. I did. Yeah. I mean, it's been eight years, so they look different. They look different now? Yeah. Okay. But that's how they looked back then? Probably, yes. All right. Judge, at this time, I ask to move into evidence states 36. Any objection? One brief moment, Your Honor. To be a stickler judge, but improper authentication. Overruled. It will be admitted as states 36. What's wrong with that? Go ahead for the vote. You may. I disagree with that. Do you know of any specific gifts that your brother gave this defendant during their relationship? I don't. What about after their relationship? Are you aware of any gifts that they were after the conclusion of their relationship? I am not aware of any gifts between them. Were you aware that she was on the payroll at the Adelson Institute? I know that she worked at the at my dad's office for a while, so it, it would make sense that she was on the payroll. And what duties did she perform there? I have no idea. Okay, and when you say she worked there, did she physically went there? I really don't know. And did you ever work at the Adelson Institute? I did, in okay. between my master's and my law degree. All I right, did and did you see Catherine Magbanawa there when you were working there? No, that was 2003. <clears throat> How do you know that Ms. Magbanawa worked at the Adelson Institute? How do I know? I'm trying to remember if I knew at the time or I found out later. Probably my brother would have told me that that Katie was working, and that's how I would have known. All right. And was that before this murder or since the murder? I have no idea. You don't know the time frame she worked there? I don't know the time frame she worked there, and I don't know why he would have told me. I didn't really – I wasn't very involved with the day-to-day -day operations of the office or what they did. Do you know if your brother had any other ex-girlfriends on the payroll at the Adelson Institute? I don't know. All right, let's go to the day of Dan Markell's murder. What were you doing that day? 
I was at home that morning. I was working on a couple of pieces of writing. I was waiting. I remember the Geek Squad was coming to fix my television. I think was they that said, the same television that your brother had purchased for you as a divorce gift because it was cheaper than hiring a hitman? It was the television that my brother had bought for me. All right. And did your mother, Donna Adelson, arrange from Miami for the Geek Squad to come to your home that morning to fix no, the I TV? Did. Would it refresh your recollection to review some text messages regarding that issue? Hold on a second. Objection, Your Honor. Proper impeachment. The witness gave an answer. Overruled. Yeah, I don't really understand. It's my best recollection that I set up the appointment for them to come. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this happens now where there's a different number on the account, so they call the wrong account. So they could have called my mom and she would have said, no, call my daughter. They need to confirm with you. Okay, but your mom does indicate that she is sending the guy to No, she indicates that she was called by Best Buy. Mm -hmm. So that means she was called by accident since they were coming to my house. Okay. And did you have an appointment scheduled in your calendar, fixed TV? I did. I thought they were supposed to come sometime between 8 and noon. And then they came pretty early, I think, 9 or something like that. All right. And did you delete... She's shown on the far right column there if you need to refresh your recollection, but did you, did you delete that appointment to... To have the TV fixed? I'm usually kind of uh, OCD about this, so after I have a meeting, I'll delete it if it's done. I use my calendar mm -hmm. kind of like a to-do list, so I'll have the meeting and then I'll delete it. Okay. So I must have deleted it once they arrived or sometime later. Okay, and right before the message that indicates, you know, that's from your mother that we just talked about, Best Buy called. Okay. There's a message that says, this is so sweet. Who objection, is that your message Honor. to? Objection. Hold on. What's your objection? <coughs> Hearsay, Your Honor. Item is in evidence. That's sustained. All right. Can you say who the, who that me who the message before the Best Buy message, who, would, who did you send that message to? It looks like I sent that message to my brother. Your brother, Charlie? Yes. All right. And that message was deleted as well? I always delete my messages. But yes, it looks like I deleted it at some point. All right. And that message, what were you referring to in that message, if you know? I have no idea. But it was sweet, whatever it was. I mean, eight years ago, I have no idea what was sweet. Okay. So did Best Buy show up and repair the TV that morning? They showed up and they tried to repair the TV. But there was, I needed to make a call of whether it was worth repairing or whether I should just get a new one because the repair costs, I remember, being expensive. Mm -hmm. And this was, how old was the TV at this point? I don't know. I, I don't think it was very old, just a couple of years. Well, it was given to you as a divorce present at the time of your divorce, right, in 12? Right. So it wasn't that the TV was old. I think one of the kids had thrown something at the screen, so it cracked it. Okay. But the... Fix was done in 14, or the attempted fix. The attempted fix was in okay. 14. All right, so the repairman did show up that morning, correct? Yes. Okay. And you said you did not recall your mom making that appointment, but was it usual or typical for your mom to get involved in that type of minutia of your daily life? No. It would be unusual if she did that. I mean, it would not be unusual for her to try to help me with various things. So 
Um, okay. It doesn't sound out of the realm of possibility, but I, I remember distinctly setting it up for that morning of sometime, you know, like when you wait for a repairman to come, they come in a window, they say between nine and one. I remember there being a window they had told me. And do you remember the specific window in this case? I keep thinking it was eight to 12, but I don't know if that's correct. Okay, and we're talking about 8 a.m., between 8 a.m. and noon. And you agree that your husband, ex-husband, sorry, I keep doing that, was murdered between 8 a.m. and noon. I don't know the exact time of when it happened. Really? Between 8 a.m. and noon? Yes. I mean, yes, but I thought it was closer to 10 or 11. Okay. But the question was, was it between 8 a.m. and noon? Yes, it was between 8 a.m. and noon. All right. And did you leave your residence at all that day after you got the TV or the TV man came? After the TV repairman came, I did a little bit more work from home. I talked to a couple of friends and then I made, um, I made plans to have lunch with two friends that I frequently saw on Fridays. Um, and we made kind of a last minute plan to have lunch. Um, and then I had a few errands to run before I met them. So I, I did that, I picked up gas, I picked up something I needed for a party that night, and then I went to meet my friends for lunch. All right, and do you know what time you left the residence that day? I don't. Um, my guess is somewhere around noon. And then went and ran your errands? On the way to run your errands, did you go by the crime scene? No. On the way to run your errands, did you encounter a roadblock on Trescott? I did. All right, so you did turn off of Centerville onto Trescott. I did. All right, and when you encountered a roadblock, what did you assume the problem was there? I figured it was just an electrical storm or something. There was some, some tape, um, and it looked like the road was blocked off, and so I just turned around and went back and went up Benton. And had there been an electrical storm that morning? I didn't remember an electrical storm, but in the summertime there's always trees falling and rainstorms, so it's pretty normal. All right, and you weren't concerned based <coughs> on that experience that there could be something going on at your, previously your marital home? Absolutely not. And your ex-husband, Dan Markell, had your children at that time, right? No, he did not. Okay, so you had your children at that time? No, my children were at preschool at that time. Right, but who took them to preschool that day? Danny would have taken them to preschool. Okay. So it was his day. He was killed on his parenting day. It was the day he would have brought them to preschool and I would have picked them up. All right. Did, he, did they spend the night with him the night before? They did. Okay. And you hadn't seen your children yet that day when you encountered the roadblock? On Friday, no. And were you on the phone when you encountered the roadblock? If you I remember, was. do you remember who you were speaking to? I do. Who was that? You don't have to say the name, but just what type of person was that? Um, he was a friend. I hadn't caught up with him a long time. He had moved to England, um, so I was probably a little distracted um, talking and catching up with an old friend. And when you encountered, at the time that you encountered the roadblock, or shortly thereafter, did you call the daycare? No. Did you call Dan Markell? No. Did you do anything to reach out to any of the players that we've talked about in this case? No. Did you communicate to anyone that there was a roadblock? I didn't. I would have had no reason to do that. Was Dan Markell scheduled to leave town the day after he was killed? I believe so. Where was he going? <coughs> he was going to New York. And that's where he had a girlfriend? That's where his girlfriend lived. Mm. Do you know how the killers knew that Dan Markell was planning to leave town the next day? I have no idea. You didn't relay that information to anyone? Absolutely not. Did you have WhatsApp on your phone at the time? I really don't know. I have it now. <laughs> I don't know if I had it eight years ago. 
did you communicate with anyone on WhatsApp or similar technology to relay any information about the murder of your husband? Absolutely not. Do you know if your brother Charlie had WhatsApp at the time? I have no idea. Did you communicate with him through WhatsApp? If I had WhatsApp on my phone, then maybe I did. I know I had friends who lived around the world. At that time, WhatsApp was more of a technology you used to talk to people internationally. So I know the friend I was talking to was in England. If I had WhatsApp, I would have used it to call him. Did you know that WhatsApp, the communications are encrypted? They cannot be retrieved by law enforcement? Were you aware of that? I think they can be retrieved by law enforcement, mm -hmm. but it's one of the end-to-end -end encryption services. All right. And so you can't tell the jury whether you communicated through WhatsApp at all on the day of the murder? I don't remember if I had it eight years ago. I have it now, so we could look and figure out if I had it then, but I, I don't know. All right. Did you ever communicate with Catherine Magvano at any time through WhatsApp? I never communicated with her at all. When you left the residence and encountered the roadblock, where were you headed? When I left my residence? Mm -hmm. I was headed to ABC Liquors to get an item that was requested for a stock the bar party. I was supposed to go to that Friday night. Well, was what was that item? Up. I'm sorry? What was the item? It was bourbon. What type of bourbon? Bullet bourbon. And the invitation had asked specifically to bring a bottle of bullet bourbon, so I went to the store and asked them where I could find that. And the bottle of bullet bourbon was in your vehicle when law enforcement came to interview you about this case. Right, when I told law enforcement they could search my vehicle and find away all my rights, yeah. After the murder of Dan Markell, was it your practice to tell people, just acquaintances and peripheral people in your life that he had been involved in an accident? I don't believe so. Do you know whether that was something that your brother told people? I have no idea what my brother told people. Did you ever hear your brother Charlie Adelson tell someone Dan Markell was involved in an accident? No, I've never heard that. I was just thinking law enforcement told me when they were interviewing me that I wasn't supposed to tell anyone what happened until it was released. But And that was just the day of? That was the day of. Okay. <laughs> Did you or your children benefit financially from your husband's death? Absolutely not. Was there a, did your husband have a life insurance policy? He did have a life insurance policy. And what was the value of that policy? I don't know what the value of it was at the time. I do know that his sister's a custodian of that um, life insurance policy and I pay taxes on that money every year, but we don't, we don't receive any of it. What was the value of it at the time of your husband's death? It was a million dollars. Not two million? A million for each child. Two million dollars. All right, and did you believe prior to your husband's murder that you were the custodian of that money for the benefit of the boys? No, we were divorced, so I was the custodian while we were married, but once we were divorced, I was no longer the custodian. So you were aware that he had designated someone else to yeah. do that job? You didn't inquire through your attorney about challenging the designation of the sister as the, the custodian of that money? I wasn't trying to challenge the designation, no. Do you have access personally to that money? No. All right. What about a 401k? Did, did your ex-husband have a 401k when he died? I believe he did. All right. And are you the custodian of that money for the benefit of the boys? I am. That's how I pay the taxes. <laughs> All right, did he have a pension? I don't know. Social Security benefits? I don't know if he had Social Security benefits. As um, survivors, my children receive Social Security mm -hmm. benefits. $4,800 a month, right? That's right. Deferred compensation fund? I don't remember. $217,000, does that sound familiar? I don't remember. Uh, what about the IRA? Did he have an IRA? I really don't know. $100,000? Very possible. What about a checking account? 
I don't know if he, I assume he had a checking account. $15,000 in there, right? Wouldn't go to us, but sure, I imagine he had a checking account. It wouldn't go to you and the boys? Where did it go? Funeral expenses. Okay. All right, and obviously you did not have to maintain your divorce lawyer for any purpose after the murder of Dan Markell. I think at that point he was trying to provide counsel for something else, but no, I didn't. I had to maintain him for a little bit just to close out the case. He had some work to do to, to finalize things. All right. And was your mom able to go back to work full time at the once you moved to South Florida, or did she remain in the status of sort of helping with the kids a lot and she, working part-time? She helped with the kids a lot, especially while I tried to get back on my feet and find work. All right. Have you ever returned to Tallahassee to live after, you said you left about two days after the death? I've never come back to live. I came back to give um, a talk, I think twice. And then I came back for a friend's wedding. Um, I came back for a friend's bar mitzvah. So probably came back four or five times since. Right, but, but the question but not is to, to reside. I'm sorry, Ms. Kappelman. I, I haven't lived here okay. since I left. You've lived steady in South Florida since that date. I have lived in South Florida. Okay, and who has full custody of your two boys? Me. And does your mom have any issues with having access to your boys or does she have full access to your kids? I mean, there's no issues with access, no. How often would you say your mom sees the kids? I think it depends on the week, but probably at least once or twice a week. What, how old are your boys now? They're 11 and 12. How old were they when their dad was killed? It was 10 days before my older son's birthday, so he was almost five. And my younger son was uh, three and a half. Did you change their legal names about a month or so after the murder? No, not a month or so after the murder, no. Okay, when was it done? Even sooner than that? No, absolutely not. Um, when I tried to put my children in school and their faces had been unblurred on CNN and all across social media. Okay, I'm not I'm sorry I thought to interrupt we were in you, but if you'll answer my question, my question is, when were the boys' names changed? The boys' names were changed after I wrote a letter to Danny's family explaining why I was changing their names. When were their names About changed? a year after. Okay, and that was when they were legally changed, July 6, 2015? I don't remember right? the date, but if you have it, that sounds correct. Okay, so they were legally changed on that date, but just a month or so after the murder when you were enrolling them in school is when they effectively had their names changed. That is not true. Okay. And what did you change their names from and to? I changed their last name from their father's last name to mine. From Markel to Adelson. That is correct. And did you also drop the middle name of one of your boys that was a tribute to his paternal side? It was a tribute to both families. Did so you drop it? I did. I lost an honor to both families that day, yes. Do you want the culpable parties in this murder held accountable? Absolutely. And even if it involves your own family? Absolutely. Then do you recall giving an interview with law enforcement on the day that your husband, ex-husband was murdered? I recall sitting with law enforcement for six hours, yes, I recall. And did you tell law enforcement something different in that interview about the culpability of your family? I'm sure while I sat for six hours completely traumatized that I said all kinds of things. All right, and was one of the things you said while you sat for six hours completely traumatized that you wanted the culpable parties held accountable unless it was your family? I don't believe I phrased it like that, and I think you're taking my words out of context, but sure. But sure? But sure what? No further questions. All right, we're going to take our break now. Um, 
And uh, so it'll be about a 10, 15 minute break, allow you to stretch your legs, use the facilities. And so uh, the deputy will take you back. Remember, no discussion about the case or any testimony that you've heard. You can leave your pads on your chairs and we'll be back to continue the testimony in about 15 minutes, okay? Just wait one moment. Okay.
All right, anything before we bring the jury in? Ms. Kaplman? Yes, sir. I failed to ask this witness one line of questioning. I'd like to reopen and inquire of her before we go to cross. All right, I'll permit that. And uh, then we'll go to cross right after that, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Let's bring the jury in, please. Mm -hmm. Please be seated. We're ready to continue with the testimony. Uh, Ms. Kaplman, uh, you may continue with your direct if necessary. Thank you, Your Honor. Salesman, I'm going to approach you with what I've marked as States Exhibit 64. Salesman, did you have an opportunity to review States 99, a disk containing wiretap calls relating to this case? I did. And as part of our pre-trial preparations, were you asked to listen to those calls and verify whether or not you could authenticate some of the voices on those calls? So I was asked not to listen to the whole call, but just to listen to a few seconds enough to be able to identify the people speaking on the calls. And is that what you did? That is what I did. All right. And is State's Exhibit 64 a fair and accurate recording of where your initials appear that representing the, that you could authenticate the voices on that particular call? That is correct. Okay, so for example, the list includes call A on State's Exhibit 99, and you've initialed here indicating that the call is from Donna Adelson to Charlie Adelson. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Judge, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence State 64. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Be admitted as State's Exhibit 64. Okay. No other questions. All right, thank you. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Ms. Adelson, this is all about you, isn't it? Excuse me? This. This is all about you, right? Uh, I was called to be a witness and I'm testifying, so I don't understand the question. Is it a question? There's about 100 people in this courtroom, right? There are people in the courtroom. Possibly thousands watching, right? I have no idea who's watching. And it's all because of your failed marriage, right? I disagree with that. You disagree that your ex-husband is dead because of your family? Yes, I disagree. These jurors are here for weeks doing their civic duty because of your marriage, right? No. Katie's going through this this ordeal because of that marriage, right? No. Dan Martell's parents are going through absolute misery because of your failed marriage. Isn't that right? No, that's incorrect. Well, let's talk about the marriage. You and Professor Markell, you met when you were in law school. You told that to Ms. Kaplan. And it was a whirlwind romance, right? Right? It was not a whirlwind romance, no. It led to a wedding, February 26th of 2006. You had a big wedding in Boca Raton, right? Did we get married on February 26th, 2006? Is that the question? Yes. In Boca Raton? In Boca Raton, Florida. And it wasn't a small wedding. It was a big wedding. There were many people in attendance. All right. In this marriage, it led to two children, right? Your two boys. Are you asking me if I have two boys? Yes. Yes. Professor Markell, he was a, a great father, wasn't he? He was a very good father, yes. 
Those boys were his world, right? As well as his work, yes. And they adored him too, didn't they? Absolutely. Now, this marriage started to fall apart, right? It did. But there were problems from the very beginning, weren't there? Right? Are you asking me, what is the very beginning? The very beginning of when we got married? Literally, at the wedding. There were problems before we got married. All right, so at the wedding, and the, the government asked you about kosher at law, right? About what, I'm sorry? Keeping kosher. About keeping kosher, yeah. Right? And your wedding, kosher. at your wedding, was the, the groom's family, the Markel family, and they are more strict than your family and friends about keeping kosher. They do not keep kosher. Wasn't that one of the problems in your marriage that Professor Markell was very insistent about keeping kosher? About his kosher rules, but those are different than his family's. So you're saying that it wasn't a problem at the wedding, that there were people from the groom side of the family that were there that strictly keep kosher, that they were told that it was going to be kosher food, but it actually wasn't. So there was a misunderstanding about whether the food was going to be kosher style or more in adherence with kosher law. There was a miscommunication about that. So that you happened. had people that strictly keep kosher eating non-kosher food, which is a big deal. That actually is not what happened. You had Danny was upset that it was kosher style and not strictly adhering to kosher law. So, so the, he was disappointed. So there's problems right from the beginning. That was a problem at our wedding, yeah. Fast forward now to September 10th, 2012. Professor Markell, he's away on a business trip, right? Yes. He's in New York City at New York University, right? I believe so, yes. And he's doing a presentation. I, I don't know what he was doing. Your husband at the time was in New York to give a presentation. You knew that, right? I knew he was in New York. I didn't know if he was attending a conference or giving a presentation, but he was in New York for work. Now, you had not communicated with him for two days. I really don't remember. You text him at around 2.30 in the afternoon, right? Right before he's about to do the presentation. I really don't remember. But you do remember dropping the bomb on him, don't you? Telling him that you wanted a divorce. So I did not drop a bomb on him. We'd been in therapy for several months beforehand where I told him several times I wanted a divorce. You say it's not a bomb, but you agree with me that he begged you to reconsider. He was very upset and, yes, wanted me to reconsider, but... In that phone call, he's begging you to reconsider. Please don't leave. Please don't break up our family, right? He was very upset, yes. And he was heartbroken. I mean, upset indicates that there was anger. What he was was heartbroken, right? That I decided to divorce him after telling him I would, yes. Despite being at NYU for a presentation, he rushes home. He gets on the next flight, right? I honestly don't remember if he got on the next flight, but he did come home quickly. 2.30, he finds out in New York. By 11 p.m., he's walking in the door to your old house at Trescott Drive, right? I don't know. But you do know that when he walks in the house, what he finds. You know that, right? Yes, I left him the papers. You left the divorce papers on the bed, right? Yes. Half the furniture was gone. Half the furniture was not gone. A good amount of his stuff was gone. Nothing of his was gone. The boys' stuff was gone, right? Some of the boys' things were gone. I'd taken enough so that I had for the boys, but no. You were gone? I, I was gone, yes. And so were his boys. Um, his boys were not gone. He saw them the next day, and they would not have been awake if he's coming home at 11 p.m. Let, let's, let's stay on topic here. When he, to walks stay on topic. In the, <laughs> when he walks in the door, the boys are not in the house, right? Correct. And you did not tell Professor Markell where you were taking the boys. He may have seen him the next day, but you did not let him know where you were going to be staying with his boys. With our boys? Yes. So you agree with me that they're also his? Of course they're his. And he should be entitled to know where his wife is taking his children. Absolutely. That's not all you took, is it? Excuse me? <laughs> you two had a joint checking account at Schwab, right? We did. And you went into that account before you dropped the bomb. And you took out half of that account, right? Correct. Roughly $350,000. Half, yes, of our $350,000. I don't remember the amount, but yes. 
you know that it was in the hundreds of thousands. I really don't remember the amount, sir. Is it that insignificant of a sum to you that you I'm don't not remember? It's an insignificant sum. I'm saying I can't attest to the amount that was there. Look, I'm going to tone it down now. You were unhappy in the marriage, right? That's why I got divorced, yes. And it happens. Marriages fall apart, right? Yes. But you, you, you complained constantly about it, didn't you? No, I don't think I complained constantly. To anyone that would listen? No, that's not true. You agree with me that you complained to the one person that would actually do something about it? I don't understand what you're asking. Your big brother, Charles Adelson, you complained to him about how bad Professor Markell was and how much you hated him and didn't want to be in a marriage with him. I definitely talked to my brother about how unhappy I was in my marriage. If that's the question, then yes. Let's is talk that the about question? It. Yes, that is a question. You talked to your brother, Charles Adelson, about how bad your marriage was. I did, yes. Let's talk about it. Government asked you about Charles Adelson. He's an intelligent guy, right? He is smart. Yeah. He's both book smart and street smart, right? I would say so. You would say that he's a talker. He does like to talk. He's got the gift of gab, so to speak. I wouldn't say he has the gift of gab, but he does talk. He knows what to say in the moment. I wouldn't say that's true either. <laughs> you would say, though, that he is. Now, you, you were asked questions about you know, drug purchasing and stuff like that. You would agree with me that, that he's also street smart. I mean, I think he has common sense. And that he lives life to a certain extent on both sides of the track. During the day, he's doing periodontal work, whatever that is, you know, crowns, root canals, whatever that is. He's doing that during the day. At night, he's out with friends, he's buying drugs. He's living life on both sides of the I, track. I don't know about that, that he's out buying drugs. Now, let's talk for a second about WhatsApp. And as an aside here for a second, the government asked you the question if you used WhatsApp, right? You remember that? I remember them asking me, yes. On the day that Professor Markell was killed, you went in for the interview, right? I talked to the police. And you also gave them your phone for them to inspect? Absolutely. All right. So the determination of what, if any, WhatsApp was being used, they would have from the download they did that day of your phone? Sure. Now, would you be surprised to learn that your brother used WhatsApp? No. You would agree with me that WhatsApp, and you, and you explained it well, is end-to-end -end encryption. Correct. In your, in your lay opinion, if you can explain to the jurors, just in case they don't know, what that means. I don't. I know that it's something we use at my work because essentially it has the ability to keep things more private. I also know that nothing's actually private and that anyone who wants to can uncode the messages. So that's what we tell people at our work. So the thought is with WhatsApp, if, if I use my phone and I call somebody, the call could be listened to. If I text somebody, it's recordable, right? I think so. But with WhatsApp, you can send messages or have phone calls where there's no record of it. I don't think that's true. I think there is still a record of it. But the, 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 the belief and the thought, I'll withdraw that question. Your lay understanding, though, is that the footprint that it leaves is much less than that of normal communications. I think it's different, but I think it still leaves a digital footprint that's easily uncodable. If you were to send a WhatsApp message to Ms. Kaplan, it would show that a message was sent, but it would be hard to get what the content of the message is. I don't think that's true. All right. Let's, let's talk about your brother's jokes now. You don't deny that he joked about hiring a hitman. He did. You don't deny that he repeated this joke. He did. And he made this joke right before a hitman murdered Professor Markell. I don't know that to be true. Okay. He made the joke right before, and I'll leave out the hitman part, Professor Markell was killed. He made the joke the morning that I talked to him. Yes. Can you think of one person in this world that would actually hire two, two people to go kill Professor Markell other than your family? Your Honor. Ms. Adelson, please answer. Please address me and answer the question. I'd love to. It's just it calls for an unbelievable amount of speculation. I mean, I'm supposed to, I'm I'm responsible for coming up with. Uh, that's the prosecutor's duty, you know, to figure out who's responsible. You just said a moment ago that you you disagree that Hitman killed Professor Markel. That, that's what you said, right? 
So my question to you is, if you're able to say, well, it wasn't Hitman, then who? Tell this jury. Who on this planet would have wanted to kill Professor Markell? I have no idea. All right. Let's get into that a little bit. But I want, I want to make sure that's clear. This joke is made right before Professor Markell is murdered, right? The joke was made many times. It was made right before Professor Markell was murdered, yes or no? Yes. July 18, 2014, you're interviewed, and you make a statement saying, I knew this would happen. You said that, right? I did. All right. Now, I want to talk about your knowledge and your belief on this. You're a smart person, right? How am I supposed to answer that? Well, let's go through your resume. You went to Brandeis University, right? I did. You graduated magna cum laude. I did. If you could explain to the jury what that means. It means I studied a lot and got good grades. It means, and to speak, I'm from the Northeast. My Boston accent may give it away. It means you're wicked smart, right? That's very you had a high GPA, you. a very high GPA. I work hard. You also went and you got a master's degree from the University of Cambridge. I did. You were a Gates scholar. I was. You then go to the University of Miami School of Law, which is a, a top tier law school, tier one, right? Okay. <laughs> Right? We're talking about your level of intelligence. You went to the University of Miami Law School, right? I did, yes. You also clerked at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, right? I did. Now, to get a clerkship out of law school, it's a very difficult thing to do, right? It's challenging. You have to have top grades. You have to go through a rigorous selection process, right? Yes. You then become a, a, a professor at the, the, the Florida State University College of Law, right? You're also a published author, right? Now you're just embarrassing me. Why, why are you embarrassed that you're a published author? I just, I don't like talking about myself. Is it because the book that you wrote discredited Tallahassee and spoke ill of it? <laughs> the book did not discredit Tallahassee. It wasn't about Tallahassee. Let's stay on topic and ask a question again with everything that we just went through. You're a smart woman, right? I am a smart woman. There's information about this case everywhere. You'd agree with me on that, right? I've been advised by my lawyer not to read it. All right. Now, we're not talking about reading stuff. There's podcasts. Also not to listen. TV shows. Also not to watch. Articles. Don't read. And so you've made the decision. Now, you're a lawyer yourself too, right? I am. And you made the decision, I'm not going to look at any of this stuff. Correct. I don't want to know what happened to the father of my two children. Not I don't want to know what happened. How can you say you love those boys if you don't care who killed the father that they loved? Of course I care who killed the father that they loved. Then why won't you look at the stuff? I've been advised not to. Are you afraid that when you look at it, you're going to realize that your brother did this? I am not afraid of that. Now, of course, you, you, you've, and we won't get into privileged communications, but you've spoken to your lawyer about the case. How are we not getting into privileged communications? Yes, I've spoken to my lawyer about the case. You're very intelligent. You have one of the top defense attorneys in the country, former federal prosecutor, John Lohr, right there in the blue suit, right? He is my attorney. You're telling me with all of this at your disposal, your intelligence, his experience, and all this information, that you don't care to find out who it is that killed Professor Markell? This is not that I don't care to find out. My job is to take care of those boys, and that is what I do. I don't see how it helps take care of them to go reading and watching and soaking up all of the horrible information that's out there. You don't realize that you could be helpful in finally untangling this to give this jury the truth about what happened to Professor Markell? I have been nothing but helpful since this started. To what happened to their son? By you looking at it, you are at the center of all of this, but you won't look at anything to help in the process. I've done nothing but help in this process. You came here and testified. I came here and testified. I spoke you to the police been... for six hours without anyone present. I signed over my cell phone, my car, my house, everything, my computer. What else do I have or know that you haven't seen? You came here because you were subpoenaed and had no choice. Correct. Right? This is not fun. You've I would been, not do this by choice. You've been inconvenienced. I've not been inconvenienced. Professor Markell was shot in the head. I'm not complaining about being here. This is my duty. I'm here. We'll get back to you 
complaining about being here. Do you honestly expect this jury to believe that you haven't confronted your brother about all of this? Yes, I do. Yes, you did confront him? Yes, I do expect them to believe that I did not confront my brother because I didn't. Well, maybe you don't need to because you know the truth in this case. You already know it. That he went behind your back, right? Did not happen. Just like he has done with past boyfriends. He's done that in the past where he's gone behind your back when you were having problems in a relationship and dealt with it himself. No. Ms. Adelson, you understand that until you expose your brother what he did, that everybody's going to consider you as guilty. You understand that, right? What is the question that you're asking me? You understand that until you expose your brother and explain what he did, that he went behind everybody's back, that he hired a hitman to murder your ex-husband, you'll remain guilty in the eyes of the world. I can't speak to the eyes of the world. I can only know that I have done nothing wrong. Or maybe you are guilty. I am not guilty. So a witness in this case, and I'm not going to get into their testimony, but one of the hitmen, the convicted hitman, implicates you. On July 17, 2014, the day before the murder, the morning before, he says that you were walking on Trescott with the two boys, that you walked down the driveway and into the house. That never happened. Right, because Dan, uh, Professor Markell, I apologize, Professor Markell, he had the kids. Based on the way that your guy's schedule was, on that day, he would have had the children in the morning, and you're going through such a bad divorce, you wouldn't be at his house, right? I wouldn't be at his house anyway, but not because we, weren't, we were going through a bad divorce. At that time, things were pretty copacetic. All right, so we're coming back to maybe you do know, or maybe you were involved. Excuse me? What's I, the I, question that you're asking me? I'm giving you a header of what we're talking about so that it will ease you in the question, okay? I'm just telling you what the topic that we're on, so we'll get to a question. Now, the government asked you about a time that you met Ms. McVanel. It was actually spring break of March 2014, right? I believe so. You went down to Miami. You stayed with your brother, Charles. I went down to Fort Lauderdale after being in Immokalee and well, stayed with my brother. You then went to Miami, Miami Beach to Yardbird and had dinner outside with your boyfriend at the time or who you were dating, Jeffrey Lacasse. Catherine McVanel was there and your brother Charles Adelson, and you all laid outside, right? We did. And that's on Miami Beach, not in Fort Lauderdale. Correct. Now, just for context, Jeffrey Lacasse, he was also an FSU professor, not at the law school, but an FSU professor. Nice guy, right? <laughs> I don't think so now. <laughs> now, you deny, I'm assuming, that on July... 13, 2014, you told Jeffrey Lacoste that Charles looked into hiring a hitman. You deny that or you admit that? I deny that. And <clears throat> that you told him that Charles looked into hiring a hitman back in September of 2013. That never happened. Which would have been months before your brother even met Catherine McBannell. I don't remember when they met. Letting you know the topic we're on, we're talking about you being involved. That same week, earlier in the week, you sent an email. We're talking about the week of the murder now, not spring break, the week of the murder, not yard bird, the week of the murder. You sent an email to Jeffrey Lacoste saying that you wanted to break up, that you needed space, right? I did. Sent him a long email, stay away, we're broken up, right? I did. You knew that on July 18, 2014, Jeffrey Lacoste was leaving town to go on a trip, right? I knew he was leaving at some point that week. I don't remember when. You knew that he was leaving on the same day of the murder at the same exact time as the murder. I don't think I did. 11 a.m. on July 18, 2014. I don't think I knew when he was leaving town. It's a good way to put the blame onto somebody else. You'd agree on that, right? I, if, if it happened, it would have been a good way to put the blame on somebody else. I have no idea when he was going to leave town. Your interview, July 18, 2014, you, you, you said, you know, my brother, he, he joked about hiring a hitman. 
Perhaps that was you just planting a seed to divert the attention of law enforcement away from you. It was not. Let's jump off topic right now and talk about your boys' names. That in the time after the murder, you changed their last names from Markel, Markel to Adelson, right? A year later, yes. Why? I was scared. Of what? Of someone coming to attack them. So it's a year later, you won't look at anything because you don't want to know what's going on in the case. And the thought is, well, they're going to be protected if they have my last name and not Markel, right? Yes. Now, years later, arrests are made. It's clear who committed the murder, Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera. The Adelson name has been dragged through the mud. Why haven't you continued to protect your boys and changed the name back? I will be changing. The, I'm not going to change the name back. I don't think that will help. One day I'll change all of our names. The government asked you about immunity, so let's get into that. You, you, you explained that as an attorney, you understand that when the government gives a subpoena for somebody to testify, that it conveys immunity, right? That's my understanding. My knowledge of criminal law dates back to 2003 when I took a semester in law school, so forgive me. Graduated law school, right? This isn't my area of law. When you, when you clerked on the 11th Circuit, it was with Judge Jordan, right? I did immigration appeals. Yeah, but you still dealt with criminal stuff as well, too. Very little. So your understanding, though, is it doesn't mean they can't arrest you. They just can't use what you say here against you later on. So you're protected. Correct. And you needed that to testify, right? It's just given to testify. It's not a question of whether I needed it. It comes with testifying. You fear being charged by them, so you need to have that protection of I your I don't words. fear being charged for a crime I didn't commit, no. Now, y'all had this nice exchange where it was pleasant, but there's actually tension between you and this office, right? No. They recently had your brother, Charles Adelson, arrested, and he's in custody, right? Correct. For first-degree murder? Correct. And there's no tension? It's very uncomfortable to be here. It's hard to tell where the tension is coming from. They've discussed your involvement in this case. They insinuated on the direct examination. There's no tension? Lots of media insinuates that I did something I didn't do, too. I can't feel tension towards every person in the world. That's funny. I thought you didn't look at anything. I don't. That's why. But you know that. that the, the, you know about the media, but you don't know about the media? I know about the media because it keeps me from from employment. It keeps me from lots of things in my life. I'm aware of what's there, but I don't I don't read the minutia so I can sleep at night. Ms. Adelson, five minutes ago you said you don't look at any of that stuff. Now I, I ask you a question. It. Let me finish. Sure. Five minutes ago you say you don't look at any of that stuff. Now I ask you a question, you say you look at stuff. That's not actually what I said. I said I'm aware that it exists, but I don't read it. I don't listen to it. Then I, how do you know that they're bashing you? You just told me they are. I did? Yeah. How about this? We'll come back to it. You can think up a better answer, okay? I'm not thinking up an answer. I'm telling you the truth. I'm sorry if you don't want to listen to it. Your basic understanding of criminal law, though, you know that if the defense gives you a subpoena, you get no immunity. Correction, Correct. improper question. I'm not going beyond that question. All right. That's the only question you can ask on that. If I give you a subpoena, you don't get immunity, right? Correct. Now, let's talk about your parents. The government asked you about your, your mother and father. Donna and Harvey, right? The government could do the same and subpoena them so that this jury can watch them get questioned, not nicely how Ms. Kaplan questioned you, but to be cross-examined by me. Objection. Improper question. Uh, I'm going to sustain that. Ask a different question. Are your parents here in Tallahassee right now? No. Are they back in Miami? Yes. Do they have any plans of coming here this week or next? I don't think so. Now, your family dynamic. It is your mother and father, Harvey and Donna. There's you, you're the youngest, Charles, and then the oldest, Robert. Right? Correct. And he's a doctor up in New York. Correct. Now, the government asked you about the relationship, <coughs> and you're like, we don't talk much. It's actually much deeper than that with Robert, isn't it? We don't talk. At all. At all. And the reason is, is because your parents were so difficult about the woman that is now his wife. That is not the reason why we don't talk. I'm not talking about the reason why you don't talk. Let me clarify it. The reason why your parents don't talk to him. That's not the reason why they don't talk to him. Are you saying to this jury that there wasn't a problem where they 
outright objected to his marriage of a woman that was not of the Jewish faith? That was initially what happened, and then there was actually a beautiful reconciliation, and they're very happy about the marriage. Robert and his wife, not your family. Robert and his wife and our family were very happy about Robert's marriage. So what happens is, is that Robert is in love with a woman. Your parents object. He breaks up with her and then dates a Jewish woman, right? And then they got married and divorced, and then he got back together with the person he wanted to be married to. Yes. With his true love. Yes. But there was a lot of tension in your family because of your family's involvement in the kids' marriages, right? Yes. Let's talk briefly about your, your children. The government had asked you in the, the topic of the Jewish faith, keeping kosher. Uh, you mentioned a bat mitzvah at one point in time. You're currently planning a bat mitzvah for your oldest, right? No, nope, it already happened. Okay, now that is a very, now, I'm Christopher, I'm obviously not Jewish, but my understanding is, is that it is a very, very important thing in the Jewish faith. It's a very important milestone. And for those that are very conservative in the Jewish faith, those that keep kosher, so to speak, it's even bigger. I don't know that it's more important to one segment of Judaism over another, but it's, it's an important coming of age ceremony. It's where a boy becomes a man. Did you invite Dan Markov's parents, the kid's grandparents? I did. You invited them? I invited them, yes. When was the last time they saw face to face their grandchildren? April 20th. Of this year? Just now. And you agree with me that it had been years since 2016, since the last time they had seen them? The visit stopped when they threatened to put my children in foster care, yes. But up until that point, they did have visits. But you got no problem letting them see your brother Charles, right? I'm sorry? You have no problem letting them hang out with your, your brother Charles, who's now sitting in custody for first degree murder. Well, they can't see him now, can they? No, they can't, but I'll ask the questions. For years, they weren't able to see their grandchildren despite their pleading to you to see them, but you let them, let me finish, but you let them hang out with your murdering brother, right? The children were permitted to see their grandparents. I cooked for them. We had play dates. They had sleepovers. When a letter surfaced that they were trying to have my children placed in foster care, the visits stopped. My brother never threatened to put my children in foster care, and if he had, the visits would have stopped with him, too. You say you love your boys. I do say I love my children. Don't care about the father that they love. What I happened? never said that I don't care about the father that then they love. Then look at some of the discovery and help figure it out. Excuse me? Then look at some of the evidence and help figure it out so that more lives aren't ruined by this. I, I seem to Mr. not Dicoz, understand. You need to ask a question now. You're making statements now. You need to ask a question. Understood, Your Honor. If I could have one brief second to check with co-counsel. Say it all soon. We started this by saying that this this is all about you. It, it started with you because of this marriage, right? No. Well, you had tried to say that, but I don't agree. Miss Adelson, I, I, I'm going to make one final attempt through questions to implore you. You understand that you can't protect your brother Charles, who's going through this case, and protect yourself at the same time. You understand that, right? I'm here to share the truth with you. I don't know how to answer the question. Then please end the madness and share the truth. Will you please share the truth with this jury? I've been sharing the truth since I walked in here. I've done nothing but share the truth. You know what happened here, despite your claims to the jury that you haven't looked at anything, you haven't discussed with anybody, and you haven't confronted your brother. You know what happened here, right? I do not know what happened here. And if I did, I would have shared it with the police eight years ago. You know that your brother you know that your brother went behind your back, don't you? I do not. Like he always does. This is something that he has always done, it isn't is it? It is not. <laughs> you found out after. 
that your brother had done this and gone behind your back. That's why you were thrown up at that dinner, right? No, it's not. You know that it didn't involve Katie either, right? I don't know anything about... If you're, if you're not going to say all of that and finally give the truth, why don't you just admit to this jury that you're guilty? Because I'm not guilty. One brief moment, Your Honor. I got nothing for you. Redirect. You were asked about the reason why you stopped contact for a period of time between your ex-husband's parents and your children. Yes. And you referenced a letter that in, you characterized as the grandparents threatening to put the children into foster care. Is that a, an email that was sent from those, the Markels, to my office? Yes. Okay. And that was in reference to, in the event that you and the people that care for these children, who at the time were very young, were arrested, that the grandparents wanted to make sure, because they live in Canada, right? They do. They wanted to make sure that a specific organization could be contacted to care for the children so that someone was there to care for them until a relative could get there. I don't right? remember the bit about a relative getting there. Okay, well, they weren't just going to leave them in foster care, right? I don't know. <laughs> okay. But the, the specific nature of the email, you will agree, was in the event that there's some kind of mass arrest, because they don't know who's getting ready to go to jail next, right? I mean, they're not privy to the investigation any more than you are, right? Law enforcement investigations, they're secret. Sure. Okay. And their concern, would you agree the concern ultimately in the email was for the care of the children? The concern was to make sure the children were under good care, but as their mother, I know they're always under good care with me. Right, but and there's no the need for foster contemplated care. contemplated you not being available to care for them. That's not possible. Because it's not possible for you to get arrested. Correct, because I've done nothing wrong, and I believe in our justice system. OK. Well, I just wanted to clarify the nature of that. In this case, you were asked about, you know, why aren't your parents coming to testify? You, as you mentioned, gave a police interview in this case, right? Correct. And consented to the search of your phone, et cetera. You gave testimony in this case, right? Yes. All right. And your parents did not, correct? They did not give testimony. They have not testified. They They've have not, not given a to police. come testify, but they would if they were asked. Mm, okay. And have they given any police interviews? They would have, but the police never contacted them. The police did contact them, didn't they? And they refused. No. Are they represented by counsel? They are represented by counsel. Okay. And they're, they'll come testify if we want them to. If they are under state subpoena, just like I was, okay. they would come testify. All right. And do you know what they would testify to? They would testify to whatever they know. And, and do you know what they know? I have no idea what they know. Okay. They've never told you. No. You've never asked them? No. Because you never had any conversations with them about this murder? I've been advised by my counsel not to. All right. So nobody, including your brother Charlie, has admitted or denied to you any involvement in the murder one way or the other? Correct. Same with your parents? Correct. All right. One moment, please, Your Honor. Okay. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. You want her subject to recall? Uh, no, sir. She's free to go about her business. All right. She's free to go. Thank you. All right. Um, let's put uh, Ms. Rodriguez back on the stand and complete her cross-examination at this point. Mr. DeCosta, are you prepared for that? Actually, Your Honor, we're going to waive cross on... Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, counsel and I had some conversations. We figured out another way. Okay. Thank All right. You. So we've completed the testimony then of Ms. Rodriguez. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Has Ms. Rodriguez been informed of that? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Okay. State may call its next witness. The state calls Officer Bill Brannon. Bill Brannon, please. <laughs> Thank you. 
Officer, if you come up here to stand before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in, please. Yes, sir. Okay, clerk's over here. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Great, thank you. Please have a seat. Permission to reposition the podium, Your Honor? Sure. Please introduce yourself and spell your name. Officer Brannon, B-R-A-N-N-O-N, ID number 510 with the Tallahassee Police Department. How long have you been with TPD? Uh, I've been with TPD for about 23 years now, and I was with FSU PD for a couple years prior to that. All right. I want to ask you about July 18th of 2014. Were you working that day? Yes, ma'am. What were your duties back then? Patrol. All right. And were you assigned to a crime scene that day? <coughs> yes, ma'am. What were you assigned to do? Uh, well, I responded to Trescott Drive. And it was, uh, I think it originally went out as a medical issue. And I arrived on scene and we discovered it was a shooting incident. All right. And what was your role there at the scene? Uh, initially, sorry, I'm trying to gain my thoughts. Let me let me ask you a better question. Were you part was part of your duty there to hold the crime scene? Yes. All right. What does it mean hold the crime scene? Ensuring that nobody comes in or out. It's not supposed to be there or anything like that. And at what point were you positioned? Uh, once I got done on scene and I was put on the perimeter, I was on the north end. All right. And is that on Prescott? Yes, ma'am. How far away from the residence of Dan Markell was the crime scene tape? Was there crime scene tape up over the street? Yes, ma'am. All right. And how far away from the residence was that tape located? Approximately three or four houses. And is that where you were positioned? Yes, ma'am. All right. And did during the time that you were there holding the perimeter, is that when law enforcement was continuing to work at the scene? Yes. All right. So there were several law enforcement vehicles present? Yes. Do you know how many? Guesstimating maybe about four or five marked patrol cars. Uh, one of the crime scene vans, I'm pretty sure, was there that's also marked police. Uh, another, I'm guessing, three or so unmarked units for the investigators. And would those vehicles have been in the driveway of the resident, the Markell residence, or something else? Uh, well, all around, right there in front of his residence. Okay, including in the driveway? There may have been, I can't remember for sure. All right, and these were marked vehicles? Yes. Okay. And during the time that you were holding the crime scene perimeter, what time of day was this? Uh, it was around noon. All right, did cars pull up and have to turn around because they couldn't pass through the crime scene? Yes. And was it your job to make sure that no cars passed through the crime scene? Yes, ma'am. All right, and as part of your job, would you have contact with the people that would come up and just let them know that you basically don't tell them anything about what's going on, but tell them they got to turn around and go the other way. I don't remember having to speak with anybody specifically. Okay. But you were just making yeah. sure they didn't come through. Yeah, I was parked there next to the crime scene tape with my lights on and my vehicle blocking the road. So when cars approached the roadblock, they just on their own turned around and went back the way they had come? Yes. All right. And did one of those cars in particular stand out to you? Yes, ma'am. And what vehicle was that? It was a later 2000s model um, Honda Odyssey van. Why did that friend. vehicle stand out to you? I had obtained information that the ex-wife drove a vehicle like that. All right. Were you able to see the occupant of the vehicle clearly? No. Were you able to tell how many occupants there were in the vehicle? No. All right. Were you able to tell whether it was a man or a woman? I thought it was possibly a woman because I thought I remember seeing longer hair, but I couldn't say conclusively. All right. Did you have any, you didn't have any contact with the driver? No, ma'am. What did the driver of this Honda Odyssey do when the driver approached the roadblock? Just immediately did a three-point turn and left. 
All right. And as you approach the roadblock, if you're one of these drivers, the way they would come up to the roadblock, would you be able to see that the law enforcement activity was occurring at the Markell residence? Yes. The, and the person driving the, I'm going to show you States Exhibit 18. Recognize this? It looks looks like the vehicle. This is similar or consistent with the vehicle you consistent saw. Consistent with it. Was this time on the Aspen Harbor Police 18? 18 it is. All right. You may. The driver of this vehicle or the vehicle consistent with this, did they ask you any questions about what was going on at the Markell residence? No. And was there anything unusual about the way this particular vehicle turned around? Just seemed a little more uh, quicker than the other ones. Most of the vehicles, when they pull up, you'd see them kind of pausing for a second. And I don't know if they were like formulating a new plan because suddenly they can't go the way they want to go. Um, it usually just seemed to see, be a hesitation. This one caught my attention a little bit more also because when it pulled up, I mean, it just automatically did a three-point turn and headed on. No further questions. Cross-examination? No, thank you, Your Honor. Okay. We can excuse the officer? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, officer. You're free to go. Thank you, sir. State may call its next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Jeffrey Lacoste. Jeffrey Lacoste, please. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in. Please raise your right hand, respond to the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please have a seat. Sir, please say your name and spell your name. My name is Jeffrey Lacasse, J E F F R E Y L A C A S S E. How are you employed, sir? I'm a, a Currently an associate professor at Florida State University. How long have you been so employed? Since 2013. All right, and I want to draw your attention back to 2014. Did you have a relationship with Wendy Adelson? I did. What type of relationship was that? She was my girlfriend for about four months. When did that relationship begin? We dated in the fall of 2013, but casually she became, we became a serious couple, I would say, around late February of 2014. And when did the relationship end? Well, that's a little tricky, but in July of 2014. All right. And during the time that you were together with <coughs> Ms. Adelson, did you become aware of her recent divorce? I did. Um, on our first couple of dates, that was a topic of conversation. That's in the fall of 2013. All right. And did you get an impression as to what type of divorce that was or how it would be characterized? An extremely contentious divorce. All right, and during the time that you dated her, were you aware of any specific ongoing litigation with her ex-husband? I was, particularly in February of 2014, um, because uh, Ms. Adelson would react uh, badly as that litigation proceeded, yes ma'am. All right, and what specific litigation was the, was the topic of discussion in your relationship with her? Can you, can you restate that, please? What, was there a specific litigation that was the topic of discussion? I recall a motion filed in February of 2014 where Danny had made some accusations that seemed serious and Ms. Adelson reacted poorly. As a matter of fact, every time he filed something, she tended to react poorly. Specifically, did you have knowledge through your relationship with Mrs. Uh, Adelson about her, about a motion that had been filed by her ex-husband that was requesting that her mother not have 
contact with the children unless it was supervised. Yes, I do recall that. All right, and was that one of the items that she was really upset over? Yes, there were many, but that was one for sure. Okay, so fair to say she took that litigation or that filing very seriously? Yeah, she took every filing and every point and every motion very seriously was my impression. What about her mother, Donna Adelson? Do you have any personal knowledge as to how Donna Adelson took that particular filing about her having contact with the kids? No, I do not. Did you know Dan Markell? I didn't know Dan Markell. I met Dan Markell on a handful of occasions for a few minutes on each occasion. Any issues between the two of you? Um, no. I mean, he was my new girlfriend's ex-husband, so I was listening to Wendy Adelson uh, describe him in terrible terms regularly. But in terms of us having an actual conflict, no, ma'am. Never. No. No negative words ever spoken between the oh, two no, of you? Oh, no, always very polite and cordial to one another when we interacted. Were you specifically aware of the litigation concerning Wendy Adelson's desire to relocate to South Florida with her children? Yes, that was a big topic of conversation on our first couple of dates because it, it, it had just been denied a few months previous. Okay, why, if you know, did Wendy Adelson want to relocate to South Florida? She despised living in Tallahassee and wanted to live in Miami. And what was in Miami? Well, her parents, um, well, there's multiple reasons. Right. Chief among those reasons would be the fact that her parents and brother were down there. Um, How would you characterize her relationship with her parents and brother? Extremely close. Did Wendy Adelson ever make a joke in your presence about her TV? Yes, ma'am, she did. Um, in October of 2013, the first time I had went to her house on Aqua Ridge, and we were going to watch a movie, uh, she made a joke, which she characterized as her brother's joke, but she was the one telling it that, uh, you know, her brother had looked into hiring a hitman, but a TV was cheaper. And I heard her repeat that joke at a later occasion. All right. So you heard that joke a couple times? At least twice, yes, ma'am. All right. Did, during your time in your relationship with Wendy Adelson, did you ever have any occasion to meet her family members? Yes. What family members did you meet? Donna Adelson came in, I believe, October, November of 2013, and we had dinner. I spoke to her very briefly. All right. Is that the only family member? No, no. I also met Donna and Harvey would travel up here, and um, I would have very limited small talk with them uh, because they took care of the kids where we, when we would go on a date. But I didn't have a lot lot more interaction than that because there was sort of a secretive thing when we, they seemed secretive in nature when we would return from one of those dates, Wendy Adelson would never invite me inside the house. And when we were all in a group setting, say at the circus or downtown get down, um, Wendy and I would talk, the parents would be over here and they just never said much to me. All right, so they didn't have too much interest in you it seemed. N no, they were polite but cold. All right, and what about in Miami, did you ever take any trips to Miami? I did take one trip to Miami with uh, Wendy in March of 2014. And what family members did you spend time with on that trip? We uh, met with her brother, Charles Adelson, and we stayed at his house for one evening. All right, and was that the same evening that you came to meet Catherine Magdanoa? Yes, we had dinner with Catherine and Catherine Magdanoa and Charlie Adelson prior to going to his house, yes. All right, and this is in March of 2014? Yes, it was during spring break. Uh, Wendy Adelson and I had went for alternative spring break, and it was Wednesday or Thursday of that week. Um, we traveled to Miami to meet Charles. Charles Adelson was the point. All right, and how was Ms. Magbanwa introduced to you? I don't recall exactly the word. It was clearly a dating relationship and a fairly new one. I couldn't tell you whether he said girlfriend or not, but it was a new romantic interest. Of Charlie Adelson. Of Charles Adelson, yes. All right, so the four of you have dinner in Miami, is that correct? That's correct. And do you know Beach. the date of that dinner? It's okay if you don't. Definitely March of 14? Yes, between like March 10th and 14th of, um, of 14. All right, and so you had dinner with the it was that the only time you ever had any contact with Catherine Magbanoa? Yes. All right, so you may not be able to identify her, but if you can, is she present in the courtroom? Oh, today? I can identify her. Catherine okay, Magbanoa is, 
please point her out and describe yeah. what she's C wearing. Catherine McManew is sit sitting in a dark suit between her attorneys, who I recognize as Christopher DeCoast and Tara Kawats. All right, thank you. Let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. Uh, when you and Wendy Adelson had dinner with Charlie Adelson and Kathleen McVanwa, did you get the impression that this was the first time that Wendy had ever met McVanwa? I got that rough impression um, because there was, I don't recall a great deal about that meeting, but I do remember some getting to know you talk that would have been abnormal if they had a long standing relationship. So they were talking about their life situations and such right. in an introductory way, yes ma'am. Okay. And did Wendy at any time express to you any particular enthusiasm about this woman as opposed to any of her boyfriend, uh, brother's other girlfriends? Yeah, prior to the meeting, she seemed um, very excited about the fact that her brother was dating Catherine. All right. And was that surprising? Yes, a little bit. After dinner, it seemed a little surprising. It wasn't quite what I... Once we had dinner, it wasn't quite what I had expected, given Wendy's descriptions. All right. And had you been through this with Wendy before, your relationship was relatively new as well. Had, do you have personal knowledge about the way Wendy typically reacted to Charlie's girlfriends? I don't recall exactly that. I don't. Okay. Did anything unusual happen at the dinner? Well, there's two things that stuck out to me. Uh, the first one that was that Wendy Adelson had kind of a complex about being a single mom because Charlie had told her that you know, no man wants to date a single mom. So we had this conversation repeatedly. And then I show up to dinner and Charlie's dating a single mom. So that was a little surprising. Um, the other thing that, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Specifically did the fact that she, we talked about the fact that she's a single mom. Yeah. Did it come up any information about her child's father? Yes, exactly. So that was the second thing that was surprised, well, that, that sticks out to me, is during that getting to know you small talk, um, Ms. Magbanua had mentioned that the, the father of her children um, had had interactions John, with I'm the- I'm only going to object because this is a discovery violation. It's the first time I'm ever hearing of the statement of my client being made. What's your objection? The discovery violation and the Richardson hearing. I've never heard this statement of my client ever in the past six years of this case. Did you have the opportunity to take his deposition? Yes, and it wasn't mentioned. All right. Well, if it's not asked, then he can't mention it. So that's overruled. You can proceed. Mr. Lacoste, is this the first time you've ever mentioned this statement? It is not. Okay. When have you mentioned it before? Um, I talked to Investigator Isom in between March and May of 2015 because he had called um, inquiring about Ms. Magbanua about a year and a half before she was arrested. Okay, and you've previously given some testimony in this matter as well? Please, again, please. Have you previously given testimony in this matter, the same case? Yes. All yes. right. Yes. And what statement, if any, did Ms. Magbanua make about her child's father? Yeah. So <clears throat> I cannot recall every exact word. I remember references to fighting, the word police, and that he definitely had a criminal record which didn't sound like speeding tickets. It, it sounded serious. Okay. And you never had the opportunity to meet her child's father, did you? No, I never met him. Okay. Did Charlie participate at all in that conversation? We were all there. We were all engaged. Um, but he didn't specifically say anything relevant. Like, I don't recall hey, anything. I know that guy. No, no. For I example. Did, did not say anything quite like that that I recall. This is okay. um, a dinner at, you know, almost nine years ago now. Yeah. I know. Do you recall who paid for dinner? Charlie did. And do you recall how he paid for dinner? I do not. All right. Do you know whether Charlie carried large amounts of cash? I do not know if he carried large amounts of cash. Wendy mentioned the fact that he certainly stored large amounts of cash in shoeboxes in his home. All right. And did you know or do you know whether or not Charlie Adelson runs a cash business? That was what I was told by Wendy Adelson. All right, so what happens after dinner? After dinner, um, we, we go to yogurt, had a, had a quick dessert, and then Miss Magbanua uh, departed, and Wendy Adelson drove me to Charlie Adelson's house, at which point I, I do recall observing that she was unusually jittery and being strange. I didn't know what to make of it at the time. And we're talking about 
when the Adelson is driving. Yeah, when the Adelson okay. driving me to Charlie's home. All right, so when you go back to Charlie's house, it's, is it just you and Wendy and Charlie there? Yes, as well as Charlie's then roommate, Jerome Obed, was there as well. All right, and that's the dermatologist? Yes. Okay. And so during the time that y'all were hanging out at the house after dinner, did the topic of Dan Markell come up? It did. In what regard? Well, you didn't go anywhere with Wendy without hearing about Dan Markell, so it wasn't atypical, but there was talk uh, about the divorce, the post-divorce litigation. There was negative talk about Danny. I recall Charlie getting a little heated up in the hot tub um, about Danny. Um, so y'all were in the hot tub? We were in the hot tub. And Charlie was expressing some negative words against Dan Markell? Yes, strong negative words. Um, and I also had a constant stream of comments from Wendy about what Charlie thought that Charlie hated Danny, you know, Travis. Okay. I want to talk about the incident that occurred at the coffee shop on June 4th of 2014. Does that sound familiar to you? Yes, ma'am. What happened at the coffee shop? Was that here in Tallahassee? That was at uh, Red Eye Coffee. I had met Wendy for, uh, for a cup of coffee. I had a appointment in the same building later, so we just met up. <clears throat> and a couple of things happened on that day, but at the coffee shop, Wendy canceled a trip that we had planned um, for her to come meet my parents in California, which was scheduled for July 11th to 17th. And she said she canceled that trip because she was concerned we wouldn't get back on the eight in time to pick up the kids on the 18th, which didn't make a whole lot of sense. But I just, we then discussed you know, rescheduling the trip. It wasn't anything I objected to strongly or anything like that, but it was weird. The plan originally was for you to return to Tallahassee on the 17th? Yes. And then for her to take custody of her kids from Dan Markell on the 18th? Yes. And okay. It, and she canceled the trip because why? Because our flight might get delayed in the middle of summer and we would get stranded and not be able to be there to pick up the kids. And she had to pick up the kids on the 18th. Did you see her later that night? Yes, I went to her house and hung out with her and her children that night. All right, and was there anything unusual about her behavior on the night of June 4th, 2014? Definitely, she was a nervous wreck. Um, and I actually traveled to the store to buy her, I believe some Pepto-Bismol because she was having, she was such a nervous wreck, she was having stomach problems. So she wasn't food poisoned, she didn't have the flu, she wasn't sick, she was just so, nervous that she was having stomach problems. All right. Tell us about the way the, I guess, the beginning of the end of your relationship. Can you give me a date? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my understanding is there was a big fight on June 29th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we traveled to Gainesville together. For, I had a work trip in Gainesville, and Ms. Adelson accompanied me. Um, and the relationship had been a little bit of, not a little bit, it had been a huge roller coaster of up and down and love bombing and I perceived a lot of manipulation and lying. Um, and on, I guess it was the night June 28th, that Saturday, um, we had a relationship conflict. We had a, I don't know if argument's quite the right word, but I was kind of tired of being strung along and uh, it was just what it felt like. I couldn't figure out why I was being strung along, but that's what it felt like. And we sort of had it out. All right, so when was the next time you saw her after the big fight? Well, the next day we drove from Gainesville up to Tallahassee. Um, so I saw her then and I dropped mm -hmm. her off at her house. It was a very awkward, um, you know, multiple hour trip from Gainesville to Tallahassee. All right, and did that feel like the end of the relationship at that time? It wasn't great, but no, it didn't feel like the end. No, in fact, she said otherwise. I mean, I, I actually distinctly remember departing her house and her saying that this was not the end. But as I said, I felt like I was being strung along where it was a constant roller coaster in a way that seemed purposeful and manipulative. All right, so that takes us to June 30th of 2014 when you part ways after this sort of bad trip to Gainesville. Yes, I dropped her off at her house on our core ridge and yeah, right. When do you see her next after that? I see her next July 13th after she had spent two weeks in South Florida. We did have communications in that time period, but I didn't see her. And was she, in, do you know the dates that she was in South Florida? She told me, um, 
that the day after I dropped her off, which I guess is June 30th, that she had headed to South Florida and that she had returned July 30th. I don't know if that's true. That's just what she told me. July 30th? No, excuse me. June 30th to July, to July, June 30th to July 13th. Supposedly I was seeing her on, upon her return to Tallahassee. Okay. I so just don't know if that's true. I don't know what day she actually okay. got. Okay. She represented, she'd been in South Florida. So you see her, uh, so it's been a couple of weeks since the big fight. Yes. And where did you see her? I, well, I, we, we, uh, I talked on the phone in the interim and long story short, decided to you know, keep going to not break up, to continue to pursue the relationship. So we had a date. Uh, I picked her up at her house and we went to the movies and dinner. All right. And did you return back to her residence after your date? I did. We did. Did anything, was there anything unusual about her behavior that evening? Well, she made a very strange statement to me at the house. Tell us about that, please. Yeah. So we're walking into that, we're walking into the house and we're having chit chat and she says, can I tell something to you confidentially? And I said, sure. And she said, she tells me that uh, last summer when the relocation got denied, Charlie investigated multiple ways to fix this problem of Danny Markel, um, including hiring a hitman, and that it was gonna cost about $15,000. And I later, I'm unsure if that number is 15,000 or 50,000, because they sound similar, but she told me that the previous summer, Danny had, or that Charlie had looked into having Danny killed by a hitman. All right, so that would have been the summer of 2013. Yes. Okay, and when she told you this statement, you previously characterized the TV statement as a, a joke. Mm -hmm. Was this statement also in the characterization of a joke? No, these are two discrete, completely different things. She had a joke she would make um, about a TV being cheaper than a hitman. I knew that joke. This was a separate statement. This was chilling. This wasn't funny. This made my stomach flip. I found it disturbing at the time. It's completely different. And the statement was made five days before the murder of Dan Markell. That's correct. By a hitman. That's right. All right, I want to talk about the next day, which is going to be July 14th, 2014, the Monday before the murder. Did you see Wendy Adelson that day? I did. Um, I had left the previous night by saying I had some hope for the relationship. I said, you know, if this won't work, if this won't work out, just send me a text, and I won't, I won't be offended by that, and we'll just move on. But she contacted me the next day and said, I really want to spend time with you. So then she canceled plans in the middle of the day. And then we went to yoga. You went so to a yoga class together? We attended a yoga class together, the most awkward yoga session in history. OK. <laughs> what happens after the awkward yoga session? Well, during the yoga session, just as a 43-year-old man that's been in a few relationships, I'm thinking, OK, this looks like this is over. I just the vibe I, I was getting. Um, we walked to the car and exchanged words and she didn't want to spend time with me Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And she had the whole week off without the kids. And then there was a couple other words exchanged, but it was clear to me it was, um, I thought it was over at that point. So I turned and started walking away. Okay. And did she call you back? Yeah. She called after me. I turned around and she said, she asked me, are you still going to Tennessee on Friday? Because she had previously known that I was leaving for a trip to Tennessee at 11 a.m. on Friday, July 18th. Mm. And she had a series of questions about whether I was going. If I didn't go, why wouldn't I go? She, despite seemingly just breaking up with me and not wanting to see me for the next three days, had a deep interest in what I was going to be doing on Friday. All right, and your plan at that time was to leave Tallahassee by plane or car? By car at approximately 11 a.m., and Wendy Adelson and I had discussed that in some detail previously because of other plans that eventually got canceled, but she was, she was the only person aware, other than the people in Tennessee, that that's when I was leaving. And had you followed that plan, is it correct that you would have been departing Tallahassee and getting on I-10 at approximately the same time that the killers were. Yes, not only that, but I would have driven within a, probably a couple miles of Dan Markell's house. All right, and what type of vehicle would you have been in had you gone with that plan? At that time, I was driving a 2004 
four door metallic Nissan Sentra, metallic gray Nissan Sentra. All right, and would you, are you familiar with the suspect vehicle in this case? I am. And would you characterize your vehicle as similar in appearance to that vehicle? Yes, especially in profile, yes. And are you aware that in her law enforcement interview, Wendy Adelson suggested you as a potential suspect? I am aware of that. And did you cooperate with the police in this case? Yes, uh, when I came back from Tennessee, they called me. I came in immediately and cooperated with them from the very beginning. And were you able to provide an alibi that eliminated you as a suspect from committing this murder? Yeah, pretty solid one. They had me on videotape at a Kmart in Tennessee a couple hours after the murder using my credit card with my cell phone showing me there. So it was pretty, pretty good alibi. And is that because you did not follow the plan to leave at 11 a.m. on July 18th? That's right. I left the previous evening about between 6 and 8 p.m. I changed my plans. I didn't tell anybody except the people at the other end. I uh, certainly didn't tell Wendy Adelson we weren't speaking. And so I was already out of the state by the time of the murder. Do you have any knowledge about a celebration dinner that was had after the murder of Dan Markell? I do. I uh, eventually spoke to Wendy Adelson on the phone about 10 days after the murder. I had a couple of phone conversations with, with her. And in one of them, she described attending what Charlie Adelson described as a celebration dinner. And was that the dinner where she vomited at the table? Yeah, she said she hadn't eaten food in so long that as soon as the food hit her stomach, she started vomiting. All right. And were these couple phone calls after the homicide the last contact that you had with Wendy Adelson? Yes. All right. No further questions. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. I apologize, Ms. McCross, I'm going to have to read off my laptop for That's my fine. questions. Okay. How are you doing today? Good, how are you? It's been a while since we've seen each other. Been a while. Everything all right? Everything's good. All right, let me just... Okay, so, Mr. Lacoste, you are testifying today in this case under not only a state subpoena, but you received a defense subpoena as well, correct? I did. Okay. And... Uh, you're testifying more specifically to explain to this jury what you know about Wendy Adelson, right? Among other things, yes. Yeah. And you were dating <coughs> Wendy Adelson up until, you okay? Up until four days before her husband was murdered. Yes, well, that's a little tricky because Wendy Adelson had sent me an email after that yoga date saying, um, I need to think about things for another week, mm -hmm. so please don't contact me until the following week. So when the murder happened, I was in a state of limbo as far as the relationship, even though I had had a pretty bad feeling that you know, this was over, obviously. It's not good to get an email like that. But for some reason, she wanted us to be technically in limbo for another week was my perception. So it was kind of like, a, I guess, a soft breakup? Like it wasn't definitive, but hold on for a week until I get back to you kind of vibe? Well, it was more, that's correct, ma'am, but it was more than that. It, it was bizarre mm -hmm. um, because we just had two weeks apart to think about things and I could not figure out why she would want to drag it out for one more week at the time. And you'd characterize her behavior at this time as being strange, right? Yes. Okay. Now, you previously said that if there was someone aside from her parents that spent a lot of time with her leading up to the murder, it was you. In the spring of 2014, yes, to my, well, 
to my knowledge, yes. Okay, and you had previously told the detective that during the nine months you were dating, you were spending about 80 to 90% of your nights with Wendy, right? I don't recall saying 80 to 90% of my nights. Um, Wendy was frequently in South Florida, mm -hmm. so, and frequently traveling for business and things like that, so Wendy wasn't even in Tallahassee, seven, you know, 70, I don't know percentage of the time, but she was fr infrequently here, actually, so I spent a lot of time with her, but not so much in the fall, to be clear, and okay. much more in January through June. And would it be fair to say that any night that she didn't have the kids with her when she was free, she'd spend those nights with you? A lot of them, not all of them. Oh, okay. Um, and at that time, you didn't have any kids of your own? Correct, correct, correct. Okay. And you saw firsthand how hard it is to be a single mother, right? Yes. From Wendy. And Wendy is different because she has a lot of help. When her parents were in town, she had a lot of help. When she traveled to South Florida, she had a lot of help. When she was on her own, it was sometimes difficult. Yes, ma'am. And Danny, or uh, Professor Markel, he wasn't an absentee father, was he? No. Not at all, right? No. So she also had him actively helping her out as well, too, with the care of the boys. Well, he, she had a standing offer from Professor Markel um, to see the children more often and to be more actively involved than was strictly, you know, allowed by the, the court paperwork. Yeah, if that's what you mean. Did you ever get the feeling that Wendy would use her children as almost like tools to get on Mr. Markel's nerves or to, you know? upset him in any way? I hate to say this about a mother, but I saw her doing that in multiple domains, including as bait for me. I mean, I saw her doing that in multiple domains, yes. And yes. you got close to the boys too, right? I did. And whenever we had a fight or a problem, Wendy always invoked the children. That was her... Um, her go-to excuse? That was her way to continue stringing me along, it felt like, because I had grown very close to the children. Okay. And let's talk about her parents. Yes. No. They live in South Florida at the time, right? Correct. You ever made that drive before? I um, yeah, I made that drive a few times. It's about seven hours, right? Yes, it's, it's, it's a drive. It's a long, treacherous drive. Yes. Right. Yes. And I only say that because Florida is just a very, you know, not too much to see. It's just flat, going straight mm -hmm. for seven hours, right? Yes. Okay. And isn't it true that her parents, anytime they would want Wendy to come down with the boys, they would actually drive up. To Tallahassee, pick her up, and drive her back down. That's what she reported. I want to be cautious because I know her to be a person that doesn't always tell me the truth, but that's what I was told, yes. Well, you just brought me into a whole new line of questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, let's talk about her ability to tell the truth. Okay. You know her very well. You were dating her for a long time. Well, a few months, seriously, okay. but go ahead. How would you describe her? when it's, you know, trying to determine whether or not she's telling the truth. I found her to be a deeply deceitful person and not that great at it. That, that was my impression. Would she occasionally just put on a show, try to get people to feel sorry for her? Wendy adopted the victim role as her default social role, her way of getting attention, sympathy, et cetera, yes. Did she play the victim role to you about how awful Danny, Danny was to her? Yes. And did she constantly complain about that, what a terrible person he was to her? <laughs> Endlessly, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, and this is of course, all the only information you're getting from this is through Wendy Adelson's mouth, right? 95% of it, I mean, I also live in Tallahassee, we have a community, I heard some other things, but she had managed to persuade most of the rest of the community that what she was saying was true at the time. So, yeah. so would you say she did that frequently, like she'd speak openly about how upset she was with her divorce? Yes, it was the top of, of conversation. If we went to dinner with friends, that's what we were going to talk about. It, frankly, it got old. And she worked at the same place he did, right? Yes, they both worked at the College of Law. So she was disparaging him amongst his colleagues as well too, right? I can only, as far as what I witnessed, yeah, we went to dinner with some law professors where she, she did that sort and of thing. And she'd way. actively talk badly about her divorce in front of them? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, one thing that Wendy was very vocal to you about during their relationship was how much she hated Tallahassee, right? Yes. Okay. 
And that was almost a daily conversation, how much she hated living here. Yeah, Danny was part one, how bad Tallahassee was part two. That was the plot of every day, basically. And that's why you kind of say it started to get old because those are basically the things that you would talk about over and over and over again. Yes. Okay. And she blamed Dan Markell for being stuck in Tallahassee. There's no question about that. No, she did blame, well, she blamed Dan Markell for getting her stuck in Tallahassee, yes. Had you ever heard her say that if something happened to him, she'd be able to go home? Yeah, and that night that I related to Miss Kappelman, June, or excuse me, July 13th, mm -hmm. uh, part of that conversation was if anything ever happened to Danny, she would probably, you know, not probably, she, she would return to South Florida. Now, and that's actually what happened in this case, right? It's exactly what happened in this case a week later. Yeah. As soon as he was murdered, less than a week later, she was in South Florida. That's my understanding. All right. Now, you love living in Tallahassee, right? I love Tallahassee, yeah. All right, and you chose to move here from Phoenix. I did. Didn't she think you were crazy from leaving Phoenix, a bigger city, than coming here? I don't know if she said I was crazy, um, but it was, I, I'll put it this way, it was not possible to persuade her that Tallahassee had some <laughs> retaining <laughs> attributes, and, and also that this wasn't the rest of her life, that you know, at some point she would be able to leave when the children were older, that, you know, it was a very immature sort of take on it. And you tried sometimes to, you know, highlight the wonderful things about Tallahassee to her, but was that a fruitless effort? That was always unsuccessful. I mean, I did my best, but it was like talking to a wall. Um, I mean, she wrote a book where she shreds Tallahassee. I mean, she really doesn't like Tallahassee. Isn't it true that she thought that she was better than the people that lived in Tallahassee? Yeah. And did you ever catch her crying uncontrollably because she felt that she was stuck here? I, multiple crying episodes. Yes, she would cry sometimes because she was stuck here. She also used to cry, especially in the months preceding the murder, for no reason that I could discern. It was just crying? How did you ask her and she just wouldn't give you an answer? Yeah, that was Wendy's typical pattern to be very non-specific. Okay. Yeah. And then, so, I've already asked you these. Did Wendy explain to you that Danny was emotionally abusive to her? She used that term very frequently. And at the time, as the boyfriend, I sort of accepted that. You were taking what she said as true. Yes, it's a new relationship. But in retrospect, I can't think of a single thing she ever described that I would consider emotionally abusive. She did tell you once, though, that, well, she felt this was emotionally disturbing to her, that Danny would make her sit in silence if they were to drive down to South Florida. Um, she would drive, he would be in the passenger seat doing work, and that she would complain to you that that's something he would do, would make her sit in silence on the seven-hour drive. Yeah, she said he did that one time, and I don't know if that's true or not, but she did say that, um, yeah. And to be clear, this is just coming from Wendy Adelson. You have no evidence to support that what she's telling you is the truth. I don't. Okay. Now, um, did she describe him as a complete control, fee, uh, control freak? I'm sorry. That rings a bell. Okay. Yeah. And did she ever describe him as an absentee father to you? She, what she described was that during the marriage, he was not quite as involved with the children and arguably would meet that label. And then after the divorce, became very engaged with the children, which instead of seeing that as a positive, she saw as a rather annoying inconvenience that he wanted his share of the time with the kids. Now, men, Wendy was in her mid-30s when you two were dating back in 2014, right? That's right. Did you su uh, describe her as being self-sufficient? No, I think I described her in past police interviews as a highly dependent person um, who seemed to struggle with adult decision-making and would often seek advice on things that you might expect from a 15-year-old or an 18-year-old, but not a... a a woman in her mid-30s, so that's, that's right. Okay. And did your relationship Wendy, with Wendy, was it so tumultuous that you actually ended up having to see a therapist about 
your relationship with her? That's correct. Would you also describe her as having a public persona, being one way in public and another behind closed doors? Yes, superficially charming, but I, I had reported to the police that just a characteristic I found disturbing. We would have dinner with some people, the door closes, and people gossip, but it was like a 180 flip, and it would be vicious and very mean-spirited at a level that... Completely different from how she was a moment before. Yes, not a way I talk about people, yeah. Okay. Now, and you'd say she's good actress, putting up, she's good at putting up a facade for people. Now, she's also admitted to you that she has lied in a deposition before, right? Well, that's tricky because she may have lied about lying in a deposition. Okay. <laughs> but so she, t- <laughs> she told that to you, right? She did, but I, my understanding is she lied about that. So there's lies on top of lies. So it could of, be a lie about a lie. And maybe a lie about, yeah, it gets real confusing with, uh, but that's, it brings up an important point. She really enjoys mind games. And so I think that might have been a little bit of a, a mind game. Oh, okay, so she may have just been throwing that out for some other ulterior purpose. I don't know why she would disclose to me that she lied in a legal proceeding as an officer of the court and then turn out not to have lied in it. I mean, that's, but that's, I got a hundred stories like that. No, I mean, and, and know, I would right. ask you, it would be as an attorney. Yes. I mean, it would be a violation of her ethical duties as a lawyer to lie on the oath, right? Right, but then I go to the police in my first interview and I go, wow, I really got one for you. She told me she lied in a deposition and then my understanding is she didn't. So there's a plotting kind of thing going on here. All right. So have you previously described her as a pathological liar? Yes. Now let's talk about the one time that you came down to Miami and met Charles Adelson. Yes. Okay. So let's be clear. You met Charles Adelson once. Correct. You met Catherine McVanwall once. Yes. All right. And that was on that date that we talked about. Yes. All right. So let's talk about that. So, because that, that dinner that night ended up getting a little strange when you guys went back to Charlie's house, right? Yeah, that's fair. Now, describe for the jury, because they don't know anything about this restaurant. Describe Yardburg, because it's a, it's a restaurant that's on South Beach, correct? Yeah, it's on South Beach. We were outside on a patio. You probably know Yardbird better than I. I've only been there once. It's a very nice restaurant. Um, they have like, you know, uh, all type of American-based food. Yes. Yeah. And you said something important. You were sitting outside. We were sitting outside. Okay. You and Wendy got there before Charles, right? That sounds right, but I don't remember for okay. sure. Okay. And if the uh, I uh, if the, uh, if we had text messages between, for example, Charles and Wendy, that would indicate you guys were outside. Those would be reliable. Waiting for them to get there, right? I mean, that sounds right. Okay. And he meets up with you there, and then Catherine meets up, and that's when you guys get introduced. Right. You remain outside while you're having dinner, right? Correct. Okay. And would it be fair to say? I mean, I know what Yardbird looks like, but <coughs> members of the jury do not. So. The, the, where the patio is, it's right at a four corner intersection, if I'm saying that correctly. Mm-hmm. So there could be cars across the way, correct? Yes. Cars parked to the right, cars parked to the left. Yes. But you're all clearly visible sitting down outside, correct? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you're sitting there with Wendy. Yes. And Charles is sitting beside Catherine. Was he behaving as if, you know, that's his girlfriend and stuff like that? Well, and I'm only asking because, you know, if someone from the outside were just watching, would it appear that she was having a good time with her boyfriend? I mean, it's a hard question for me to answer because it's been so long. Yeah, it does. You'd have to know Charlie. I mean, I don't know how I mean, I'm the one time most of this dinner was Charlie informing us about the world. He's talking a lot. He's talking a lot. So I don't know how he acts with girlfriends or women he's dating. But um, go ahead. And that's kind of important because it's the first time you're meeting him, right? Right. Tell the jury how much he talks. Oh, you don't talk to Charlie Hillson. You listen to Charlie Hillson. I mean, uh, I never say anything quite like it. Right? He, right. he just he dominates the entire conversation. He dominated that conversation. And I don't remember what was said at that conversation, but there was interaction in that conversation. There was other people talking. I mean, I don't want that to be taken too far because Charlie was certainly a, a character and someone I had a bad feeling about immediately, honestly, but it wasn't like 
99% was just Charlie talking. Yeah, of course. Him and Katie were relating things they had done together. I don't remember the specifics eight years later, but yeah. And you had said on direct examination, he introduced Katie to you as his girlfriend. I right? don't remember him saying the word girlfriend. Girlfriend, but it, you know, he, like you said, he was talking about how things that they had done before, that they, it, it was obvious to you that they were dating, right? Yeah, and then it was fairly new, yeah. Okay, it wouldn't be too smart for him to be introducing people if he's conspiring them, right? Can you restate that? It wouldn't be very smart of him to be introducing someone he's conspiring with to commit murder to other people, right? I mean, I'm not an investigator. I'm not an expert on what's smart when conducting a criminal conspiracy. So let's talk about now when you, so you're all sitting outside. It was nighttime, right? Very early evening. This was like a pretty early dinner. The sun was still out. Okay, and then, but going into evening, kind of like how yeah. the, the sun here, like it doesn't, especially around this time, yeah. it doesn't set Between till. four and six, I don't remember exactly when. Okay, so it wouldn't be any problem if anybody to, that was around to be seeing you guys having dinner. No, sure. You leave that restaurant and then you all go collectively to get some ice cream. Yeah. But my, yogurt. I don't have real clear memories of that, but we, we walked to a yogurt place mm -hmm. and... That wasn't very long, and then we headed to Charlie's house. Now, yeah. how did you guys get to Charlie's house? Were you and Wendy in the car by yourself? Wendy had driven a rental mm -hmm. down from Tallahassee, and she was driving. So Charles got into his own vehicle and drove and met you back at the house? Yes. Okay. And so you and, and his house is in Fort Lauderdale, correct? Yeah, he's on Well Harbor, that's right. So it would be at least a 14-minute drive, 40, 45 minutes if you can remember, it's not a quick 10 minutes. No, no, it wasn't, it wasn't like five, 10 minutes, it was a wait. Okay, and then so you go up to the house and you and Wendy go inside, right? That's right. Now, Catherine doesn't come back to Charles' house, right? No, Catherine returned to her own house. She went back to her own home. Yeah. But then Charles comes back and then you, Charles, and Wendy all sit down in the hot tub. Right, I think we talked otherwise as well, but we spent a couple hours in that hot tub, yeah. Okay, and this is where I think you said this is the when he starts talking about some very weird things, right? Yes. Okay. He was very braggadocious, is the he, word you've used? He was. And wasn't he kind of like talking about inappropriate, for example, he was talking about inappropriate sexual things he's done with girls was one of the things he talked about, right? Yeah, that one in front of your sister. Yeah, I was fairly stunned by the... I'm talking about sexual sadism in front of his younger sister, yeah. You're sitting right there, he's kind of talking to you, but this is things he's discussing in front of his sister, right? Yeah. Okay, and then he also talked about going on trips and sleeping with young girls in other countries, right? Don't think that was in the hot tub. That was information related from Wendy to me during the oh. relationship. Oh, okay, but sorry, he I certainly, apologize. Um, okay. But she was aware of that, like she's telling you how her brother is? That yeah, he goes a, to other countries and sleeps with really young girls? Yeah, and she's supposedly a human trafficking activist, so it's pretty bizarre. Okay. And he also talked to you at this, and in this hot tub, did he, like, when you guys are talking, did he come across as being, like, you know, trying to brag that he was a person that has friends on two sides of the tracks? Yeah, that's a nice summary overall. I don't remember a lot of the specific details, but... He was more street smart or more street, if you know what, that, what I mean by that, than I would have expected from a millionaire Miami dentist, yes. Okay, and was he doing that more in the hot tub than how he was when he was at dinner with everybody? I don't, you know, I don't remember s much of the dinner, so I can't really make a comparison. Okay, but the, the hot tub incident kind of stands out. The hot tub stuck out, yeah. yeah. Okay, and... Uh, did you describe him as being very cocky, arrogant, and narcissistic? Yes. Okay. And he also talked about in front of, and this is the first time he's met you. He was talking about what he does with his finances, right? Yes, he was bragging about financial crimes, essentially. Basically like, yeah, you know, I'm a dentist by day, but I also dabble in these other things that I'm not supposed to. Yeah. And was bragging to you about that. Yes. What kind of impression did that leave with you? Well, when Danny Markell was murdered, I went to the police immediately and said, you need to be investigating Charles Adelson. Said that on the three days after he was murdered. So. And that is what I want to talk to you about. So when the, you only met him once, and the first time that you heard that the police wanted to talk to you, you immediately, now let's talk about that. How did you find out that the police would like to ask you some questions about what's going on? I was called, he was murdered on 
July 18th. Right. I was on my way back down south to Tallahassee, and I received a call from TPD asking me to come in, and I actually drove straight to the station. When they called you on your phone, and I did, did they identify themselves as yes. the Tallahassee Police Department? Yeah, Investigator Corey Hill. Okay. Uh, okay, and he actually said, I'm with the Tallahassee Police Department, and we would like you to come in and answer some questions, right? Something to that effect. Did they tell you what it was about? I don't recall, but I don't know that he needed to. Okay. Oh, had you heard already what had happened? Uh, yeah, I okay. Knew, yeah. Um, so you immediately went there, but they kind of like, you know, gave you the option and invited you to come in, right? They, uh, yeah, they, they didn't, didn't, didn't go and arrest you. They did not arrest me, okay. no. And when you first came into your first meeting with Corey Hill, he started out the meeting by saying, hey, listen, we got it. we're working to exclude you as a suspect. Yes, we had a conversation about <laughs> excluding <laughs> me. <laughs> and the impression I got was that, and I guess I've learned since, that they already done some investigating, you know, of mm -hmm. my cell phone and so forth, so that, it, that the investigation of me had reached a point where that was, the, you know, that we we're at the point where they were trying to exclude me. That's right. Now, you, they don't, they haven't heard from you yet, right? Say, they haven't heard from you yet. Like you haven't they, get provided them any information yet. No, they haven't, but my cell phone shows me in another state when he's murdered, so. But, but at that time though, you hadn't realized Wendy had kind of named you or implied that you could have been a suspect in this case, right? I didn't realize that when I was heading into the station, by the time I left the station. So it's pretty clear. <laughs> I mean, no one said that word for word, but I'm not stupid, and I could tell pretty quickly that, like, yeah. You'd agree with me. People don't have to say things directly sometimes. You can just leave little crumbs, and you can pick up on what they're trying to get at, right? I mean, yeah, sometimes, and uh, I mean, I'll, I'll say this. I was never quite, I was never quite sure until I was able to view Wendy's interrogation video, in which case it became 100%. Okay. I suspected that previously. I thought maybe. Um, but once I saw our video, there it is in black and white. So. Now, you, even though now you know they considered you as a suspect, you walked into a room at Tallahassee Police Department, correct? Yes. And they reported you, right? Yes. I mean, there's no, now we don't have to go back in 2014 to wonder what it was that you said. Right, I guess. It's yeah. there in black and, well, not black and white, but yeah, yeah. in color. So, yeah. yeah, my um, first interview was video recorded, the first interview I did with them, yeah. So it was the second one, right? You mean the one the 21st? I have July 21st, July 23rd, Sorry. and March 6th. Yeah, so I, I had a videotape interview the 21st, I had a videotape interview the 23rd where I came back and, and added Wendy to the list of th people I thought they should be investigating. Yeah. Okay, but on that first, first, first day, even though you'd only met him once, you thought it was imperative for you to tell these detectives, if you're going to look at someone, you need to look at her brother. I did that reluctantly. I was worried about my safety, but I did. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. You were even in that point, even though you'd only met him one time, asked if you could speak to them off the record, right? Yeah, I got a feeling about... Charlie, I had a bad feeling. And explain to the jury, wasn't that, oh, you know, I want to tell you something that, you know, may be bad for me. I'm scared that Charlie may come back and do something if I call him out. Yeah, it's also just cut in the crosshairs of a criminal investigation, which is okay. like being thrown into a weird movie. It's a very bizarre sort of thing. Um, I didn't know how realistic that threat would be, but I thought Charlie was potentially a dangerous person. And this was, I, like I said, and I'm going to stress it, only after meeting him once. Yeah, about four hours is all it took. <laughs> oh, four hours. All right. So now going back to, I want to talk about those dates leading up to um, when you guys, well, on, when Mr. Uh, Professor Martel was murdered. Yes. So you talked about the trip to Gainesville, and this is when started to get things started to get weird with the fighting between you and it, Wendy, correct? Correct. That's when the big disagreement was, yeah. Okay, and then on the drive back, you had described that as the most awkward drive ever? Yeah. Okay, and so you returned to Tallahassee, and the next day, she leaves to Miami. That's what you told me she was doing, yeah. I assume that happened. So on July 1st of 2014, she would have been in Miami, as best as you can rela yes. recollect. Yes, yes. Okay. And all the way up until July 13th. Yes. All the time she's texting with you, communicating with you while she's in Miami, right? Yeah, we had 
five to 10 communications and phone calls and video chats with the kids. She was cleaning out her childhood room in Coral Springs. I remember video chatting with her and the kids. So yeah, that's, that's right. Nothing in those communications indicating to you that something was amiss? That she was gonna probably come back and the next day ask to take a week break? Oh, I mean, we had some heart to hearts. I got these long emails. She kept, this is what I'm talking about being strung along. This is mm -hmm. what I'm referring to. Um, it would make sense you have the big fight, you break up. It wasn't like that. I'm getting texts that say, I miss you. I'm getting thousand word emails. We're having video chats with the kids. We're on the phone and she's, it seemed like we were gonna work things out, which is why that breakup date is so hard to, to pin down. Which is uh, why it was so odd to you. It's extremely strange. So she gets back to Tallahassee and on the Monday before Dan Markell is killed, that's when you guys have dinner, right? What, what's the calendar date, ma'am? I know it is the, the, thir the 13th. The 13th I'm is sorry, the dinner. I tried to go yeah, back yeah, five. Yeah, from... yeah. So that's, yeah, July 13th, we had dinner and saw a movie. That's correct. Okay. And you watch movie Neighbors. We did. That movie. Okay. And another thing she did that was, and you had spoken to the uh, Miss Kaplan about this, is that she specifically, after you guys broke up, at, uh, or after the yoga session on the Tuesday, that she specifically asked you about your travel plans on Friday. That's correct. Okay, and you actually thought that was strange because you're getting the vibe that we're breaking up, but now you're asking me where I'm going to be on Friday at 11 a.m. Which is why I went to the police on July 23rd and highlighted that as the first of many suspicious things I thought they needed to know. And you'd agree with me that at the time when you first spoke to the police, and I mean, it's common sense that your memory of the details of everything that went on in 2014 were better in 2014. Mostly, although I also, mostly, mostly. Like if we went into details about what you did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, no. you'd know back then better than you do now. I, as far as memory, yes. But I also re reviewed all my text messages and emails when I came back to talk to the police a few months later, and that did race things that I did not remember in, in, in July. Yeah. And so you would agree with me that first time you probably weren't properly equipped to give them all the details. You needed to go back and review things, right? Uh, I think I gave them the important details on those first two days, which is Charlie and Wendy Adelson need to be investigated, but there were other details that I uncovered as I thought about it. It's also a pretty traumatic situation. It takes a little bit to get your head on straight to think straight, obviously. So. Now, so you leave Thursday, but you never tell Wendy that you're leaving on Thursday, right? No, I did not. So as far as she knew, you were leaving on Friday at 11 a.m.? Yes. All right. And you'd agree with me that had it not been for your credit card receipts, the Walmart video, and other things, you probably could be sitting at the table between two lawyers, right? I mean, if I had left town without a cell phone, not entered a store, not used a credit card, things could have been more complicated. But this was in 24, it's a pretty unlikely scenario, it seems like to me. I, I, I worried that there was an effort made to you know, make it look as if, um, but there was also 10 other reasons that would have, you know, that word exc exculpatory, there's 10 other reasons why I couldn't have done it that we didn't even have to go to because we had this videotape of me and it came You didn't on. even have to go there because they gave you the opportunity to give everything over and for you to, you know, explain your side of the story, right? Well, they filed search warrants. It's, it wasn't, I mean. They got a search warrant again? Did they tell you that my, before they spoke? My understanding is they had search warrants for cell phones and financial records or some sort of court paperwork. I'm not a lawyer, but it wasn't as simple as I show them your cell phone and let you walk away. Um, I showed them that to show, look, I didn't do it. And they, they did additional investigation after that. Okay. And... Uh, but you'd agree with me that had you had to get those things, I don't know, maybe two, three years after, they may have disappeared. There probably may not have been a video. If your cell records, for example, if you have Sprint, they only hold them for two years, right? Yeah, I don't know anything about that. Okay, but at the time is when you sh probably should be gathering as much evidence as possible before you know it goes stale or expires, right? Again, I'm not a criminal investigator. And oh, I I'm only asking based on common sense. I hope I have some common sense, and that, that, <laughs> but maybe I don't. I'm a college professor. It doesn't always go together. Um, I, <laughs> that sounds right, but I worry that I'm giving you opinion 
based on no expertise on law enforcement or investigations whatsoever. I want to stick to what I know. It's no, and I appreciate that, Mr. Lovelock, because yeah. I don't want anything to come across. You, yeah. I want Not to an be expert. able to explain 100% yeah. to the jury. Now, um, the, another thing I wanted to make clear is that statement, the joke that Wendy made about, oh, my brother had looked in, joked about looking into hiring a hitman but got me this TV as a divorced person, it was cheaper, right? Well, that's the joke, not what I would call the chilling statement. Right, right? I'm talking about the joke. Yes. She told you that he said that the summer that they were divorced, right? Say that again, please. That would have been in, in the summer of 2013, correct? I don't know when the joke started. Um, if, Jenny, if Wendy told a joke once, she, she's one of those people, you probably, you probably hear it 10 more times, so I don't know how long she's been telling that joke, how many t times she told it. So you'd agree with me that if, based on what she's saying to you, that it would have been around the time of the divorce that he made that representation or Yeah, joke. I just don't know when she started telling that joke, although I heard it for the first time in October of 2013. Okay, and you have no idea when he met Miss McBanwell, right? Who's he? Charlie. Charlie. Um, no, I don't know when they met. Okay. And that one time that you were sitting there with Charlie, did he at all, I think you had mentioned it, he was vocal too, they were talking about Dan Markell at the, in the hot tub? He made some comments about Dan Markell that I can't, recall word for word, but it was clear he was not a fan, that he was very upset um, with Dan Markell. Yeah. Now, when you said Katie had referenced talking about her ex-husband, right? Or ex-boyfriend, however she referred it, father of her kids. Yeah, she, she, she and I recounted the little that I recall, which no, is that of course. he had a criminal record and uh, the word fighting, the word police, and that's all I, re I remember. It seemed fairly serious. Did yeah. it come across that she was still with him, or was she speaking about him like he was her ex? I don't think I know the answer to that question. Okay, and that's a yeah. fair response. Yeah. Um, I'm just asking what you remember. I'm trying to separate what I know from what I've heard since, and I don't think I would know. Okay, and she, the things she had said was he has a criminal record, Issues with the police. Did she mention anything about the fact that he was on drugs? Anything like that sound familiar? You know, I really wish I could remember every of word course. from that conversation. It seems important now. Mm -hmm. I can't. Um, but to your prior question, clearly Charlie was dating Katie. Catherine now. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get the impression that she was still with the father of her children, but there was some sort of ongoing relationship due to the kids in custody, and there was a mention of some kind of court thing, I don't know what it was. So there was obviously still some sort of social connection, but I don't think they were dating. Kind of like Wendy and Danny, right? Like the, if, if we were to look at, you know, your phone records and Katie's phone records, uh, not Katie, and Wendy's phone records, at the time you were dating her, right? She'd be in constant communication with you, correct? Oh, well, <laughs> that's funny. Um, Wendy was notorious for not returning texts or phone calls, so. Um, <laughs> But there'd be a lot of communications from you to her, though. No, no, no. There, there would be communications both ways, to be fair. Sure. Um, I don't know what, what you would consider a lot. But yeah, we're dating. There's going to be communications. I'm and there should be it. communications between her and the father of her kids, right? That was an issue, I think, that was actually headed into court on, on what basis that was allowed when he could text her. They had a fa parenting coordinator. She was protesting. So I think... I. I don't have personal knowledge of that. That was actually a contentious issue. Is how much should he, how much should he be allowed to contact her with an issue in contention? He wanted more, but it didn't suggest that he had no contact with them, right? No, he, not that he had no contact, but she wanted as limited contact with him as possible, given that they were divorced. And I think Professor Markell was trying to be more collaborative, as you know, co-parenting in that situation. Um, so I remember situations where she would get a text and very upset that he texted her, for example. Do you recall anything unusual about Charlie when Katie was talking about her ex? No. Did he say anything like, I don't know that guy? I wish I could remember that conversation. I, I, can't, I told you everything I could remember about okay. that conversation. All right. Can I have one more, Aaron? No.
Thank you so much, Mr. Lacoste. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hold on one second. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Lacoste, you were asked about uh, the dinner, we talked about it on direct as well, where you met Captain <coughs> Magbanoa and Charlie Adelson for the first time. Yes, ma'am. All right, and they appeared to be dating at that time. Yes. Okay, and can you tell us the date, or is there anything that would refresh your memory of the date of that dinner? It was during spring break 2014. Okay, so sometime in that like March 10th to 14th. I, don't, I think I've said it before. I've just forgotten it today. I apologize. That's okay. I just wondered if there was anything that you could look at that would refresh your recollection on the specific date because I think you have said before. I think I have said it before. I don't know where. <laughs> okay. All right. And when you departed the dinner, you went to a vehicle and Mr. Adelson went to his vehicle. Was Were your vehicles in close proximity to each other or was he parked? somewhere else where you couldn't see him? I, we, I couldn't see his vehicle. I've been asked that before because Wendy Adelson and I had arrived in, in that area hours earlier. We're kind of walking around looking at shops and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember the parking arrangement, but I don't think we were parked right up against it compared to them. Okay. And once you returned to your vehicles, you returned to uh, Mr. Adelson's residence, is that right? Correct. And did you say you spent the night there that night? I did. I flew out the next morning. Okay. And when you arrived at Mr. Adelson's restaurant, you just traveled straight from the yogurt to his residence, right? Yes. And is that what he did as well, as far as no, you know? I have no idea. Was there a delay? Were you there for some time before he arrived <clears throat> back? I don't recall. Okay. When he arrived back at his residence, I guess once you got there, did you have to wait for him to let you in? Were you waiting outside for some time? That could be true, but I don't recall it. Okay. When he did arrive, did it appear that <coughs> he was shaken or upset about something? I don't recall that. Did he have any obvious injuries that appeared he'd been in some type of physical altercation? I don't, I don't recall any of that. No. Is that something you think you would recall? I think so. I mean, he was, well, he was the same in the hot tub as he was in dinner, only more so if that makes sense. It, it wasn't a slide towards a negative direction or injuries or anything like that. It was like he was holding forth even more once he got home. He seemed like more of, what's Jovial. Called? Say again? Jovial, outgoing, talkative. Very gregarious, um, hyperverbal is what we call it in you know, clinical work, hyperverbal. All right, and during his hyperverbal session of word vomiting all, all right. over the hot tub, did he mention that he had just been in an altercation of some type in the parking lot of the restaurant? No. Is that something you would have remembered? I think I would have remembered that. Is there any connection between you and the people that killed Dan Markell? No. You weren't on the wiretap, were you? No. You weren't captured at all on the wiretap? No. Judge, I'm going to object to the outside scope of cross. Overruled. You were asked on cross examination <clears throat> about your alibi, right? Yes. And oh, if you didn't have that alibi, you might be a suspect in this case, right? Yes. Well, you don't have any connection to the killers, do you? Zero. All right. And you talked about the joke about hiring a hitman. It was made in 2013 yes. yes and the chilling statement about charlie's serious interest in hiring a hitman was made to you five days before the murder correct correct and it was referencing that he had done that in 2013. that's right all right but obviously was the murder of dan markell accomplished in 2013. no danny lived throughout 2013 and through half of 2014. All right, and it was accomplished in 2014. That's correct. When Charlie Adelson was dating who? Catherine Magbanua, Mag Mag that's correct. No further questions. All right, we can release the witness. Uh, I'd like him to remain under the rule, Your Honor. Okay, you'll remain under subpoena. Uh, they'll let you know if you need to testify again, okay? Thank you, sir. All right, you're free to go, thank you. All right, we're going to take our lunch break now. I apologize. We have gone well over the noon hour, and we're almost at 1 o'clock. So I'm going to give you until 2 o'clock 
and we'll start promptly uh, with the testimony at that time. Uh, please, again, no discussions with each other or with anyone else or any news reports or access to Internet about the case. We'll see everybody back at 2 o'clock to start with the testimony at that time. Okay? Thank you. All right, jury's out of the courtroom. The door is closed. Um, we'll be in recess until 2 o'clock. Please, uh, I know that we have one witness, uh, an important witness scheduled for this afternoon, but be mindful of the jury uh, so that we finish uh, as close to a regular work day as possible. Okay, we'll be in recess. We'll see everybody back here promptly at 2 o'clock, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Court. I'm sorry we went so long.
Okay. All right. We're back on the record. Uh, Ms. Kappelman, was there an issue in regards to the witness who's testifying this afternoon? I'm not sure if it relates to this witness, Judge, but we thought we had an understanding with the defense that we would be able to take a look at the items that they plan to introduce or use with the witnesses throughout the proceedings um, over the lunch break, but that did not happen. There was a misunderstanding about what they were willing to provide, so the state is asking to be able to view anything that the defense intends to show the witness. In the event that something additional is shown, I would like an opportunity to review it before proceeding with the questioning, if it's going to happen midstream. All right, Mr. DeCoast. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. This morning before we started, took a stack of exhibits, that's all from the government's discovery, over to their table and went through it one by one. Anything that I intend to be using for Mr. Rivera that I think is even remotely there's a chance that he will be presented with has been shown to the government. Again, it's from their discovery. The greater issue that I keep getting asked by ASA Dugan is well, we want everything. And I keep explaining, saying the defense were different than the government were reactionary. My quiver is filled with their discovery. And I pull arrows out of that quiver as they do different things. Now. We have hundreds of thousands of messages. Before you, Your Honor, you can see the cornucopia statements just from, from Luis Rivera. We don't know what we're going to use yet. I can assure the court and I can assure the government that just like this morning, when I know something's definitely going in, they're going to get it and they're going to see it. There are certain things that we just don't know. Um, but I have gone over with them. And I'm sure that ASA Kaplan remembers and we were right at the desk right there and I flipped over the pages and I showed everything and I go, these are the items we're using. And again, everything is from their discovery. All right, so let's, let, me, let me make sure that we're clear. So any item that you know at this point for certain that you are going to use, you have shown to the state, and, and it's all from their discovery that they provided to you anyways? Yes. Okay. And then you have some items that you don't know whether you're going to use or not at this point? That makes it seem like I have it set aside. I don't have things set aside, but if there's a statement that's wildly different, if Louis Rivera and he's given different statements, if he says something wildly different, then I may need to pull that arrow and say, well, wait a second, you know, he, here, here's okay. a text message. All right. Okay. I understand. Okay. Ms. Kaplan. I think it's really the iCloud messages that we're arguing about. I mean, so far the defense has pulled out the arrows of multiple iCloud messages that they obviously planned for and intended to use with witnesses in our estimation, taking them out of context and put us in a posture to have to review the context and provide the context in the middle of a witness. So my, I would just like the opportunity to review the iCloud messages that they're going to confront witnesses with beforehand if possible. Are these iCloud messages that you already have? They're iCloud messages that from... Provided by the state? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, if they're used during the cross-examination, he's going to show them to you just like at any other time. And then if you need some, uh, some time or a break in between cross and redirect, then I'll allow you a little bit of time uh, to do that if you need to do any other research in order to ask any questions uh, between that time. Okay? That sounds reasonable, Judge. All right. For the court's assurance as well, too, there's no messages for this witness. The ones that we do have, the interesting thing on this, it's sort of like the moon landing. Like, I have no idea how I was able to get the screenshots three years ago when we went to trial, so I just didn't redo it. The printouts that, and I'm referencing like it's there, the ones that we've already used, those are printouts of things that were created for the last trial that were given to them before the last trial in 2019. It hasn't changed. It's literally the same. I just reprinted out new copies because, admittedly, I don't know how to recreate the screenshot. So it's the same exact ones, but I will, the second I know, even if it's me right. wheeling across, I'll give it to them. Okay, we've resolved the issue at this point. And uh, so if that issue comes up and you need some more time on redirect or to figure anything out or to, uh, I'll give you that time, short period of time uh, in order to do that. And okay. Your Honor, if I may have access to the record and make a motion at this time prior to this witness taking the stand, it's particular to the testimony that's going to be provided by Mr. Luis Rivero. Your Honor is aware of the case law as it relates to the co-conspirator exception to the hearsay rule. This is how the state is intending to elicit statements from Luis Rivero that he says that Sigfredo Garcia said that Katie said. Now the case law is absolutely clear. 
that the court prior to allowing those statements into the trial has to make an independent analysis to see if the state has presented sufficient evidence independent of those statements to establish a conspiracy. They have charged Ms. McBamo in the indictment of conspiring with Charles Ingleton. They have presented no evidence at this time whatsoever, not a scintilla of evidence to support a conspiracy charge. So at this time, they haven't laid the proper predicate in order to allow Mr. Rivera to introduce these statements because now they haven't established the proper elements for conspiracy to then allow the co-conspirator statement to apply to the statements made to him by Sigfredo Garcia. All right, number one, did I make a ruling on this pre-trial or is this something different? I can't make that ruling until right before he testifies. I can't make that motion, Judge, until right before he testifies because I have to see what evidence they presented to me. Well, how can I make a ruling before I even hear what he says? I don't even know what his testimony is going to be. I understand, Judge, but he doesn't have, and he'll tell you right now that he has no testimony about the conspiracy. So he, this independent of Mr. Rivera's testimony, independent of his testimony, there is zero evidence of a conspiracy that has been presented by the state of an agreement between Ms. McDonnell and Mr. Adelson to have this crime committed. That's the only way they have to establish that by independent evidence before allowing Mr. Rivera to be able to testify to Mr. Garcia's statement. So that's the only way it's coming in. Mr. Garcia's statement is a co-conspirator statement. So the case law is clear that they have to establish independent evidence. They haven't presented anything other than phone records that don't, they can't say that any of that establishes an agreement. And so that just at this time, Judge, we have to make the motion so that the record is clear that we are now objecting because there has been insufficient evidence to establish a conspiracy to allow him to testify to the statements made by Mr. Rivera about what Sigfredo Garcia told him. I will let the court know you are allowed to make a ruling in terms of subject to link up, but at this time per the rules so that I don't make any waiver of the argument before that witness testified, I just wanted to make the argument to your honor. All right, Ms. Kappelman. Judge, my suggestion would be to take the entire testimony of Mr. Rivera and hold that objection in abeyance until you hear all the evidence that he has to provide. I think it will be okay because there is direct evidence where he hears Ms. McDonnell's voice agreeing to make the payment and she does in fact show up to make the payment. But chronologically, there will be the admission of some co-conspirator. We'll be seeking to admit some co-conspirator statements prior to that portion where he actually hears her voice. All right, so he's going to make some of those statements. He's going to provide some of that testimony before it's actually linked up, but you're saying you're going to link it up in down the road with his own testimony. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So if you want to make the objection at your objection is noted. Okay. I'm going to allow the state to go ahead and present that testimony. And then if I need to make any determination that it's not linked up, then we can address it at that time. That's perfect, Judge. Thank you. Okay. Your Honor, just a final request. So I spoke to the government. They expect their direct to last about an hour. I would need, if the court would allow, about five minutes to set up both computers, move the table, move the podium, plug things in. We'll do that. That's when we'll take our break. And I can do it real fast. We've got it all set up and ready to go. Okay. If it takes about an hour, that'll be about 315. We'll take about a 10 minute break and then we'll come back in after that. I expect my cross to go well until tomorrow morning. I'm thinking that it could. Even if it starts at 320? Depending on what time we go until it, I think that it could go around the three hour mark. I don't want it to go that long. I just, I'm going based on page numbers. I'm at 30 pages on this one. All right. Well, I want you to try it. I'll go till, you know, sometime in between five and 530. I don't want to go any later than that. I think you need to make your best effort to get it done today. Okay. Okay. I'll try, but if not, I'll be cognizant of the time and let the court know of a stopping point. If it gets after five o'clock and then you think it's going to go another hour from that, then you can certainly make me aware of that. We'll do your honor. I'll do my best to streamline it. All right. I appreciate that. Okay. Anything else before we bring the jury in? Nothing from the state. From the defense? No, your honor. Thank you for hearing us out. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's bring the jury in, please.
All right, please be seated. Thank you everyone for your timeliness. We're ready to proceed uh, with the uh, testimony at this point. And uh, Ms. Kappelman, the state may call its next witness. The state calls Louis Rivera. Louis Rivera, please. L-U-I-S-R-I-V-E-R-A. Mr. Rivera, if you could step up to the witness stand, please. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in, okay? Please raise your right hand, face the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Please have a seat. What is your name, sir? Louis Rivera. Do you go by any other names? Tato. Is that T A T O? Yes, Tato? Ma where are you from? Ma'am. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Yes. How many? Ten. Are you currently incarcerated? <coughs> yes, ma'am. In federal prison? Yes, ma'am. And are you currently serving a sentence associated with the murder case that we're here about today? Yes, ma'am. And you're also serving a federal sentence for a RICO case unrelated to the murder? Yes, ma'am. What was your plea in reference to this murder case? 19 years. 19 years. And what did you have to do in exchange for the 19 years? As Cooperate. Opposed? Cooperate. What does that mean to you? Um, say nothing but the truth. Hold on one second. Could the witness perhaps sit forward so we can hear him and also see him at the defense counsel table? Okay. You might need to adjust your chair a little bit. So we can just, I can't like see him. Up first. All right. Okay. Thank you. Can you see you may proceed. All right, cooperate. What does it mean to you? Uh, tell. Tell what you did? Yeah, snitch, I guess. Tell the truth. Snitch, okay. And has anybody told you what to say? No, ma'am. Have I told you what to say? No, ma'am. Am I giving you some kind of code signals of what to say? Not at all, ma'am. Has anybody ever done that for nope. you? Your lawyer? No, ma'am. Law enforcement? Nope. All right. Your understanding of your deal was it was contingent upon you telling what happened in association with your role in this murder. Yes, ma'am. All right. So you've got that going, that sentence. You've got the federal prison sentence going. 
And you also have pending a BOP case out of Miami, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And that's a up to 15 year penalty on that case, right? Yes, ma'am. Hold on a second. Objection? Objection, Your Honor. Just for the use of uh, the initials BOP, uh, we would ask that it be explained what it is. Okay, overruled. Be handled on cross, Judge. And so that case, um, have you been promised anything in reference to that case? No, ma'am. All right, so that's just still out there. Yes, ma'am. All right, have you been promised any reduction or special treatment on your federal case in exchange for your cooperation in this no, murder? Nope. Okay. And you've written some letters asking for reductions in sentence and that kind of thing. Have you been promised anything other than the 19 years in exchange for your cooperation? No, ma'am. Were you already serving the federal sentence when the cops first came to you to ask you about this case? Yes, ma'am. Is the facility that you're currently serving your sentence in, that's federal, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and at some point you'll leave the federal facility and go to a state facility to serve the remainder of your sentence? Yes, ma'am. All right, what are the conditions like in the federal facility that you're at right now? Maybe what kind of conditions are you talking about? I mean, is it like a resort? Is it a nice place to live? Not at all. It's prison. Why not? The same thing as regular prison. Mm -hmm. There's nothing sweet about feds or state. They're all the same. All the same, meaning not great. Not great at all. Okay. All right. This murder occurred back in July of 2014. I just want to sort of lay out the timeline a little bit with you. Do you know when you were arrested in the federal case? Uh, 2015. All right. Does May of 15 sound right? Yeah. And when were you sentenced on the federal case, if you know? Twelve and a half years. I know, but on what date did you enter the plea? I don't remember. Can't remember that? Okay. But you were definitely serving that sentence when law enforcement came to you to talk to you? Yes, ma'am. Would you agree that it took about two years for them to make this case against you? Oh, yes, ma'am. All right, and was Mr. Garcia arrested around the same time that you were for the murder case that we're here about today? I think he got arrested before me. Okay. Was it like years before you or like Month. days, months? Probably like a month or two, something like that. Okay. As part of your cooperation in this case, did you give a proffer? That's where you talk to law enforcement? Yes. All right, and did you tell law enforcement everything that you knew about the case? Yes, ma'am. All right, and you've also been subject to some depositions on the case, where you mm -hmm. talk, depositions are where you talk and answer the questions of the lawyers that represent Mr. Garcia and Ms. McDaniel. Have you yes, done that as well? Yes, ma'am. All right. And I know a lot of time has passed between the time that you gave those statements and today. Has your memory gotten better or worse or about the same from back then to now? It's been like eight years. Certain things I'm going to remember, certain things I'm not going to remember. Okay. And if you'll just let us know, it's okay if you don't remember something. Just be sure to be clear about which things you're, you don't remember, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. Before you were taken into custody on the federal case, did you have employment, like legitimate employment? Yes, ma'am, I did. What was that employment? I worked construction in a uh, an masonry company. Was it always years. for the same masonry company, or did you bounce around? No, I worked there for 15 years straight. What was the name of the company? Coastal Masonry. And what were your duties there? I was a labor foreman. I ran a little crew. I was like a boss, running the crew and operating machines, make mud and scaffold and stuff like that. All right, so you were participating in construction, building. Yeah. Brick laying. Yes, laying blocks. I want to ask you about your membership in the gang, the Latin Kings. Are you a member or were you a member of the Latin Kings? I was. All right, and you're not now. No, ma'am. Why is that? Because of the cooperation I'm doing today, All right, right so now, this moment. It's a violation of the agreement, uh, basically the code of the Latin Kings, to give testimony. 
to help the state at all. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And has anything about your cooperation in this case altered your position in prison amongst the other inmates? Yes, I go through a lot. What is the situation in prison based on the fact that you're cooperating in this case? People trying to hurt me. Have people tried to kill you? Yes, ma'am. This murder that we're here in court about today, did it have anything to do with your membership in the Latin Kings? No, ma'am, not at all. All right, but the Latin Kings don't care about that. They don't care about that. If you snitch, you're in trouble with them. The rule is the rule. Were you hired to participate in the murder of Dan Markell? Yes, ma'am. Were you paid to participate in the murder of Dan Markell? Yes, ma'am. Who hired you? Uh, Sigfredo. And who hired Sigfredo? His wife, Katie. Who paid you to participate in the murder of Dan Markell? Uh, Sigfredo. All right. And who gave him the money? His wife, Katie. Do you, did you ever even know Dan Markell? Not at all. Never seen him in your life? Never, ever. Had you ever come to Tallahassee before you came here for this case? No, ma'am. You have anything against Dan Markell? Not at all. So your motive in this murder was completely financial? Yes, ma'am. Who was the first person who ever asked you to be involved in this, this murder? Sigfredo. Sigfredo Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Who set up this? this arrangement, this conspiracy to murder? My understanding that I know was Katie was involved. She was a mastermind. She was in the middle of it. She so told she, him to come do, do a job and he came and told me. Did you have any understanding of why we were coming to Tallahassee to kill this guy? Not at that moment. Okay. But you knew it was a murder for hire? Yes, ma'am. And you knew someone above Katie was, the money was coming from somewhere above Katie. Yes, ma'am. Right. How did you know Sigfredo Garcia? Childhood friends. We grew up together. All right. What about Catherine Magbanwa? I met him through, through him. You met her through him? Yes, ma'am. And what was their relationship? They were husband and wife. They had kids together. All right. And how long had Sigfredo Garcia been with Catherine Magbanwa? like 10 years probably, something like that. All right, so a long time. Uh -huh. And he was your best friend? Yes, ma'am. You referred to him as your brother? Yes, ma'am. And did you all hang out on a regular basis? Every day. Including often Catherine Magbanoa when they were together? Yes, ma'am. All right, so you've been around her many, many times in your life. Yeah, he worked with me. And did you, he worked with you at Coastal Masonry? Yes, ma'am. All right, and did you and your child's mother, Jessica, hang out with Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine Magdano as, as couples? Only once in a while, and I like that, but once in a while. All right, were Jessica and Catherine Magdano friendly? It was all right, they were friends. Okay. At least at one time they were friendly? Yeah. Who was paid, to your knowledge, who all was paid to participate in this murder? We were all paid with me, Sigfredo, Katie got paid. Who is the dentist? I don't know him. I call him the dentist, but his name is Charlie, I guess. But, but at the time of this murder, you just knew there was a dentist? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. And who was the, who did you think the dentist was? It was her boyfriend, Katie's boyfriend. All right, and did you ever know Sigfredo Garcia to be in contact with the dentist? Not that I know. Did he have phone calls with the dentist? No. Text message with the dentist, to your knowledge? No, ma'am. You ever see him talking with the dentist? No, ma'am. All right, and you didn't know the dentist? No, ma'am, not at all. Never personally met him? Never. How did you know that the dentist was dating Catherine Magbanwa? Because uh, Sigfredo told me one day, and I had seen, I had seen him with Sigfredo but not really seen them like that, but we pulled up in a restaurant where they were eating, and he told me about the relationship that they had together. Do 
to your knowledge, did Charlie Adelson have any affiliation with the Latin Kings? No. Did he have any friends or contacts in the Latin Kings that you knew of? Not that I know of, but no. And you were the boss of the Latin Kings in that area, right? Yes, ma'am. So Sigrida Garcia knew who the dentist was? I mean, he knew that they were dating. Okay. But he knew that his, well, we're saying wife, but were they legally married? Do you know? Who was married? Garcia and Magdana. Oh, I don't know if they were leg legally married, but he always called it his wife, just like I called Jessica my wife, but we're not married, you know. All right, so I'll refer to her as his wife. Did Sigfredo Garcia know that his wife was seeing a dentist? Yes, ma'am. Did he know the name of the dentist, to no. your knowledge? No, that I'm not, no, I don't. All right, so did Sigfredo Garcia, when you were enlisted to come to Tallahassee to commit this murder, did he indicate to you that the dentist was behind this or that the dentist family was behind this? Anything to that effect? No. Okay. What about this, something to do with a lady and her kids? Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, all I knew that she was giving us the money. I called her the lady because I never knew her name. But that lady turned out to be Wendy Adelson, right? Yes, ma'am. And your understanding of this murder was that ultimately what? That she was going to pay. That the money was coming through from her or yes. and that this murder was to help her in some way? Yes, ma'am. Help her how? To get her kids back. And did you ever know Garcia to have any contact with Wendy Adelson? No, not to my knowledge. So all the contact with any Adelson or Dennis person happened through Catherine Magdalene. Yes, ma'am. Objection, leaving. Overruled. Did Sigfredo Garcia have a beef with the dentist? I mean, he didn't like him. They were together. He didn't like him because he was dating his wife? Yeah. How much were you paid for your part in this murder? They gave me 37000 All right. Do you see anyone in this courtroom that came to bring you the money? Yes, ma'am. Who came to bring you the money? Katie. All right. Please point that person out and describe what they're wearing. She's right in the middle between the two lawyers. She's wearing a tuxedo with a white undershirt. Let the record reflect the witnesses identified the defendant. All right, so Garcia is, is a lifelong friend of yours. Did you refer to each other as brothers? Yes, ma'am. The rental contract for the Prius, you've seen that before, right? Yes, ma'am. That has a number listed at the top with the name brother. Is that Sigfredo Garcia's number? In the Prius? Do you know what I'm talking about? The rental contract has a number written at the top that says brother? Yeah. Let me show it to you. Open the blind. You got to open the slide right there. Hi, Mr. Rivera. Have you seen this document before? Yes, ma'am. Is this a, a rental car agreement? Yes, ma'am. For the Prius? Yes. Who rented the Prius? I did. What was the Prius? What was the purpose of renting the Prius? To come to Tallahassee. Yeah, it, it's my number, but it's been years. Okay. Do you have any reason to dispute that that's your phone number? Man, I, not really. Okay. What about uh, this number up here, brother? Who, who would brother refer to? Brother would be Garcia. All right. So is Garcia somebody that traveled with you to Tallahassee? 
Yes, ma'am. Number three. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And this phone number, are you able to recognize the number? I've been years. No, that could have done his number. Did Garcia go by any nicknames? Tuto. So T-A-T-O and T-U-T-O. Yeah. You're Tato and he's Tuto. Yes, ma'am. And you mentioned that Sigfredo Garcia worked with you at Coastal Masonry. Was he working at Coastal Masonry at the time that y'all came up here to Tallahassee? I don't remember. Was Sigfredo Garcia fired at some point from Coastal Masonry? Yes. But you don't remember whether how that fell into the timeline of this case? Yeah, I can't remember. Okay. Why was he fired from Coastal Masonry? Oh, he was drunk. Drunk at work? Yes. All right. And is that, is That's alcohol a problem for him? Uh-huh. Yes, ma'am. Did you ever get fired for being drunk at work? Me? No. All right. So you mentioned Garcia was the first person to ever say anything to you about coming to Tallahassee. Do you remember when that was? Well, he said we're going to take a ride to Tallahassee. Does that remember the date? Yeah. No. Okay. How long? You came to Tallahassee two times, right? Yes, ma'am. And are those the only two times you've ever been to Tallahassee other than for court? Just twice. Okay. And before you came to Tallahassee the first time, how long before that did Garcia approach you about, we're going to do this trip? Maybe a couple of months. All right. And as a result of him coming to you, did you get a gun? Yes, ma'am. Yes, All right. Did you get a gun knowing you were going to do a murder with it? No, he said no. That, uh, that moment, no. I thought we were going to do a robbery until we came up here. All right. So initially, what was said to you by Garcia about well, we what you were going to do up here? I was coming up here to do a robbery. When we got like halfway, that's when I found out about what was going to happen. All right. So you knew you were coming to Tallahassee to do a job. Yes, ma'am. And as a result of that, you purchased a firearm. Yes, ma'am. Was that a legally purchased firearm? No. It Not legally dirty. purchased. It was, it was dirty. What does that mean? Where did like, you get it from? You buy a gun in a corner in the street. All right, so you got a gun on the corner. And is that the gun that ends up being the murder weapon in this case? Yes, ma'am. And did you have other guns before you bought that gun? We had two guns. All right, was one of them yours? All right, and what about Garcia? Did he have a gun as well? Yes, ma'am. Okay, but you didn't want to use either one of those guns. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I bought that, we bought that one gun, the 38, to come up here with. Well, we had guns. You had guns, but you bought a gun specifically for this purpose. Yes. All right, that's what I was trying to get at. What kind of gun was it? A 38. Is that a revolver? Yes, ma'am. All right, and did you know initially like when you bought that gun for example that you were how much you were going to be paid for this job in Tallahassee when I was coming this way yes when did you find out it was going to be 35 or 37 thousand dollars halfway this way he said no, well he said he's going to give me 35 and then he gave me extra uh, that's why I said 37 yeah so initially the deal was you were going to make 35 right 35. okay but you ended up getting an extra 2,000 mm, yes ma'am Okay, so when did you find out it was going to be 35000 On the way up? On the way up. All right, tell us what Garcia told you on the way up. Taking the ride up, we was, we was going to do a robbery, but coming this, halfway this way, he explained to me that it was going to be a murder for okay. the, to get two kids back to the lady. All right, and did you agree to do the murder, to participate in the murder? Yes, ma'am. And were you willing to be the shooter in the murder? Yes, ma'am. Were you the shooter in the murder? No, ma'am. And is that just, it just worked out that way, or is that something y'all decided? It just worked out that way. How did y'all know where to go and when to do it and who to kill? Well, he, he knew his way up here. Who provided the information to y'all as to who to kill? To come up here? Yeah. 
Katie told him, Katie told the, the cradle, how they, uh, the address, and we got up here, he had a piece of paper, so we came up here straight. All right, so he had a piece of paper. Was that in the Prius? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and <coughs> did he have the piece? I know you made two trips. The Prius was the one with the murder, right? And then there was a trip before that. Yes. Okay, let's talk for a second about the trip before that. Did you have the, the murder weapon both times? Yes, ma'am. Did you have the paper both times? Yes, ma'am. All right, and what was on the paper? Uh, a picture of the dude. Dan Markell. Yes, a picture of him and an address. All right, and was the address on Trescott Drive? Was the address the place that you ultimately ended up killing him? Yes, ma'am. All right. Did you ever witness Sigfredo Garcia have a conversation with anyone about this murder or this case other than you and Catherine McDaniel? No, it's just us two, that's it. Does Catherine McDaniel go by any nicknames? We just call her Katie. Was it normal before this murder case occurred for you to talk to Catherine McDaniel on the phone? What you mean? Did y'all call each other? No, not. So you would only see her or have plans with her through Garcia? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to show you State's Exhibits 44 and 45. How tall are you, Mr. Rivera? 5'4". Uh, what about Sigfredo Garcia? How tall is he? <coughs> like 6'1". So he's considerably taller than you are. Yes, ma'am. Who, I mentioned her a little bit, but who is Jessica Rodriguez? The mother of my child. And that's the woman you previously referred to as your wife? Yes, ma'am. Were you living with Jessica Rodriguez at the time of this murder that we're here about today? Yes, ma'am. What address were you living with her at? I can't remember. If I say it, would you be able to say yes or no? I know it's on 15. Go ahead. Uh, 1515 Northeast 135th, number 14, North Miami. Yes, ma'am. Is that where you were physically laying your head at night during this, the time that this murder occurred? Yes, ma'am. Okay, because there's a Normandy address on the rental contract. What, what address is that? So that was on my ID, my license. All right, is that a place you had lived as well? No, um, my mother-in-law. My ex-mother-in-law lived there. I okay. use her address a lot. And when you say your ex-mother-in-law, that's the mother of another mother of another child that you have, right? Not yes. Jessica. Yes, ma'am. All right. And did you receive mail at the Normandy address? Yes, yes ma'am. What was Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine Magdano's relationship like? They had a on and off relationship, you know, like regular couple. They argue, they had good and bad. They and fight, they break up, they get back together? Yeah. Okay, who was, is there, was there one of them that was, wore the pants, that was in charge? She wore the pants. All right, I wanna ask you about the first trip to Tallahassee, and the phone records show that occurred June 4th, 2014. Do you have any reason to dispute that date? Not at all. All right. And who came to Tallahassee on that trip? Me and Garcia. All right. Did you actually take off work at Coastal Masonry to come to Tallahassee? Yes, ma'am. What vehicle did y'all travel to Tallahassee in that first time? I don't know if it was a Hyundai or a Nissan or something like that. Who owned that car? Uh, he, he brought, he came, he came and picked me up in that car. Okay, do you know? A, I think it was a rental. Okay, so it wasn't a car you had seen before? No. All right. So he shows up in the car and he is Sigfredo Garcia? Excuse me? Sigfredo Garcia, when you say he showed up in the car? Oh, yes ma'am, yes ma'am. All right, and when he showed up, where did he show up? I was in my friend's house. All right, so he comes and gets you from the friend's house? Yes ma'am. And did you already have the gun at this time? No. Okay, what happened, how did y'all go get the gun? 
I know. After that, I went to my house. And then he asked me, he said, I need, you need a gun. I said, don't worry about it, I'll get it. So I ended up buying, I ended up buying a gun in the, around the neighborhood. That's about it. And did y'all ride to Tallahassee that day? No, I don't, I don't, I don't remember. All right, but it was after he rented the car? Yes, ma'am. All right, and the car that he rented, did you take him to get the rental car? No. Do you know who took him to get the rental car? No. All right, you mentioned you learned along the way that you were coming to do a murder, not a robbery. Was that on the first trip? That's the first trip. Okay, so you learn along the way you're going to do a murder. Was the purpose of the first trip to scope out the place, to do the murder, or something else? To scope the place out. Okay, and what did you do to scope the place out? Uh, we sit we sit near his house by a park for a little bit. And whose house? Uh, Markel. Markel's? Markel. Okay. And what did y'all do? Drive around the house? I drove around the house first. We drove around it. We went uh, around the block like twice and then we sit by a park for a little bit. Washed out and then <clears throat> and the renting a hotel and then the next morning did the same thing and then follow him to see where he was going to. Were, if there had been an opportunity to kill Dan Markell on that first trip, would y'all have done it on the first trip? Yes. All right. And why were you not able to accomplish the murder on the first trip? He was with the kids. And you didn't want to kill him with the kids in the car? Yes, ma'am. Did you have cell phones in the car with you on the first trip? Yes, ma'am. Were either of you using drugs or alcohol during this first trip? Yes, ma'am. All right. What, which one of you and what type of drugs or alcohol? It was alcohol and cocaine. And were both of you using alcohol and cocaine? Yes, ma'am. And was that something that was normal for the two of you? No, not for me. For him, it was. Not for me. Okay. Does that mean you were more drunk or high than he was? No. He was more drunk or high than me. How is that? We get drinking. I was a driver. Okay, so did he partake in larger quantities, more yeah, he'll drugs take, and alcohol? Yeah, he'll take more. And you got a speeding ticket on the way to Tallahassee, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Have you had an opportunity to see that ticket before? I've seen it before. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, but can you recognize this as the ticket you got? Yes, ma'am. Right. Judge, at this time, I'd ask to make an evidence state 65. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Be admitted as state 65. Right, Mr. Rivera, and that was in the, the Gainesville area? Yes, ma'am. Can you estimate for the jury about how much time you spent watching the house or driving around the house, scoping it out? And I'm referring to the first trip. Probably spent like two nights. So several hours, it's yeah. fair to say? Did you ever follow Mr. Markell anywhere other than just watching him around the house? Yeah, I was following him. Where did you follow him to? Follow him to a daycare. The first trip, we followed him to a daycare. And then when he got off the daycare, I lost him. So I ended up going back to that little place, the little park, waiting for him. Never showed up. Just follow him around, but that's about it. And you're talking about the park near his house? Yes, ma'am. That's where y'all would sit and wait for him to pull out? Yes, ma'am. Did anybody ever get out of the car and go peek in the windows or look in the house? Oh, 
Not that true. Not that true. Okay. Did you know what type of vehicle he was going to be in, or did you just observe that when you were at his house? No, I don't remember. Okay. All right, so you followed him to the daycare. What about after the daycare? I lost him. All right, so is the reason why you didn't ha he, the killing didn't occur on the first trip because you kept losing him? Yes. All right, was Sigfredo Garcia in contact with the defendant, Catherine McBanawa, during this first trip? Did they talk on the phone is what I'm asking. Yeah, I know. I don't remember. Don't remember? Do you remember any statements such as make sure she has the money and concerns Objection, about Your Honor. the money? Objection, Your um, that's not a leading question, so that, that's uh, overruled. Uh, you can ask the question. Do you remember any conversations like that? Not that trip. Okay. The second trip. Okay. Do you remember any conversations involving don't do anything stupid? Yes. And was that first trip? Both trips, probably. Okay, and what was the nature of those conversations? Like, don't do nothing stupid and be careful. Who was saying don't do anything stupid? Sadie. Who was she telling that to? Sigfredo. How was it you were able, how do you know that she, what she told Sigfredo? The only person he called. Just told he was calling her during the first trip? Second trip. Second trip. All right, so let's go to the second trip then. Second trip, do you agree, was July 16th to July 18th of 2016? I don't remember the date. But is that the time when the murder happened? Yes. All right. Who went on the second trip? I did. Who else? Sigfredo. All right, and I think you said you traveled in the Prius that time, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, who went to the rental car place to rent that car? I did. Was anybody with you? Yes. Who? Sigfredo. All right. He didn't come did inside with me though, he waited around the corner. Okay, he didn't go into the rental car no. place? Did y'all leave right from the rental car place to come to Tallahassee or did you do something no, else? I went home and dropped my other car off. He drove the other car to the house. Okay. And did you leave that day, that same day that you rented the car? That night, yeah. All right, did you take your phones with you for the second trip? Yes, ma'am. And for the actual murder, did you have your phones working? Yes, ma'am. You never turned your phones off? Well, I turned them off. We turned them off a few times. Okay. Did you turn them off for the actual murder? Yes, they were off. I believe so, they were off. Say that again? I think they were off. You think they were off. And that both of you turned your phones off or just you? I can't remember. That's okay. How many guns did y'all have with you on the second trip? One. Just the murder weapon? No, two. Two, two sorry, sorry. Okay, what was the other gun? It was a 38. Huh? It was a 38. A 38? Whose gun was that? That was Garcia. All right. Who knew that you all were coming on the murder trip? Katie. Only Katie? Katie. You didn't tell Jessica? No, nobody knew. Where did y'all stay on the murder trip? In a hotel. Okay, budget in sound right? Yes. Were you using drugs and alcohol on this trip? Yes ma'am. All right, what about Sigfredo Garcia? Yes ma'am. And was that cocaine and alcohol as you previously testified? Yes ma'am. When you arrived on July 17th, did y'all, what did y'all do? Did you do any casing or scoping out of the house yes. on that trip? Yeah, I scoped him out that, that day I showed up up here. I followed him, finally I followed him all the way to 
the daycare and I finally got to find, follow him all the way to the gym. Okay, but this is, when you followed him to the gym, that was right before he got killed, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, what about before that? Was there any scoping out that occurred? I think you mentioned earlier that somebody got out of the car at one point and went up to the house. Oh, yeah. I end up, we ended up parking around the back, back of his house. Okay. And um, Superior got off the car and went and looked through the window, but he was there. So Who we was went, there? Marquez. Okay, and was, isn't that a good thing? It's a good thing, but we followed him from there. We just scoped out the place. All right, so Garcia gets out, looks in the windows, and then y'all just continue to kind of scope out the place. Yes, we went back around and I parked by the park. Okay, at some point you follow him to the daycare. Do, what happens at the daycare? Oh, I sit there and wait for him to drop the kids off. <clears throat> when he drop the kids off, he get back in the car and um, he ended up going. He ended up leaving there and we follow him to the gym. And is that Premier Gym that we've seen the surveillance video of the Prius on? Yes, ma'am. All right. So y'all wait out in the parking lot while he's in the gym? Yes, ma'am. What happens next? Uh, he, got, he, he finished the gym and we follow him to the house. So when he gets to the house, he made a, I think it was a left turn. And one of the corners, I kept going, I kept going, I kept going and made another left. So when he made it into the garage, we pulled right behind him. All right, so you're talking about on the way back to the house from the gym. Yes, ma'am. All right, you ended up taking a different route, just a little block around to get to the house. Yes, ma'am. So when you were pulling up down the street toward the driveway, he was coming the opposite direction, is that yes, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, so he pulls in the driveway first? Yes. Okay, and how close, when you say you pull in behind him, how close do you get? Maybe like three feet. So right up to the bumper? Right up to the bumper. All right, and what happens next? Garcia jumped out, went around the car, to the driver's side, shot him. Were there any words exchanged between Garcia and the victim? Is that a no? That's a no, sorry. Do you know whether the victim's window was up or down? I think it was up. So he was shot seated in the driver's seat of his vehicle? Yes, ma'am. What was his position in the vehicle? Was he in the, like a normal position behind the wheel? Yeah. Did you see him do anything, say anything, make any moves? He to put his hands up. Say that again? See him trying to like put his hands up. You saw that. Okay. How many times was the gun fired? Twice. Both times by Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Were they just two separate gunshots or rapidly in succession? Meaning, was there time in between or were they right back to back? Back to back. Did you stop or get out to see if the no. hit had been successful? No, not at all. What did you do? We, we ran back to the car, backed up, and left. All right, and you've seen the surveillance video of the Prius leaving town from the bus video? Yes, ma'am. Was that y'all in the Prius? Yes, ma'am. Who was the driver? Me. Who was the passenger? Garcia. And you've seen the ATM images of y'all at the ATM in Pembroke? Yes, ma'am. Pines, I think? Yes, ma'am. And that was you in the driver's seat there as well? Yes, ma'am. Sigfredo Garcia in the passenger seat? Yes, ma'am. All right, I want to back you up and ask you about a few things that happened the second trip. You've talked about seeing the lady or seeing who you believe was Wendy Adelson. Can you tell the jury about that? Well, <clears throat> it was the day before. Day before the killing? Yes, ma'am. All right, tell us about that. Well, I was scoping the house, and I was uh, scoping the house, and we leaving. She was walking in the sidewalk with two kids. I and that was on the road where Markel lived? Yes, ma'am. A right. couple of houses down from his house. Okay. And you, were you driving at that time? Yes, ma'am. What did the lady do when you saw her? She looked at the car and got on the phone right away. Made a phone call. Okay. And how did you know that the lady, or why did you think that the lady was Wendy Adelson? Because I asked Garcia, why is she looking at the car like that? Like, that's her. That's the lady. 
Okay, so you believe that to be Wendy Adelson? Yes, ma'am. All right. All right, was there an incident involving the gun being fired other than at Mr. Markell? Yes, ma'am. And was that on the second trip as well? Yes, ma'am. Tell us about that, please. Uh, I was driving, we was driving, um, I see I had the gun out and just shot the, on the passenger side of the floor. Intentionally? Uh, have to be, I don't know what he was doing, he just shot. All right, so y'all are just riding down the road here in Tallahassee. Yes, just and, driving. And, and the gun went off, I just looked like, what's going on? And he shot the, the gas line. Okay, was that an accident? Or did he mean to do that? No, nah, it's an accident. All right, so as a result of him shooting the floorboard, did that damage or interfere with your ability to drive a car? Yes. How so? It hit the gas line and uh, we ran out of gas right there and then. What did y'all do about that? We, uh, we pushed the car to like a little small little area <laughs> and some dudes helped us out, took him to like an auto zone and he came back, jacked the car up and put the hose line. And was this the same dude, the guy that took you to get the parts to fix the car? Was that the same dude that y'all had bought some drugs from here in Tallahassee? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And was that dude's name Shadrick Nobles? I don't know his name. Don't remember his name. Were y'all able to fix the car? Yes. Do Do you have any experience fixing cars? No, I mean, I know I know about cars, but he fixed it. Who? Sorry, Sigfredo Garcia? Sigfredo, yeah. Does he have experience fixing cars? Yes, ma'am. All right, did he do a good job? He did. He he ran after home. that? Made it all the way back to Miami mm -hmm. in that car? Yes, ma'am. All right. Was that shooting the car, did that happen the same day as the murder or something else? No, not the same day. Okay, so, but it was on the second trip? It was on the second trip, yeah. Okay. What about... Uh, did you have Instagram at the time this murder happened? Yes. And was there an issue with you posting something on Instagram? Yes. Was that the first trip or the second trip? If you remember. I don't remember. But All I remember right. taking a picture and I had an issue with it. All right, well, just tell us what you remember about it. I took a picture of, I think it was a lion. And I remember Garcia getting a phone call they tell me to take that down. That's too much evidence. Where we were at. All right, say that again. I remember Garcia telling me to take that picture down. That's too much evidence. Where we were, where we was at. Katie Oops. called Garcia and told him, "Hey, you need to take that picture down ASAP." Okay. Why would it be a problem for you to be posting a picture from Tallahassee? Because we came out here to do a job. Okay, so there could be data associated with where you took the picture. Yes, ma'am. All right, and you said Katie called Garcia and told him to tell you to take the picture down? Yes, ma'am. All right, how do you know that Katie called Garcia? Because we together all day. Like, we right next to each other. He said, hey, she said, take that down. He tripping. Okay. Was there a particular reason that the murder happened on the day it happened? Did no. anyone tell you it had to happen that day? Not at all. Okay. Did you have any knowledge about the victim's plans? What, where he was going to be and when? Well, <clears throat> that day, they, I seen that lady walking. They said we got to get the job done because she was leaving on a trip. Who was leaving on a trip? Markel, what's his name? He was, Dan um, Markel is the name Dan of the guy you killed. Yeah, Dan Markel. Yes. So he was leaving that Friday. I think it was going to be on a Friday. He was supposed to leave. All right, so how did you know that Dan Markell was planning to leave town? That's really my question. Garcia told me. Garcia knew it? Yes. And do you know how Garcia knew it? Katie told me. How do you know that? Because Katie told him, hey, you got to hurry up and do this because the man is leaving. Did you hear that for yourself or he told you that? He told me that himself. Okay. After you kill Mr. Markell, and do y'all leave town right away? Yes, ma'am. When do you, when does, when is the first time either of you gets on the phone after the murder? Maybe like an hour later, something like that, an hour or two. All right. Is that 
while y'all are headed home? Yes, ma'am. Which one of y'all makes a phone call first after the murder? Garcia. Okay, and who does he call? Katie. All right, are you able to hear that conversation? Yes, ma'am. All right, is that a situation where you're hearing Garcia's portion of the conversation or are you hearing both sides of the conversation? Both sides of the story. How is it you're able to hear both sides? Because he speaks and he shuts up when she talks. All right, and when she talks, you can hear her voice through the receiver? Of course. And you're sure it was her voice? Yes, ma'am. You recognize her voice? Yes, ma'am. You're familiar with her voice? Yes, ma'am. All right, what was that conversation? So he called and said, uh, it's done. She said, I know. I tell him, hey, what's up with the money? He said, hey, where's the money at? He said, uh, tomorrow. The next day was a Saturday, because I remember, because I ended up going to a barbershop. All right, was there any discussion or dispute about the fact that y'all were going to get the money the next day instead of that day? Mm, I don't remember. I just remember getting the money the next day. All right, so Sigfredo Garcia calls Catherine Magbanwa, the defendant. Yes, ma'am. And he says it's done. Yes, ma'am. Or something along those lines. The job is done. The job is done. And she says, I know. Yes, ma'am. Do you, did she elaborate on that? Did she say how she knew? No, ma'am. Objection, Your Honor. It's leading, but it's also asked and answered. We've already overruled. Done overruled. Did she say how she knew? No, ma'am. All right. Who was responsible when, when you say she's going to get the money? Is it her responsibility to get the money to pay you or somebody, somebody else? Hey, what you mean? Who's going to get the money? Katie's going to go get that money. All right, let's talk about what y'all did when you got back to Miami on the day of the murder. Did you? What did you do when you got back? Well, I got back. Oh, it's been a long time. Well, I got back. I think went home to the shower. We got dressed. We went, we went out that night. Went out and spent some money, didn't you? We didn't, have, we didn't get that money yet. Okay. Mm so y'all did what then? Just went to the local place? Yeah, went to a local bar, hang out. Okay. And the money, oh, I think I forgot to ask you about this. Did you have any money for the trips that was provided to yes, you? Yes, ma'am. Tell us about that. I forgot to ask you about that. Yeah, he had money. He had like at least like $5,000 in his pocket. And was that the first trip or the second trip or both? Both trips, he had money. All right, and that was Sigfredo Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and did you know where that money came from? Yes, ma'am. Where did the money come from? From the lady, from okay. Katie. Okay, so Katie provided the money for this for y'all to come do the trip? Yes, ma'am. Would y'all have had your own money to rent the car and buy gas and no. hotels and food? No, ma'am. All right, and y'all bought cocaine while you were here too, right? Yes, ma'am. And alcohol? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So when you got back to Miami after the second trip where the murder was committed, did y'all have any of that money left that was provided for the trip? I mean, we had a few more. We had some money left because he gave me some money to, in my pocket to hold. Do you know how much you got before, I guess, for either trip, for that yeah. purpose of the trip? Second trip, he just gave me $300. So y'all did have a little bit of money to go out with then? Yes, ma'am. You said Katie was responsible for going to get the money. Did you go with her to get the money? No, ma'am. Did Sigfredo Garcia go with her to get the money? He came with her. He wasn't with her. No, ma'am. Okay. You said you got the money the next morning. How did y'all get together to exchange the money the next morning? Well... The next morning I got up and I went to the barbershop. I get a phone call from Katie. She like, who's gonna come get this money? I said, who though? Well, I got She, where he's at? I, said, I don't know, maybe in Shrimp's house. Some girl that he messed with. Shrimp's one of his other girlfriends? Yeah. Okay. So let me back you up just a little bit. I should have asked you the night before when y'all were out, was the defendant Catherine Magbanoa with you and Sigfredo? No. So you didn't see her that night at all? No. Nope. All right. And the next morning, y'all talk about it, and she says she's looking for Garcia. Yes, ma'am. Did you know how to find him? Yes, ma'am. And how was he to be found? I had one of my friends go 
not Lip Ram in uh, Miami Beach. And that's where Shrimp lived? Yes, ma'am. And did you, how did you know he was going to be at Shrimp's house? My best friend. I knew, I knew everything about him. He, he, was, he was with her. He was staying with her. You knew he'd be found there? Yeah. Okay, but he wasn't answering his phone. At all. Because he had dumped his phone, right? Yeah. All right, and I should have asked you when we were talking about heading back after the murder, what happened with the murder weapon in this case? We dumped it. How did you dump it? Where did you dump it? In the ocean. All right. Where in the ocean? Like driving, just driving back home, we just pulled over by a bridge and just threw it off. Okay. And was it like an open ocean? Yeah, open. Okay. Was it, um, were there trees and bushes around as well? Yeah, because he got off the car and threw it. Okay. So like an overpass or a causeway? Yeah. I know. Was the, if you know, was the gun thrown into the body of water or into the shrubs and bushes nearby? Mm. I was in the car. He got off the car. He went down. So there was some bushes, so he threw it to the water. That's what he told me. He said it, it, it hit the water. Though. Don't worry about it. He thought it, it did hit the water? Yeah. Okay. But he had, did he have to jump into the bushes to make the throw? Yeah. So sort of off the right guard under the, rail? Right, right under the bridge. Okay. Your Honor, if the witness could sit forward again, just Ms. McVanamal cannot see the witness as he testifies. All right, just move a little bit forward if you can. All right, that's fine. All right, let's talk about when you got paid. So you sent a friend to get Sigfredo Garcia. Where where do y'all meet up? Oh, we got paid? Mm -hmm. At my house. All right, tell us what happened. You mentioned something about the barber shop. Tell us the whole story. I was in a barber shop, and um, this guy called me. She said, um, they're here from their house. So when I get there, Katie's in my house, and Garcia's in my house. And how ha did you see what vehicle they arrived in? Uh, it's, a, it's like a SUV, a white SUV. Okay, was that a car that you recognized? Yeah. Whose car was that? Katie's. All right, so they arrived in... Katie's car and Jessica calls you and says they're there. Yes, ma'am. And where are you? I'm in the barbershop. And how long does it take you to get there from the barbershop? Uh, like five minutes. Okay, so that's right up the street? Right down the corner, yeah. Okay. What happens when you get to the house? I get to the house and I see Garcia. I grab the bag, so I'm going to get back in the car and left. I wasn't too long in the house. All right, so you go in the house. Katie and Garcia are there. Is your is Jessica there? Yeah, she's there too. All right, and you get the money in what kind of packaging? It's not in a brown bag, like a brown little, a brown little, a small brown bag. Okay, like a brown paper bag or a plastic? No, a paper bag. Okay, did it have any other bags inside it? No, I don't remember. Okay, so you get the money. It's in a, it's in some brown paper, and do you count it? Do you open it? No. Why not? I, I didn't want Jessica to know what was going on. I just grabbed the bag, told Garcia, let's go. Because if she saw that money, she'd be wanting some of that money, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you, when do you open the bag? In the car. When you're in the car, what car are you in when you open the money? My car. All right, who's in the car with you? Garcia. All right, is that the old Mercedes? Yes, ma'am. What year Mercedes was that? Oh, like 87. Okay, so you and Garcia get in the Mercedes. What does Catherine McVanoa do? She was in my house. She stayed in the house. I had a newborn. All right, so she was seeing the baby. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you opened the money, how much money was in there? 35. Okay, did you count it? No, I trust him. And when you say you trust him, you're talking about Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you mentioned that you got a little extra money. When was that done? 
All right, I think right there and then. Be like, here, take this. Right or right when we went to the barber shop. Be like, take take two more though. You do me a favor. So when you all left the house after getting paid, you went back to the barber shop. Yes. Okay, and that's when Garcia gave you some more money. Yes, ma'am. All right, tell us about the money once you opened it up. Was it packaged in an unusual way? Uh, yeah, I never seen money stable. All hundreds, okay. and they were all stable. And this money was, what denominations of bills? You know what I mean by that? Tens, twenties, hundreds? Hundreds, all hundreds. All hundreds stapled into how many hundreds together? Thousand dollars. Thousand dollar stacks? Yes. And each stack stapled? Yes, ma'am. So that's a big kind of brick. I'm like that, yeah. Okay. So you got 35 plus an additional 2,000. Do you know how much Sigfredo Garcia got? By my knowledge, I think he got like 40. Okay, so he got 40 and gave you 2,000 of it? Yeah. All right, and what about Catherine Magbanwa? She got the rest. And how much was the total for the job? A hundred. A hundred thousand dollars? Yes, ma'am. Did you buy anything with your cut of the money? Just a motorcycle. What about Garcia? Did he buy something? Yeah, motorcycle and like two cars. approach and show you some exhibits. All right, we've got 44 through 47. I'll show you each one of these. Do you recognize each one of these exhibits? Yes, ma'am. Are these fair and accurate photos of you and Garcia and the items you purchased? Yes, ma'am. At this time, I'm asking you to evidence 24 through 47. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Be admitted as 44 through 47. Can I have a public? You may. I'm going to state to you at 44. Who is this in this photo, Mr. Rivera? That's me, Jessica, Katie, and Garcia. Um, the right, you. Jessica, Jessica. Katie, Garcia. Yes, ma'am. Garcia and me. Page 46, do you recognize that? Yes, ma'am. What kind of photo was it? Uh, two, two motorcycles and a car. That's the Monte Carlo Garcia. That's his motorcycle, the black and yellow one. And the red one was a guy named Hivaro. Garcia. And was this a motorcycle that he bought with the proceeds from the murder? Yes, ma'am. And this Monte Carlo, is that Garcia's as well? Yes, ma'am. And was that purchased with the proceeds? Yes, ma'am. Page 47. What's in this photo? That's me and Garcia and our motorcycle. Both motorcycles y'all bought with the proceeds of this crime? Yes, ma'am. that you drove prior to the murder. What kind of vehicle did Garcia drive prior to the murder? I don't think he had one at that time. So no vehicle at all and then two vehicles? Yes. All right, what about Catherine Magdanoa? What did she spend her money on? I uh, don't know. Did you make any changes to your cell phone after the murder? Like change my phone? Yeah. No. You didn't try to change your number? Phone number? I don't remember. Probably I don't remember. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to meet with Investigator Newland from my office and listen to some calls to see if you recognize the voices on the calls? Yes. I'm going to show you. I'm sorry, I think it's off screen. It's the 
want air brake. I think it's going to be really annoying. And also I think that's going to be really annoying. And were you asked to listen to a portion of those calls and see if you could identify the voices on the calls? Yes, ma'am. Did you make initials by each call as you listened to it to verify, yes, that yes. is who it says it is on the yes, list? Yes, ma'am. And were you able to identify both Sigfredo Garcia's voice and Catherine Magbanoa's voice on those calls? Yes, ma'am. Is this the sheet where you initialed? Yes, ma'am. All right, and the and you are able to identify the voices of the people that are highlighted there, right? Yes, ma'am. And did Investigator Newland go go through this sheet with you and tell you exactly which calls you were? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right, judges. This time, I'd ask to do the evidence page 66. Any objection? <laughs> no, Your Honor. Be admitted as state 66. Mr. Rivera, you testified that your motive for doing this was money. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. You didn't have a beef with Dan Markell in any way? Not at all. Nope. Had you ever had any contact at all in any way with Wendy Adelson other than when you thought you saw her on Trescott? Say again, please. Did you ever have any contact at all with Wendy Adelson prior to, I know when y'all were driving down the road one day, you thought you saw her on the road or on I the sidewalk? I never spoke to these people. All right. No contact with Wendy Adelson? No, ma'am. Donna Adelson? No, ma'am. Harvey Adelson? No, ma'am. Charlie Adelson? No, ma'am. One moment, please, Your Honor. All right. You know Shrimp's real name? No, I guess we call her Thu uh, Thu something like that, but I don't know her name at all. Just nicknames. Yeah, just nicknames. All right, nothing further. All right, we're going to take a break now uh, before the cross examination. Uh, give you an opportunity to use the facility, stretch your legs. So um, it's 3:20. We'll take about 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll be back and uh, ready to continue with the testimony. Okay? If you could uh, escort the jury out, please.
Okay, we're back on the record. Uh, so I have an understanding <clears throat> now, Mr. DeCoste, that you will uh, need more time. So just try to uh, get a breaking point, uh, five o'clock or as close to five o'clock as you can. And then uh, we'll be back tomorrow to continue that, okay? All right, anything from the state before we bring in the jury? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Okay, let's bring the jury in, please. All right, please be seated. We're ready to continue with cross-examination. Mr. DeCoste. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Rivera, the, the bullets that entered Professor Markell's head and ended his life, you bought those, right? Yes, sir. The gun that fired those bullets, you bought them too? Yes, sir. The car that drove to Tallahassee and into his driveway. You rented it. Yes, sir. And the hotel room that you stayed in the night before and planned the murder, you paid for it. Yes, sir. On direct examination, you were asked by the government whether you are a 10-time convicted felon. You are, right? Yes, sir. Now, one of those cases is from 2013 in Miami, right? Yes, sir. And you took probation, right? Yes, sir. And you violated it. Yes, sir. You were indicted federally. Yes, sir. Now, that probation violation hearing, that's what a PVH is, right? Yes, sir. So you, 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 you have a case, you take a plea to probation, you violate it by getting federally indicted, and you then have the pending probation violation, right? Yes, sir and you're facing 15 years on this pending violation. Right? Yes, sir. And that penalty of 15 years can run consecutive to the sentences that you are already serving both here for Leon County and the federal sentence, right? Maybe. So you could do, it's a yes or a no on this one. You know that it's a yes, right? That it can run consecutive after the 19 years. I don't know, but yes. Now, at the time you took the plea in this murder case, you had no idea about that probation violation, right? Yes, sir. You didn't know about it? I didn't know, no. You had two attorneys at the time. They failed to tell you. Yes, sir. Right? The government, who works also for the state of Florida, like the prosecutors in Miami, assistant state attorneys, they didn't let you know either. No. And it's your understanding nobody knew about it. Not your attorneys, not these attorneys, not yourself, right? Yes, sir. And you actually learned when I asked you the question about whether you knew about the pending probation violation. Yes, sir. 
Now let's go to your next case. The federal indictment. You agree with me that you took a conviction for conspiracy to violate the RICO statute. Yes, sir. Now that's a RICO statute that's used to prosecute, prosecute large groups committing crimes, right? Yes, sir. You took 151 months prison. Yes, sir. Approximately 12 and a half years. Yes, sir. As a career offender. Yes, sir. That means that you're a career criminal in the, in the federal system. Yes, sir. And of course you have the conviction for the murder case here. Yes, sir. One of those 10. Yes. And the charge that you pled to was second degree murder. Yes, sir. And you took a plea of 19 years prison. Yes, sir. So you've got two sentences. You've got 19 years prison on the murder case here. Yes, sir. And you got 12 and a half on the federal case, right? Yes. They're not stacked one after the other. They're running at the same time. Yes, sir. Now, with respect to your federal indictment, you pled guilty, but you're actually innocent, right? In the federal system? The, the federal indictment, the I RICO guilty, case. I'm guilty. You are guilty. Do you remember taking a, the first time you took a deposition in this case with Sigfredo Garcia's attorney? Yes. You remember how there was a, a court reporter present that took down all your words? Yes, sir. Your attorney was present? Yes, sir. They swore you in at the beginning, asking you to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Counsel pages 30 to 31, starting on lines 12. Play the lines again, please. Pages 30 to 31, starting at line 12. I think I'm right, right? Heavier than I'm right? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Rivera, do you remember being asked the following questions and giving the following answers? Have you ever been involved in a conspiracy to commit an armed robbery? Answer, no. Have you ever been? Answer, I got conspiracy right now with a federal charge. Question, right, your racketeering charge. Answer, my racketeering, so if you wanna get that clear, that can be a yes. Question, okay, so yes on the well, I was going to get to your answer. Because that's in my records, it doesn't mean that I did it but it's all over my record, so question, go ahead. All that you asked me, question, write, answer. It's in my federal record, conspiracy. If you come into robberies, it becomes everything that you asked me. But I'm telling you no, because I didn't do none of that. But it's in my record, so that's a yes. So you have something in your record, but you didn't do it. Answer, I didn't do it. I just got convicted to it. I signed a plea. I took it. You can't fight with the feds. You can't beat them. Nobody can beat them. That's a yes. Okay. You understand that in your deposition, you said that you didn't do anything on the federal case. Yes, sir. So I'll ask you the question again. On your federal case, are you innocent or not? No. And the reason, the reason well, let's go on. So in your deposition, counsel, lines page 34, lines 20 through 24. Mr. Rivera, do you remember saying the following? Okay, so just to be clear, you signed that because that's what was best for you to do, not because that was the truth, right? Answer, that's not the truth. That's best for me to go ahead and take it and run. You remember saying that in yes. deposition under oath, right? Yes, sir. Basically saying, I did not commit this federal crime, but I took it and ran because you can't fight with the feds. Right? Yes, sir. Counsel, page 32, line 25. Mr. Rivera, you also remember saying, you can't never beat the feds, man. You can't go to trial with the feds. Yes, sir. Just to be clear, the feds are involved in this case, right? Yes, sir. Special Agent Patrick Sanford and the rest of the FBI. Yes, sir. On 
Understanding your reluctance on the next topic, let's get into it, the Latin kings. Let's talk first about the size of the Latin kings. Your, your, the federal indictment that we just talked about was 23 defendants, correct? Yes, sir. But the Latin kings are much larger than just 23 people, right? Yes, sir. Now, as an aside, a guy, Juan Marcos Vega, was a co-defendant in your federal indictment, right? Yes, sir. And he was not a Latin king yet. He was a probationer. Yes. Now, the Latin kings themselves, they are one of the largest and most well-organized gangs in the country, right? That's true. And you know that because that's in the factual proffer that you signed in the federal case, what you agreed that's to. That's true. They operate in at least 39 states, including Florida. Yes. By your word, they are everywhere. Yes, sir. That includes Chicago, right? Yes. New York. Yes. Key West. Yes. Fort Lauderdale. Yes. Naples. Yes. Tampa. Everywhere. Jacksonville. Yes, sir. Orlando. Everywhere. Tallahassee. Yes. Now, the purpose of the Latin Kings, the, the primary source of income is generated through distribution of narcotics, assault, robbery, burglary, and identity theft, right? Yes. Also, the distribution of firearms. Yes. And homicide. Yes, sir. If you could speak up for the jury so that they can hear you. I want to make sure everybody down here can hear you. Now, the members committed these crimes to benefit, promote, and further the interests of the gang, right? Yes. And to increase their own standing. Yes. To get higher up, you got to do more. Yes. Now, going through this quickly, the organization, you guys adhere to a local, regional, state, and national system, right? Yes, sir. The local, like Miami, reports to state, reports to regional officers, right? Yes, sir. Regional reports to state officers. Yes. And then state okay. officers report to the national bosses. Correct. Right? Correct. Now let's talk about your involvement. You've been in it your whole life. Yeah. Since you were 10 years old. Yes, sir. In 2014, you were 31 years old. Right? Yeah. Yes. So that's 21 years that you've been involved. Yes, sir. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You were the boss of Miami yes, since sir. the age of 15 or 16. Yes, sir. But I just want to know what this got to do with the case. It has everything. We'll get to that. I don't. Uh, they don't got nothing to do with Mr. this. Mr. Rivera, just answer the questions they for don't. you. You were a legacy, correct? Yes. Now, that means because you had family members that were in it as well. Just two uncles. Yes. Correct. Now, your position within the Latin Kings, you were the first crown. Right? Yes, sir. And what the first crown means is, is that you're the jefe, you're the boss of that area. Right? Yes, sir. Now, you're the boss of mostly the whole of Miami. Yes. Between the ages of 10 to 15 or 16, you rose to that position. Right? Yes, sir. And you rose through the ranks. Yes. The fifth crown is the secretary, right? Yes. The fourth crown is a treasurer. Yes. Right? The third crown is an enforcer. Yep. The second crown is a sasike. Yep. And then you reach the top. Yes, sir. Now, below these five points of the crown are a whole bunch of soldiers, right? Yes, sir. And you rose through that, still a child, by the age of 16. Yes, sir. And you held that throne. Yes, sir. For 15, 16 years before you were charged. Yes, I did. Now, to keep that throne, you have to continue to commit crimes and oversee crimes, right? Objection, yes, sir. relevance. Overruled. Yes, sir. Let's talk specifically about your tribe. That's what you refer to your crew as, right? This don't got nothing to do with the case, man. Not my tribe at all. All right, Mr. Rivera, I'll make that determination, okay? You just need to answer the questions, please. We're talking about the size, the amount of soldiers, the amount in your group. Now, you're the boss over roughly... 100 people in 2014, correct? Yes, sir. Now, there's rules to the Latin Kings, right? Yep. There's a rule book. Yes, sir. These are actually all written out. Both the, the purpose, the rules, everything about the Latin Kings is put into what's called the manifesto, correct? Yes, sir. And if you violate those rules, there's penalties for it. Yes, sir. Those include beatings. Yes, sir. You've ordered those before. Yes, sir. It includes things like ink removal, 
tattoos of Latin kings. Yes, sir. Forcibly to remove them. Yes, sir. Burn them off or cut them off. Yes. Now, snitching is the ultimate rule, right? Yes, sir. As a criminal enterprise, you need to have that rule so that if you're committing crimes with your, your gang members, that they're not going to flip against you. Yes, sir. And you violated that rule. Yes, I did. Now, had you violated that rule on an actual Latin king, no. the penalties would be more severe than what they're seeking against you right now. Oh, it's be the same. They're trying to kill you. Yes, sir. They're trying to kill your family. Yes, sir. You'd agree with me that if you were to name a Latin king, because... I'm not naming no Latin kings, bro. I know. So, Catherine McBanwa, nowhere near a gang member, right? No. Sigfredo Garcia, not a Latin king. No, sir. Wendy Adelson, somebody else you've pointed at, not a Latin king. No. You'd agree with me that had you pointed out a Latin king, that the penalty, although the same, may have been delivered in a much more severe manner. Yes, sir. Let's talk about your cooperation. We're done with the Latin kings for now, okay? Is it, is it a fair agreement that after you were charged in this case, you're brought to Leon County, that you're desperate? Desperate like what? Like you're, like you're in a jam. You're, you're charged with first degree murder. The evidence is strong. You're looking at the death penalty. Yes. Let's go through it. So did you know, and you may not have, that there was media all over the place about the case? Your face was all over 2020, all over the news as involved in the case. Yes. The evidence in the case was strong. You saw it. They have ATM photos of you. They got the Prius. They got cell phone communications. They got people identifying you up there or up here. Yes. That was a problem, right? Yes, sir. You're being held in custody, no bond. Yes, sir. The penalty guaranteed life, if not the death penalty, right? Yes, sir. Now, you had just dealt with snitches on your federal case, right? Yes, sir. A guy named King Nano the second in command of Florida, way above you, testified against the other 22 defendants in the federal case, right? Objection, relevance. Overruled. If you know, you can answer. Yes, sir. Nano testified against you, yes. right? Despite your gang's rules, yes. right? And the repercussions. Yes, sir. Now you're involved in a case with Sigfredo Garcia, who is not a Latin king. Yes, sir. And not under those rules. Yes, sir. Within your arrest paperwork and discovery, Catherine McBannon's name is all over it, right? Yes, sir. She's a mother, right? Yes, sir. College graduate. Yes, sir. Works in healthcare. Objection, relevance. Overruled. Yes, sir. Could easily be pressured into testifying against you. Yes, sir. Objection. Calls for speculation. That's speculation. That's what that'll be struck. That's Motion speculation. Strike. Thank you. Having just gone through a case mere months before where a hardened criminal that lives by a code to not snitch snitched against you, you had a concern that you could be snitched against, correct? Yes, sir. And again, the feds were involved. And in your words, you can't never beat the feds, man. You can't go to trial with the feds. Yes, sir. So you had a choice. You could not cooperate and surely get killed by the government by way of the death penalty, right? Yes, sir. Or at best, get life in prison. Yes, sir. Or you cooperate, right? Yes, sir. You get released while you're still young. Yes, sir. You'll be out in your 40s, right? Like 50. Now, there's a risk that you get murdered by the gang, but you have the biggest gang protecting you, the government, right? Yes, sir. It was the only chance you had to live. Yes, sir. It was either death penalty in life or take the risk, but you got them for protection. Yes, sir. But to get this deal, you had to, you had to sell yourself, right? Cooperate, yes, sir. Now, you already knew, and they let you know, they already had Garcia. Yes, sir. The evidence against him was equally as strong, right? Yes, sir. And you had the knowledge from the feds that you had just gone through that to get reductions, you have to help further the theory and get new arrests, right? You knew that. Yes, sir. You had to advance their theory to get time off. 
Yes, sir. If you could, and it, and I know that it's it's you could be nervous. I want to make sure everybody can hear. So if you could speak up or get closer to the microphone. Now I want to talk about the information that you had. Your arrest warrant that went out in the media, right? Yes, sir. And your family informed you about it while you were in federal custody. Yes, sir. Jessica, you spoke to her about it, right? Yes, sir. Now, Jessica, she's very smart. She's very intelligent. Yes, she is. She can figure things out. Yes, sir. She read, and it was about you, the the narrative section of your warrant was about twenty pages, single spaced, right? Yes, sir. Detailing the government's theory, right? Yes, sir. That Catherine McDaniel was in the middle. Yes, sir. Once you're charged and you're here in Tallahassee, you reviewed your discovery with your attorneys, right? Yes, sir. They, they went over with you all the evidence, all the reports that were written in this case, right? Yes, sir. You know who Craig Isom is, right? Yeah. He's yes, the, so you, you have a team, you have the federal agent, and then you have the local investigator, right? Yes, sir. And you know that Investigator Isom wrote a bunch of reports detailing the theory of the case, just like your arrest warrant, right? If I knew he wrote, a, wrote, wrote my case? No, no. I'm saying that you get in discovery. <coughs> your attorneys, when they came to see you, they came with files, right? Yeah. They came with a lot of paperwork, and that included things like police reports, yes, right? Sir. And they reviewed that with you. Yes, sir. And ultimately, what you did in this case, you met with law enforcement, right? Yes, sir. You finally sit down with them come the fall time of 2016, right? Yes. You knew their theory, right? Yes. That Catherine was involved, right? I knew she was involved, yep. And you named the names that they wanted to hear to get a reduction. That's what you did, right? I gave them the names, yes. You gave the two names that were in the reports and in your discovery, Wendy Adelson and Catherine McBanwell, right? Yes. You did exactly what you said you did in the federal case. You, you took it and ran. Yes, sir. Agreed to the government's facts, whether truthful or not. That's true, but yes. You agree that you agreed to untruthful facts? No, everything I said was the truth, or whatever you're trying to say. But... I'm here trying to figure out what you've said and done. So you need to tell me, okay, please? You agreed to the government's facts, right? Yes. Now let's talk about your cooperation agreement. You have an agreement with the state attorney's office in exchange for your testimony, right? Yes. Let's talk about what you get. You get a reduced charge, right? Yes, sir. It went from first degree murder down to second degree murder. Yes, sir. You qualify as a habitual felony offender and that was waived, right? Yes, sir. The death penalty was waived. Yes, sir. Other charges were waived, like conspiracy to commit murder, right? Yes, sir. Solicitation to commit murder. Yes, sir. Possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. Yes, sir. You possessed firearms in this case and they gave you a pass on those charges as well too. Yes, sir. Are you aware that in the state of Florida, there's a minimum mandatory penalty for a convicted felon possessing a gun? Yes, I do. They also gave you a pass on an aggravated assault with a firearm. Yes, sir. You told them a story about how a guy, Shadrick Nobles, the guy that you bought drugs from and the guy that helped you with the Prius, that he and a bunch of his friends came into the hotel room and that you pulled two guns on him and told him to strip, right? Yes, sir. So you're going to pass on that as well, too. Yes, sir. Now, on this topic of the Prius, and I just thought about this, you said that the gas line was shot? Yes, sir. And the car immediately stopped? Yes, sir. Prius is electric. You know that, right? It, it was on gas. It's a, it stopped. You understand it's a hybrid vehicle that yes, can run on electricity, yes, too? Yes, I do. All right. So we're talking about what you get in this cooperation agreement. You get 19 years. Yes, sir. No minimum mandatory. Yes, sir. Now. Had you been the shooter, you would have gotten a minimum mandatory, right? Yes. A higher minimum mandatory than just possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, you would have gotten a higher penalty, right? Yes, sir. If you said you were the shooter, you probably wouldn't have gotten a deal either. 
Yes, sir. So you couldn't be the shooter? I'm not the shooter. Let's talk about reductions now. You know what gain time is? Yes, sir. Gain time is that you get a percentage off of your sentence. Yes, sir. That you'll serve potentially only 85% of the 19 years. Yes, sir. So instead of a 19 year sentence, you'll do approximately 16. And a half, yes, sir. 12 and a half already for federal. Mm -hmm. yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. A mere, th if you can keep speaking up, I want to make sure everybody can hear. A mere three and a half years on top of that. So 12 and a half to 16, three and a half years for putting two bullets in Professor Markell's head. That was the penalty that they gave you, right? Yes, sir. Instead of life or the death penalty. Yes, sir. And there's no probation on the back end. No, sir. You're free and clear. Yes, sir. Now, you said on direct examination that you don't think that, that the Bureau of Prisons is any better than the Florida Department of Corrections. They are the same. Do you remember on October 2nd of 2019 sitting in that exact same chair? Yeah, I remember. And do you remember that there was a court reporter right there taking down everything that you were saying? Yes, sir. And that before you said anything from that stand, you agreed to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. So, counsel, 10 2. Your Honor, one brief moment. Yes. 10 2, afternoon. Pages 28 through 29. It's going to take me a second to pull this one up. <clears throat> So, Mr. Rivera, again, we're talking about which facility is better. Do you remember being asked the question, in which facility is better, Leon County or the Federals, the Federal Detention Center? Answer, of course. Question, which ones? Answer, the Feds. Question, they got the better food? Answer, I ain't worried about the food, but it's better. Question, but it's just generally better, right? Answer, it's better. Yes. Okay, so the feds are better. It's better because right? I'm, I'm in a facility where I'm getting protected at. So it's called protect where every gangs drop out. It's in that same predicament I'm in. That's why I say it's better. Mr. Rivera, I don't want to confuse the jury here. What we're talking about is that the federal prisons, the federal jails. No, they're not better. Your commissary. Just where I'm at right now is better for me. I feel safe right now where I'm at. Where I was before, I wasn't feeling safe. They try to kill me. Your commissary list in federal includes things like slippers and butterscotch candies, right? Yeah. Yeah. In state, you're lucky to get a towel. I've never been in state, so I don't know. But you're telling this jury that you know that one is better than the other. That's what I hear. Okay. So, again, what we're talking about is what you get from your deal. You get protection from them, and you need it, right? Yes, sir. You need protection from the Latin kings, right? <laughs> Yes. Right? Yes. You've sent them letters begging for help. Yes, sir, I did. You also need them for help on that probation violation here, right? Yes, sir. And you've tried to get them to help you so that you don't get penalized because Miami's your home turf. Yes, sir. Miami's different. They were after you for a while, and you know that. Yes, sir. You know the gang's prosecutor specifically knows who you are and was hoping to get a chance to go after you, right? Yes, sir. You need them, right? Yes. yes. And they need you. Yes, sir. With that need for protection of your life, be it either 15 years or being killed, that puts you on their leash, right? Yes, sir. Now let's talk about what you have to give. We talked about what you get the butterscotch candies, the protection. Now let's talk about what you have to give. You have to testify. Yes, sir. You have to testify truthfully, yes. right? Yes. Completely. Yes, sir. And repeatedly. Yes, sir. In this trial. 
Yes, sir. And in any future trials. Yes, sir. And if you fail, then you're violated by the agreement, right? Yes, sir. And that's what really puts you on their leash, right? Yes, sir. You have to do whatever they say. Yes, sir. Or they violate you. Yes. And what's worse, it's up to them to determine whether you've been violated or whether you violated, right? Yes, sir. Let's talk about now. So we talked about what you get, what you give for the cooperation. Let's talk about your cooperation now. Let's talk about the first name that you named, Wendy Adelson. You said that on July 17, 2014, that you saw her on Trescott. This is the same street that you shot the guy on. Yes, sir. You actually saw her at the same house, right? The same, the same house where you committed the murder. I didn't see her at the house. I seen a few houses from the house. Are you sure? On the same street? You didn't see her walk down the driveway and into the house? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So let's be clear. You saw slow her at the same- Slow down, slow down, slow down. I will, I will. Fair, that's a fair request. You saw her at Professor Markell's house, the same house that you drove down the driveway and shot the guy in the garage. Yes, sir. Right. Now, when you first saw her, she was walking towards you and Garcia in the car. Yes, sir. You saw her face. Yes, sir. Her light eyes. I'm driving. You don't remember seeing her eyes? I seen her. I seen, you didn't her. See I her, seen her face, she got light eyes. You didn't see her green? You didn't see her green blue eyes? Yes, sir. You saw her green blue eyes? Green, blue eyes. I can put this down now, right? You can put it right there. Okay. You saw her blonde hair. Yes, sir. You saw her with two young boys. Yes, I did. Now, later in time, we're going to jump ahead right now for a second, but we're going to come back. Later in time, law enforcement presented you with a photographic lineup, right? To identify that woman. Yes, sir. And you identified somebody and you signed the picture, right? Yes, I did. Now we'll go back to you in the car seeing this woman. You ask Garcia, and Garcia says, that's her. That's Wendy, <clears throat> right? Yes, sir. That she came to confirm, right? Yes, sir. And that's when th th this woman that you allegedly saw goes into the house, right? Yes, sir. She walks down the driveway, the same driveway that you drove down. Yes, sir. With the two little kids. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And goes into the house. Yes. You ask Garcia again before he calls Catherine, as you allege, and he says that she's here to check on the kids, right? Yes, sir. Now, your testimony and your claims are is that Garcia calls Katie before you get to the hotel, right? Yes, sir. And that this is all before 12 noon, the day before the murder. I don't remember the time, but yes, sir. October 4th interview. Go ahead. So I would object to refreshing in the presence of the jury. You can't refresh with recollection and play this to the, in front of the jury. So, Your Honor, this is where what's happening right now is this is going to get played for the headset so he can listen to it. Okay. You can play it to him in the headset. That's what's happening. All right. Mr. Barry, can you put that headset on? Judge, could the defense provide a line and page number for the rest of us? Uh, it's a video, and it is 10-4-2016 at 11-08-17. You don't have the page So we don't have anything on paper? No, it's a video. And you haven't provided anything for the state to see it at the same time? Your Honor, this is their video, and the witness is illiterate. How long is the refreshing portion? Uh, I would imagine maybe about 30 seconds. Okay, maybe I can just listen to it after he listens to it, or before. Maybe you can play the second one. What, whatever's good for them, I can play it for the government right now. All right, go ahead and play it for the witness. No. 
No. Your Honor, what I can do is this. You can take those off. That's great. I can play it for the government, and then we can come back to that poll, okay? All right, if we need to, but, I mean, he can't refresh his recollection unless he can hear it. Correct, Your Honor. I just don't want to play it too loud for the jury. All right. Mr. Rivera, you don't remember the time that the phone call was made? Yes, sir, I don't remember. All right. Now let's talk about connections. First, between you and Sigfredo Garcia. You guys met when you were young, right? Yes, sir. You went to school together? Yes, sir. All right. You and Garcia, you went to school together? Yes, sir. Elementary school? Yes, sir. Biscayne Beach? Yes, sir. You went to middle school together? Yes, sir. At Nautilus? No. Where'd you go? Middle school? Jam at Opportunity School. Then you went to high school together at Miami Beach Senior High? No. Where'd you go to high school? I went, I went, to, Miami, I went to Miami Beach Senior High School. I don't remember seeing there, him there. Now, it's in high school that you meet Catherine, right? Yeah. You guys are young, you're teenagers when you all meet. Yes, sir. All right? You had known Sigfredo since you were little. Yes, sir. Sigfredo meets Catherine in high school. Yes, you sir. meet her through him in high school. Yes, sir. Now, you ultimately dropped out. I didn't drop out. I went to jail. I had no choice but not to go back to school. Katie went on to graduate. Yes, sir. Went to college. Yes, sir. Graduated again. Correction, yeah. asked and answered. Your Continue. Honor, that, if, I, if I could, the second question was graduated from college. The first one was graduated from high school. Right, but we've already right, established that You already that asked well. that before, but I'll allow it again if you know the answer to that. Yes. Now let's talk about Garcia and Katie. And they were very much high school sweethearts, right? Yes. Bad boy and the good girl. Yes, sir. And while still young, they have two kids together. Yes, sir. While Katie is still in school. Yes, sir. Now, Garcia, he tried his best to support, to give for the kids, right? Yes, sir. And you would agree with me that within your culture, that that is a main priority. I'm not talking about the gang culture. I'm talking with it within your community, the community that, that Sigfredo Garcia is a part of, just like all communities, that it is a main priority to take care of your children. Of course. Now, Sigfredo Garcia himself, he, he never went to college. Uh, I don't know. Well, maybe no. This is a guy you refer to as your brother? You don't know if he went to college? Yeah, he's smart. I mean, I don't see why. I, no, he didn't go to college. He was not steadily employed. No. Worked odd jobs. Yes, sir. That include dealing drugs. Yes, sir. Consistently. Yes, sir. Now, you sold drugs, right? Yes, sir. Cocaine and marijuana. Probably my whole life, yes, sir. It's a cash business, right? Yes, sir. At least in 2014, before things like Venmo, if you don't know what that is, or cash apps, well, everything, when people bought drugs, they gave you cash, right? Yes, sir. Now, on at least one occasion, you've robbed drug dealers with Sigfredo Garcia. Objection, relevance? Overruled. It's called a drug rep, right? Yes, sir. You go to a drug dealer's house, you go in, you steal their stash and their money. Yes, sir. And from that, you get cash. Yes, sir. Now, ultimately, and we're talking about Sigfredo Garcia, there was a breakup. There was many breakups, right? Yes, sir. But around the time of the homicide, Katie, who met this bad boy at a young age and had kids and forever tied herself to this man, she kicked him out. Yes, sir. You remember that? Yes, sir. But they stayed in constant communication because of the kids. Yes, sir. And look, he, he was a bad husband slash boyfriend, but he was a good father, right? Of course. He provided. Yes, sir. He provided with cash support to Catherine. Yes, sir. For the kids. Yes, he did. All right. You were asked about Instagram. You remember that, right? Yes, sir. 
Your Honor, may I approach? May. Mr. Rivera, I'm showing you this is a pre market defense not. You know what that is, right? Yes, sir. You know that that's your, uh, a photo of your Instagram account, right? Yes, sir. And you know that that's a photo of your Instagram account because you set it up yourself. Yes, yes sir. And that's a fair and accurate depiction of what one would see if they don't follow you on Instagram, but went and looked you up. Yes, sir. Defense offers into evidence that it's been pre marked as Defense 9. No objection. Be admitted as Defense Exhibit 9. Your Honor, may I public? You may. Mm -hmm. All right, so Mr. Rivera, you got 1,282 posts, 72 followers, 126 following, right? Yes, sir. Now, you, you say that you told the, the government about this, this post that you put out there with a lion? A what? You said that you, you put a post of a lion? Yes, but that's not the, a lion, I took a picture of a lion, yes. Okay, let, let me back up because I don't want to confuse you, it wouldn't be fair to you. So. You said that you were in Tallahassee mm -hmm. and that you posted something and you alleged that Catherine got on the phone and was like, take it down, and gave you an order, right? Yes, sir. People don't give the boss of the Latin Kings orders, do she they? She didn't give me no boss. She told him. All right. <laughs> and, you, and, and you followed this alleged order and you took it down, right? Yeah. Now, of course, the government then sent a subpoena to Facebook to get your records just like they did for Ms. McBanwell and Sigfredo Garcia, right? Yes, sir. They did do that? Yes, sir. Okay. So we'd be able to see if that actually ever happened, right? Yeah, I guess. Mr. Rivera, I want to talk to you about your mental health. You would agree with me that at a young age you were diagnosed as bipolar, right? Yes, sir. And with that comes things like mood swings. Yes, sir. Also at around the age of 10 years old, you were diagnosed with schizophrenia. Yes, sir. And that comes with delusions and hallucinations, right? Yes, sir. Now, although you were diagnosed at the age of 10 years old, this is something that you live with throughout your life, right? Yes, sir. Back in 2004, now, right now, you're getting treatment through the Bureau of Prisons, right? No, sir. But back in 2014, you were self-medicating, right? Yes, sir. Although right, right now you're sober, but back then it was alcohol on every trip, right? Yes, sir. Cocaine, every trip all the time, right? Yes, sir. And you were taking Molly like candy. Yes, sir. If you could explain to the jury what Molly is. I don't know how to explain that. Molly's, a, Molly's sort of like the drug ecstasy, correct? Like ecstasy, yep. Yeah. It's sort of like the effects that you would have when you, when you take cocaine, right? That it enhances your mood. Yes, sir. Whereas other drugs bring you down, like the medications for those, those mental health illnesses. You're taking drugs that are ramping you up, right? Yes, sir. Now, we talked about the information that you gave against Wendy Adelson. Let's talk about the core of this case now. What you say or claim Catherine McBanwa did, ultimately she is the one in the middle, right? Yes, sir. Now, the first thing, the first thing that you say is that you had conversations, and we're talking about the three points, the three pieces of evidence that you claim to have against Ms. McBanwa. Your conversations with Garcia, that, that Katie was hiring him, that's, that's part of your testimony, right? Yes, sir. That you were somehow just like an assistant. Yes, sir. Mr. Rivera, I'm going to ask you an open-ended question. When did you find out it was going to be a murder? Halfway up here. Just one brief moment, Your Honor, to switch yeah. over here.
Rivera. You remember on October 4th of 2016, right after you, you enter into the deal to cooperate the day before, where you met with Agent Sanford, with Investigator Isom, with Investigator Monica Jordan, and your attorney, Mr. Collins, that you met with them all to give your proffer, your information about the case, right? Yes, sir. Now, before that meeting, you swore to tell them the truth and the whole truth, correct? Yes, sir. Your testimony a moment ago is that you found out halfway up here, right? Yes, sir. Objection, Your Honor. Oh, oh, don't, uh, hold on a second. This hasn't been admitted into evidence. Correct, Your Honor. This is impeachment. What's your objection? Improper impeachment, Your Honor. This is a 30-second clip directly on this point. All right, you may proceed. Mm -hmm. They caused you to come to Tallahassee the very first time. I thought the first time it was coming up here. I thought it was going to come out here last time. Yeah. So when I did the call, I thought it was going to come right here. Yeah. And then I thought it was going to come up here. Yeah. So before you got in the car, you had a conversation So, Mr. Rivera, your testimony and direct examination was halfway up there. Yes, but sir. in your statement that you made in 2016 years ago, your testimony was that there was a conversation at the house before the first trip, before the car was even rented, right? Yes, sir. Now, when you were asked that in that interview, you didn't say, well, look, I don't remember, but I think it was this, right? Yes, sir. And you didn't say that when the government asked you the question either, right? Yes, sir. 
Your Honor, the defense has a CD of that. It's been pre-marked as defense seven. We'd like to offer it into evidence and offer the truth of the matter asserted. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. He's admitted to making the statement. How does it come in as evidence? I mean, it's already been published, so I don't know what difference it makes, but I still don't think it's admissible. All right. It's marked as what exhibit? It's pre-marked as defense seven. It will be admitted as defense seven. Is that the entire interview? No, it's just that question. We would prefer to enter in the entire if the government would allow. We're not talking about that right now. Understood, Your Honor. So, Mr. Rivera, that's the first thing that we talked, that you talked about, that you gave to the government is the direct evidence against Ms. McBann were your conversations with Garcia, right? And now the next thing that you claim is Garcia's calls with Catherine, right? Yes, sir. And one of those was the phone call that was placed after the murder, right? Yes, sir. Where you claim that he said it's done and that she says, I know. Yes, sir. Along those lines, right? Yes, sir. Again, you had your discovery, right? Through your attorneys. Yes, sir. And in that, it had reports and it had an explanation that there was phone calls at certain times, right? Yes, sir. You didn't have to make up that the phone call happened, right? No. All you had to do is make up what was said. I didn't make up nothing. Let's talk about the third thing. July 19th, Saturday morning. Now, you claim that you were at the barbershop, right? Yes, sir. Now, that barbershop is called King Ray's. Yes, sir. And for the record, that's R-E-Y-E. And that's up on 135th and Biscayne, right? Yes, sir. Your Honor, one brief moment. I'll defer to the Governor. Yes. I'm going to show you a map. So, Mr. Rivera, I'm showing you what has been pre-marked as the defense demonstrable. You recognize that this building right here in the middle, right? Yes, sir. That's where Jessica lived, right? Yes, sir. Now, for correction, on direct examination, Ms. Kaplan told you that it was 15-1515 Northeast 135th. Does it refresh your recollection if I tell you it's 1505? No. All right, but you agree with me that that's our building right there in the middle? Yes, sir. So, on Saturday morning, July 19th, you leave that location, right? You claim? Yes, sir. Can you still see Jessica's location right here in the middle? Yeah. You would agree with me that that map is accurate? Yes, sir. Now, handing out even more. Now, you lived in Miami your whole life, right? Of course. So, you know the maps of Miami? Yes, sir. You have Jessica right here, 1505 Northeast 135th, right? Yes, sir. And Biscayne runs north to south right there. Now, she's down here at 1505. King Ray's is north up here, right? Yes. It's a barbershop you go to every single Saturday, so you know exactly where it is. Yes, sir. Now, you'd agree with me that this is panning out even more, right? Yes, sir. So, you've got Jessica's right here. Yes. It's Saturday morning. You're up here at King Ray's. Yes. And you claim you get a phone call and rush right back. Yes, sir. This is Normandy Isle, right? Yes, sir. Now, Normandy Isle is where the mother of your other children live, right? Yes, sir. Now, that's Annie Diaz, right? Yes. Annie Diaz, her family, your kids, that's where they live. Yes, sir. And just so that we're clear, what we're talking about is that this island right here is Normandy Isle. Yes, sir. Just to be clear, this is Normandy again right here. So, Jessica, King Ray's, Normandy. 
right? Yes, sir. So let's go through what you say happens the morning of July 19th. So you claim that Katie called you, right? Yes, sir. Now, the, the discovery, the reports, said that there was a phone call on July 19th between you and Catherine, right? Yes, sir. But it didn't say who called who, right? No. You say that she called you, but in fact, the call detail records and evidence shows that you called her. I didn't call her. Do you have any reason to believe that the cell phone records are inaccurate? I don't know nothing about no cell phone records. All right. So you then call Hebero. Yes, sir. Now, Hebero is spelled H-I-B-A-R-O. Don't know how to spell it. But you do know that he's a Latin king. Was. He died in 2017. Yes, sir. After the murder and after your arrest and after your cooperation. Yes, sir. He goes by the name of King Anthony. Yes, sir. You had him go pick up Sigfredo Garcia. Yes, sir. To help them apparently get to Jessica's house for this meeting, right? Yes, sir. Now, you also claim that while you're at the barbershop, King Ray's, which is north of that little red dot, that Jessica Rodriguez called you, right? Yes, sir. And said, Katie and Garcia are at the house. Yes, sir. So you rush from King Ray's down to Jessica's house. You, you claim that you rush from right here down here, right? Yes, sir. Now, when you get there, you claim that, that Katie and Garcia are there, right? Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, you had your cell phone, the cell phone that you use on you when you were at the barbershop, right? And that, that's how these communications were I have were two cell phones. But, obviously, the phone that you're using to communicate with Miss McBannon the phone that you're using to communicate with Ms. McDaniel, obviously you have that in your possession, right? It's not somebody else having those phone calls. I have one and the other one had an Anthony. Okay. You have a phone on you that you're using to communicate with Ms. McDaniel, right? Yes, sir. explanation to the jury why that phone that's communicating with Miss McBanna is right there when the phone calls are happening in Normandy Island and not where you claim it to be. I have two phones. Anthony had more of the phone and he's going that way to go pick up Tuto. It's right around the corner, not too far from each other. That same little area where Shrimp lived at. Mr. Rivera, you've given one, two, three, four, five, six. This is your 11th time testifying. Have you ever said that before? that you gave your phone to King Anthony, and that's why your cell phone. I believe I said it one time before. It should be on record, but I have said it one time before. And it's been a long time, been eight years. So that same phone that went with you to Tallahassee, the same phone that you had that was using for all the communication, just so happens to be that that phone is not in your possession. The one that's communicating, just like you're saying, was communicating with Miss McVan on that morning. Yes, sir. So then what's the other phone number? What's the other phone? I don't know the number. You never told them, right? I don't know the phone number. And we don't have the cell phone records. I can't remember. The if I remember the phone, I can't remember. It's been eight years total. Who's going to remember a phone number? So let's go back in time to October of 2016 when you did that recorded that interview. Phone. Did you say anything about this? can't remember if I did or not. Your cooperation agreement is to give the complete truth, right? Yes, sir. You never said that, did you? can't remember. In fact, you claimed, you claimed that that number that ends in 8153, the one that's communicating with Miss McVanua, the one that was on Norman the Isle, and doesn't fit your story, was in your possession, right? Yes. Now, let's talk about Jessica Rodriguez. She was interviewed about this meeting multiple times, right? You know that. Yes. About that morning. Yes, sir. Now, before they did one of the interviews, law enforcement allowed you to have a phone call with her from one of their phones that was unrecorded, right? Yes, sir. 
And then right after that, a female investigator, Investigator Bennett, on a recorded phone, phone call, that's recorded, had an interview with Jessica about what happened that morning. Right? Yes, sir. Have you heard what Jessica said happened? No. Now, going back to your discovery, the reports, you, you didn't have to make all this up, the communications, right? I didn't you make just had to up. pepper in some small details so that you could get that deal, right? No, everything I said was the truth. I didn't make you, nothing up. You didn't have the direction of the phone calls, but from the reports, you knew that there were phone calls in between certain people that morning, right? Yes. And that's why your story doesn't fit the evidence, right? Yes. Because you made up facts without knowing all the details. I didn't make nothing up. And you know the phrase that the devil is in the details, I right? I made nothing up. So let's talk about your, your prior meetings. Now, this is after you decide to cooperate. You meet with your attorneys a bunch. Basically, every time you called, they came, right? Something like that. Now, you had many meetings with law enforcement as well, right? Yes. On August 8, 2016, there was a setup where you're in a room with your attorneys. The agent, the federal agent, and Ms. Kappelman and other people, other prosecutors are in the other room, right? Yes. And messages are being passed between them and the other room. Your attorney's basically going from room to room, passing the message back and forth. Yes, sir. You cannot remember the questions. No. You cannot remember the answers. <clears throat> no. It was unrecorded. Yes. But you agree with me that on that day, no deal was struck? No. On September 29, 2016, you have the same setup. Your attorney running back and forth in between the rooms. Right? Yes, sir. You're giving your version, all the, all the information. You, you base, you're showcasing what information you have, right? Yes. And it's unrecorded. Yes, sir. The following day, September 30th, there's a different setup where Agent Sanford, Investigator Isom, are in the room with you and they're actually talking to you face to face. Now you're giving your statement directly to law enforcement at that point, right? Yes, sir. You, they know you have your discovery, right? Yes, sir. And they don't record that statement. Right? Yes. On October 3rd, you meet with them again, and it again is unrecorded. Yes, sir. And it's not af until after all of those rehearsals on October 4th, the video that we saw, that you're finally recorded. Yes, sir. Mr. Rivera, I need you to, to tell this jury the truth. Garcia came to you to commit this murder, but he didn't mention Katie, right? Katie been involved the whole time, dog. Garcia came to you and he didn't mention who was hiring him, right? Yes, he did. Now, you knew that cooperating just against Sigfredo Garcia, it wouldn't help you, right? You, you said involved. that you know that. She's the mastermind. She was in the middle of this. But cooperating against Garcia, that's my question. You agree with me that that wouldn't help you? No, I don't agree with you with that. If you had just implicated Garcia, you already agreed. You would not have gotten a deal. You know that, right? Since day one, I mentioned her name. They laid it out for you who they wanted, right? No. They told you. you, you I gave him the truth, bro. I'm not going to go back and forth with you, man. I gave him the truth. Like it was Katie and Garcia. It was Mr. all three of us was involved. Mr. Rivera, That's the you, truth, man. Mr. Rivera, you've already agreed with me that you knew from the reports that the people that they wanted were Wendy Adelson. And Catherine McBano, you have already agreed with me that you were in a tough position. And you already told this jury how That's near... true, but I'm still telling the truth. That I she understand. Was Let me get the question one. out. Let me get the question out. And you've already told this jury, right, that in your federal case, you took it and ran because you can't fight the feds, right? That's true. And that's what you did here. You took it and ran, and with it, you took Katie's innocence. No, I'm not taking innocence. She's guilty, just like all three of us are guilty, man. And the reason why you're okay, and we're talking about the truth that we're hoping to get here, that you blame Garcia for all of this, don't you? For getting, for getting arrested. You blame him. Yes. He messed up. We all messed up. 
No, but he used the phone and he called and he called Harvey Adelson. You know about that, right? Who? You know that Sigfredo Garcia placed a phone call that ultimately got you caught, right? You know that. I can't remember that. Refresh my memory, please. Pages 237 to 238. Now, Mr. Rivera, you can't read, right? Yes, sir. I can't. So, now, just a quick question on that. And, and, and I'm not, I don't mean to make fun of illiteracy, but you, you went to high school until 15 or 16, right? Yes, sir. You then went to William Turner Tech High School, right? Yes, sir. Now, you, you went to masonry class and you, you got OSHA certified, right? Yes, sir. Certified operator. Yes, sir. Heavy equipment and machines. Yes, sir. And you had to take a written test. Yes, sir. A USP Tucson, you're going to school to get your GED. Yes, sir. And you got it, right? No, I wish I did. But you did get your license. We know that from the citation, right? Yes, sir. And to get your license in the state of Florida, you have to take a monitored written exam. You just pay somebody and get your license and get out of it. You know people, I know people. And you're okay with doing things like that? I was fine with it. Cheating the system. I had to get my license some way, somehow, huh? Just like you had to get a reduction I didn't cheat, in your I sentence. didn't cheat this system. I told them but the truth. Okay. Now, Mr. Rivera, is, is the reason why you're saying illiterate is because you don't want to be confronted with, with your words? No, I can't read, bro. All right. Well, I'm not going to keep throwing in it. <laughs> Thankfully, I thought about this. If I could have one second, Jerome. One drop. Mr. Rivera, what I have for you here, the headset, once you put that on, put your arm on. No, let me see what he got going on first. You're going to have somebody read it, Joe? Is that what you're going to do? Yeah. Mr. Rivera, can you hear me? Mr. Dacos, if you're going to read it to him, it, you're still in front of the jury. Oh, no, no, Your Honor. I'd walk away. All right. So why don't I do this to make it clear, because I know that you're on a one day to five. I'll save this topic, all right, and I'll move on to, and I'll move on to a next one, and then I can give a stop and point because we're at a good one at the moment. All right. So, Mr. Rivera, we're going to come, we're going to come back to that, okay? But do you deny that you, that you believe that Sigfredo Garcia messed up when he used the phone? Yes, sir. You disagree that he messed up by using the phone? We, yeah, of course. If you used the phone, you messed up. Okay, okay. So then we don't have to go through this, th th this whole process. You agree with me that he used the phone and ultimately that got you guys caught? Yes, sir. All right. And that gave you justification to take down him and his family, right? So nothing but the truth. Yeah. To take down him and his girl. You already told this jury, if you go against a Latin king... You're at risk, and so is your family, right? That's what you said. That's the code that you live by, right? Yes, sir. And he wronged you by getting you caught. Yes, sir. And you were able to justify taking him down and his family. Yes, sir. Your Honor, this would be a great point. To stop? Unless Your Honor wants me to keep going, but the next topic is it's hard to get into and stop in the next couple of minutes. All right. Okay. Why don't we stop for the day then? And uh, we'll continue with the cross-examination in the morning. All right. And uh, so I'll release you for the day. Uh, again, uh, the instructions not to have any conversations with anyone. Don't look at any local news or any other news. Uh, don't have any uh, Internet research, anything like that. 
and we will see you back uh, tomorrow uh, again at 8.30, and then we'll start with the testimony in the morning, okay? All right, the deputy will take you out. We're still in session, so everybody please remain quiet in the courtroom. All right, jury's out of the courtroom, the door is closed, <coughs> and so um, let's just go over a few things uh, uh, that we need to address from today and then also uh, how we'll be proceeding tomorrow. In regards to uh, Ms. Kappelman, in regards to the co-conspirator uh, uh, hearsay uh, that was uh, set forth in the uh, testimony, uh, do you want to put on the record what the independent evidence was so that uh, the court can make a determination as to its admissibility? Yes, sir. Do you want me to do that in the presence of the witness? Um, I guess that's right. We should probably excuse the witness for the day. So uh, we'll take the witness out, and then we'll go ahead and um, we'll bring him back at 8.30. Is that fine? Okay, 8.30 in the morning. Thank you. All right, thank you for reminding me of that. Witnesses out of the courtroom. Yes, sir. So the independent evidence separate from Sifreo Garcia's rendition to this witness of defendant's statements is that he overheard her voice over the phone indicating, being told that the job was done and indicating that she knew, indicating that she would retrieve the money the next day and then she did retrieve the money the next day and delivered the money to this witness. And Your Honor, unfortunately that argument is going to fail for Ms. Kaplan because the object of conspiracy is completed once the object of the conspiracy is, which is the murder. So anything after the murder is completed doesn't apply to a co-conspirator. So I that statement agree. that he claims that he made was after the conspiracy, so that up until that point she hasn't made, presented any independent evidence to this court that a conspiracy existed to allow all of the statements that occurred prior to that. All right, Ms. Kappelman, does it? Okay, doesn't the uh, the conspiracy end once the murder is complete? Yes, sir. I believe the payment for the conspiracy is part of the conspiracy. Payment for the murder. And you're right. I just direct the court's attention to Brooks versus State. I believe that's one of the cases uh, that makes it abundantly clear that any efforts afterwards do not go to the conspiracy and that once the object of the agreement is completed, then the conspiracy part of it is over. But that's, I'm just letting you know what my interpretation of the law is and I believe I'm correctly relying on the right case. It's the same case that's cited throughout all of our motions in Lemonade Judge of Florida Supreme Court case of Brooks versus State. All right, Ms. Kaplan, do you have any case law to present to the court that the conspiracy continues after the murder is complete? No, sir. I'll have to get that to you in the morning if that's acceptable. All right. Well, I'm going to have to see that because uh, the case law that I've read up to this point is that uh, the um, that the conspiracy is complete once the murder is complete, which is the object of the conspiracy. So I'll need to uh, see that to see and then uh, whether or not you have any other independent evidence so that that uh, testimony is admissible under the co-conspirator um, exception to hearsay. Um, all right, in regards to um, uh, how we are proceeding with some of these things, first of all, I would appreciate it if you would put me on notice if you're going to use some of these uh, things so that we can prepare for that and that it's not a fiasco here in the courtroom where we're trying to use independent items and try to get uh, things headsets to certain people and uh, I want to make sure that we run it orderly so if you have anything else like that that's coming down the pipeline I need to know about that ahead of time do you understand no more theatrics yes sir all right thank you and um, and if you're going to use any other uh, 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 video or if headsets or any of these, uh, I mean, it needs to be done in an efficient way, whether you're going to use paper, 
um, something else is going to need to be done or you're going to have to have a third party. I understand he can't read and so it's a more difficult thing to do, but I don't think you running around with a computer, you know, trying to go over behind the pylon and, and stating it to him is the most efficient way to do things. If you have an independent party that can do something like that and, and we have to do it that way, then uh, let's make sure that we're doing it in a manner that's efficient for everybody here in the courtroom. Would it be, and sorry for standing prematurely, would it be okay for your honor, I'll have the transcripts up there, and when, if and when the moment happens, um, one of the, the, the Ms. Kowalses can read it from, from there, and it can be done quietly because he can turn up the volume. There's really only a few points that I think that it may be needed on. Um, it's only when he, when he doesn't remember, but he's doing pretty good at answering questions, and so we went past dozens of times that I thought it would have to be, uh, but what we can do is that, yeah, that it's got a half mile range, so she can easily step away and it can be whispered and he should be able to hear it. All right, uh, first of all, if, if it's a pretty simple part of the transcript, maybe you wanna see if he can, I know he says he can't read, but he might be able to do, just like some people can't speak English, but then they can get by with certain things. So maybe we wanna see if he can have an understanding of it first and answer the questions based on that. And that if he cannot, then perhaps somebody can be up here and, and uh, state it to him in a quiet manner out of the earshot of the jury. That's probably the most efficient way. And if we feel that we can't do it out of the earshot of the jury, which I think we can because they're far enough away, then somebody else doing it if it needs to be read, okay? And if these are working properly. I mean, did you test them? Do we know if they're oh, working? Oh, yes, yes. All right. So they're, they're used on boats for crew. And I, I spent a lot of time making sure that they're working correctly, the range that you can overhear it. So All right. Here in the courtroom, have you made sure of that? I, I've, I don't think... Because sometimes we have things at work outside the courtroom, and all of a sudden we get in here with witnesses and we have problems, as we can see a lot of times with the tech stuff. So let's yeah. just make sure if we're going to do that, let's... I did a I want dry it orderly run. and without running around the courtroom for the jury, okay? I did a dry run a bunch of times, but All right. that I appreciate could be the third that. option. The first one will be he can try to, if the court uh, wants me to do this. Okay. First, if he can read it, which I, which I personally think he can. If not, if it's short, one of the uh, Kawa sisters can read it directly to him quietly. And then third, if it's something long, we can we can use the, All right. that. I that think answer. one and two is probably the most efficient way to get it done. We'll do that. Okay. All right. Tomorrow, Ms. Kappelman, in regards to witnesses that are going to be called, um, what is your planning for tomorrow? All right, so, okay, okay so uh, tomorrow we plan to call Mr. Nunez, which will be a short witness, and then we'll go into Sergeant Corbett, which will be quite a long witness and probably take up the remainder of the day. All right. And so you'll start him in the morning and he'll continue into the afternoon? Yes, sir. Okay. What I want to shoot for, this jury has been extremely patient. They've been extremely attentive. They've been very timely. And so I want to shoot for getting them home for the weekend at our mid-afternoon break. Okay. So that would be around 3, 3.30. I want to shoot for that and complete our day on Friday at 3 or 3.30 um, so that they can have some time uh, during the week uh, for themselves, okay, before the weekend. So that is a goal. I understand if for some reason we need to continue a little bit later, but I want to do that uh, for the jury. All right, um, anything else before we break for the evening from Nothing the defense? Nothing from the state. Nothing from the defense. Nothing from the state also, okay. All right, so we're in recess. Uh, we'll, again, uh, the jury will be here at 8.30 in the morning, and so we've been starting uh, promptly at 8.45. We'll shoot for that again, okay? All right, thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. You too. <laughs> sure, yeah, if you need to get through. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. You too. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.